Okay, dear colleagues, hello. It's a great pleasure to be here and to see you all uh, in our conference. Uh, I should say, uh, I will just say a couple of words because, because it is not an opening, not an official opening of the conference. The real opening uh, will take place four hours later. Uh, but just to say that, uh, to say hello and uh, to say welcome. And I hope Mato uh, Maestro will also say a couple of words. Okay, so thank you, Andre, and uh, a very well, uh, warm welcome uh, to all of you also from my side and from the side of Politecnico di Milano. And uh, we look forward to the next four days with this exciting program. And uh, as said by Andre, the official opening will be in four hours from now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mato. So uh, no more long waiting. Let's go, let's start our work. I uh, forward uh, uh, my dis dispatching uh, rights to chairman of the sections. Good work, colleagues. Thank you.
Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to 24 International Conference on Chemical Reactors, Session 3, Chemical Reactors and the Technologies for Target Applications. I'm Ming Bing Gao from Darwin Institute of Chemical Physics, Chinese Academy of Science. Okay, let's welcome oral presentation one, efforts of fly ash deposition on the performance of SDR monolith development of a micro slide reactor for kinetic and mass transfer studies. Speaker is Lenza from Politecnico di Milano. Please note that the presentation needs to be controlled within 15 minutes. Okay, now let's start the presentation. Yes. Okay. And um, hope you can hear. Yeah, I hope that you can hear me. I hope that also you can see my screen. Can I ask you please to give me confirmation if you can see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the nice presentation. Um, I'm Aldo Lanza. I'm a PhD of Politecnico di Milano. Uh, my supervisor is Professor Alessandra Beretta. We are from the Laboratory of Catalysis and Catalytic Processes. And today I'm going to show you the study of the effect of flyers deposition on the performance of SCR monoliths, while, where we developed a microslab reactor for kinetic and mass transfer study. I will start my talk by introducing the effect of fly ashes and the aging on the ammonia SCR process. Then I'm going to show you uh, that we designed and validated a microslab model where we could test the structure catalyst to study the aging of monolith in ammonia SCR catalyst. And finally, I will show you a regeneration of this catalyst. As we know, ammonia SCR is the best available technology uh, for NOx removal in stationary application, meaning from coal fire power plants, biomasses, uh, and incinerator uh, power plants for the production of electricity. And uh, in the left hand side, I reported a high dust configuration, mainly from coal fire power plants, where we have that downstream to the boiler. We have several uh, components that are polluted that needs to be removed um, from the flue gas. And you can see that here there's the unit of ammonia CR, typically three, a three layer uh, catalyst. The catalyst is made mainly uh, by vanadium as active sites and with different promoters. They can be um, based on tungsten and, or molybdenum. The main commercial form is the, is the monolith uh, in the form of uh, honeycombs and or uh, depending on the application of corrugated plates. Um, during the time of stream, uh, the ammonia CR catalyst is subject to different stresses and can have also consequences on the aging, on the performance of all the multipollutant control and removal um, from the flue gas and can be maybe uh, mainly uh, by structural and morphological transformations and uh, can be also due to chemical transformation and also accumulation of particulate matter, fly ashes, and inorganics and organic compounds that can block some particular uh, micro cracks of the commercial catalyst form. And they can also give uh, irreversible also um, changes of uh, redox properties and in terms of acidity properties, mainly from, for example, uh, alkaline metal like potassium, sodium, magnesium, and others, with the results to decrease uh, performance of ammonia CR, thus of NOx removal by the injection of ammonia. So you can see here on the left hand side is the desired reaction of the standard CR, but also of uh, mercury oxidation if we are using the ammonia CR in coal fire power plants because mercury is uh, an impurities. And obviously we don't want also 
um, reaction like the formation and deposits of um, ammonium sulfates. Um, but if we analyze a very interesting study from the literature of the group of Kamata and co-workers, they studied the aging of the catalyst of, catalyst of a monolith that was uh, 10 years aged. You can see on the left hand side, they compared the 10 years age catalyst of the front end, of the back end with respect to the fresh catalyst. And they studied the, the activation due to the fly ash deposition. And as you can see on the SEM image, they showed that uh, despite the micro cracks that were in the fresh catalyst, there was a compact uh, layer of uh, uh, fly ash deposited on the surface that covered the surface. As you can see on the center of the slides, uh, in the top, they measured um the uh, ash deposition layer melting of around from three to ten micrometers and as you can see on um, the lower of the slides they measured on the position of the i fly ash deposition uh the composition that was mainly with features of fly ashes instead of the position number b that was lower in the profile that was mainly on representative of the cut of the fresh catalyst on the right hand side they then evaluated the uh, decrease of uh, the conversion of nitrogen monoxide and the conversion of mercury monox of, of the mercury oxide and they evaluated an overall activity constant decrease. But what about the real poisoning effect on the kinetics and, for example, of the change of morphology and on some penetration of a chemical inside the profile? And what about the transfer phenomena behind the overall fly ash deposition? And we propose in this study a chemical engineering approach where we started from knowing that traditionally uh, the kinetics uh, is studied with the catalyst on powders. So from catalyst uh, structure, we reduced powder, we study chemical kinetics. Once we have the information of chemical kinetics, we study the structure catalyst in a uh, much bigger scale uh, plants where typically we operate at different temperature with mixed chemical regime uh, and with mass transfer limitation that can be intrapores to the structure of morphology and also external mass transfer limitation in this in, case, in industrial cases. We came up with a solution uh, where we wanted to do what? To cut a slab from, from, a, model, from a monolith that we received from the industry um, in this case, we started from a fresh monolith promoted by uh, tungsten based on vanadium and supported by titania that was used and co-fired biomass and coal power plants to produce electricity. Um, we thus call this reactor a microslab reactor. Thus, we form once we insert the microslab inside the quartz tube reactor two equal ducts with one flat um, active side and one semicircular non-active side with the focus to do what? To maintain the structure form, but in the same time at low temperature being able to focus on the chemical kinetics. In fact, you can see on the right hand side that we have similar uh, energy activation of the powders and of the micro slab. You can see on the red powders and blue the micro slab and to have intraporous mass transfer because we have a structure catalyst with its own particular morphology with macro and mesopores to study at higher temperature and having negligible external mass transfer limitation. We thus uh, develop a, uh, we developed a model, a 1D heterogeneous model microslab reactor that considers the gas phase balance, the gas solid continuity, and we include the external mass transfer limitation and 
the internal mass, uh, the intraporous mass transfer limitation uh, with the approach of up so the first order from the concentration of the react of the limiting reactants. Uh, this model was uh, um, created by um, uh, the reference of well established model from Tronconi and Beretta's work. Um, thus, we started to investigate the NO conversion of the fresh monolith that we received, and we started validating our model, including the, um, including the definition from the um, analogy of Nusselt from Shalondon works of the book, and why we used a, a, um, a, a shared root number for the uh, rectangular ducts because for the um, asymptotic shared, not shared root number because we didn't find in the literature a uh, one flat uh, conductive uh, side with a non-conductive uh, semicircular uh, side. Thus, we started firstly um, uh, validating with a, a classical uh, rectangular uh, duct with only one phase active, and then uh, we uh, we uh, valid and then we calculated also with the value of uh, uh, asymptotic shared root number for the semicircular uh, conductive that we found in the literature and the total semicircular duct conductive. We came up that we found that there was not so many um, sensitivity from the external mass transfer limitation. And we kept from this moment uh, a number of five as anti asymptotic shared root number. And as you can see, we obviously incorporate all the morphological properties of, in this case, of the fresh catalyst point. And we calculated also the effectiveness factor that you can see um, on the right hand side of this graph. Thus, the scope of this study is to investigate and understand the effect of fly ashes uh, on different catalysts aged. So the same uh, catalyst has been, we received the same catalyst aged at 1,500 hours, that is a start to run condition, and a very long-term aged is 35,000 aged catalyst is the end of run condition with using our microslab reactor. Thus, by starting from the um, fresh catalyst and by determining with a, with a first order kinetic, um, the kinetic constant with a certain activation energy, we investigated also uh, with the black points the uh, start of run condition. And we evaluated just only a, um, a decrease of, conver of co uh, decrease of kinet of activity around less of 20%. If we in fact, if we instead um, investigate the points, so the, uh, the catalyst of the most aged one is the red dots, you can see that at low temperature, there was no variation in terms of the activation. And we have found instead a severe decrease since the medium high temperature, meaning that we meaning that our catalyst is working kinetically as the start of run condition, so as the 1,500 hour. And by looking, if we look at the profile of the wall of the uh, most aged catalyst, we have found a, a deposited compact layer of fly ash that we measured being of 10 microns. And as the study of Kamata and co-worker, we have found the uh, very uh, uh, similar features of fly ash's deposition, while in the center of the profile, it was just uh, similar to a fresh catalyst, in fact, if we consider that the deposited layer of uh, um, the fly ash is acting as an additional resistance barrier uh, to the uh, species, and by 
recalling a, a lower shared number for the barrier and combining an overall shared number, we are able to simulate and pre thus predict this uh, um, decrease of at high temperature of conversion um, that we can attribute totally to, ex to the external mass transfer limitation by the uh, deposited fly ash. Another interesting thing is that if this uh, uh, deposit layer is the one responsible for the external mass transfer limitation, why we don't remove the, uh, these deposits? In fact, you can see if we scrub, if we remove simply uh, the, this external accumulated flyers deposit, we recover with this um, um, squares um, the conversion of the start of run, thus comparable to the 1,500 hours. And as you can see, also the model predicts uh, with, this, with this own morphology of the 35,000 35, hours age catalyst, the uh, regenerated catalyst. Let me conclude this talk. Um, we have found, so we have uh, designed a reactor that studies um, the structure catalyst that we maintain the same structure and we are able with this and uh, with our flow rates and conditions to measure chemical uh, regime uh, very similarly to the powders and to work at a higher temperature to mix the chemical intraporous diffusion regime. And the interesting thing was that by testing the aged catalyst, we have found that the responsible, that the aged catalyst counted only for, for less than 20% of the activation, of the real the activation at low temperature due to the kinetic, but it was responsible then totally um, at the real uh, also operating condition by temperature due to the external mass transfer limitation by uh, the uh, deposit deposition of effect of fly ashes that we demonstrated to be only this one the most responsible one by removing uh, this layer and obtaining as you can see here on is better seen uh, on the orange that are very similar to the start of run condition. Thus, it uh, can be a regeneration method. Thank you very much for uh, the attention. Um, and a special thanks to my mentor, Professor Alessandra Beretta, and to Dr. Nicolos Berti that helped me during the past year to, for my PhD. Uh, thank you. OK. Thank you, Mr. Lenda. Uh, now, if anyone has question or discussion requirement, you can unmute and communicate with Mr. Lenda. Very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Maybe I have I have I have one question. Um, how to is the uh, how how to how to crude out the um, mass transfer uh, of external mass transfer? Uh, how how did we? Yeah. How did we? How did we uh, remove the um, the deposited external layer? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, it was just simply scratching with the, uh, I used a uh, cordyrite to simple scratching like a scrub. And uh, probably, I mean, it's a very probably similar to a method, an industrial probably method This is already existing. I mean, uh, method of regeneration can also be due to um, dipping on uh, particular chemicals that can remove uh, fly ashes, but this can be a method very particular. And that's it, it's a very easy method, just removing what we have 
found here on the SEM, as you can see. Yes, uh, I don't know. Uh, yes, you can see here, we just simply scratched by removing this small layer deposited of fly ash, just physically, that's it. No yes, chemical thanks. treatments. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm. Okay, no, maybe. This is okay. Okay. Groppi from Politecnico di Milan. Can I? Yes, we hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, I was curious about, uh, you, you, you estimated uh, an apparent Sherbourne number of 1.3 for the external mass transfer through the ash layer. And uh, I wonder if uh, the effect of indetermination on the other parameters, uh, for instance, the, uh, the void fraction that you have used in your formula. Uh, yes. I guess that that's the voice fraction in the egg layer. Yes. Um, we came up with this solution and uh, we have shown this that I can show you this where I have also the value of the void fraction is a very is a very low uh, void fraction we had to do. We had we had to deal with this because also for um, dealing with the diff with the um, with the um, lower uh, density of the monolith with respect to the powders, and is because uh, I mean because it's a very very compact layer, we had a very small void fraction. So this is the value that came out. So if we use uh, if we use the um, yes. Just this is the formula. So applying the formula by using the 10 microns here and on the, on the denominator and of the um, hydraulic diameter that is of 0 0.31 in our case centimeters. I, I, wonder if you, I wonder if you can reconcile the theoretical one value for the Sherwood just by small changes of epsilon. Thank you. Thank you. Very Yes. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Um, okay, thank you, Mr. Lenda. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let's welcome oral presentation to the cyo coating of toxic oxide on open cell metallic forms for natural oxide catalytic deposition. Speaker is Professor Benito from University of Bologna. Please note that the presentation needs to be controlled within 15 minutes. Okay, let's welcome Professor Benito. Good morning. Can you see my, my screen, my desktop? Yes, yes. Yeah, can you see? Yes. Can you see my presentation, right? Yes, very clear. And my mouse? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, in this talk, uh, we will speak about, uh, uh, or I will show you our results about open cell metallic forms for the n catalytic decomposition. Uh, this work is, has been performed in collaboration between the University of Bologna, the University of Aachen, uh, Leipzig in Germany, and the CNR House in Montpellier, France. So uh, just a brief outline of, of, my, of my talk. I uh, will just remember the importance of n emission and how they can be abated. I will speak about uh, the aim of our work, uh, how we prepare uh, the catalysts, characterize them, and I will give you some of our results in the in the intro of the composition to further uh, to at the end and give you some uh, some conclusion. Uh, just uh, uh, remember now that N two O is a, an important greenhouse gas. Uh, this uh, gas is uh, less. Um, uh, the emissions are much lower than the CO two emission, uh, more than ten times. However, it has a, a 114 years lifetime in atmosphere, and it has a, a around 300 
global, uh, global warming potential uh, higher than CO2. Moreover, it can uh, uh, deplete the ozone layer. So uh, both uh, uh, these emissions come from both uh, natural and anthropogenic sources. And for anthropogenic sources, the production of adipic acid and nitric acid and uh, other processes using nitric acid as an oxidant as well as full combustion bastion are, are important. Uh, the uh, N2O catalytic decomposition is a simple and high efficiency technology that can be uh, placed in the N pipe. Uh, another advantage of this process is that uh, the, uh, uh, no reducing agent is necessary. So we are not generating a secondary pollution. However, uh, the most important things is, uh, are to find a catalyst active and stable, both at low temperature and in presence of other uh, compounds uh, uh, such as oxygen, nitric oxide, and, and water. Uh, both uh, uh, novel metal and non-novel metal catalysts have been proposed. And uh, for the later, for the non-novel metals, espinel and in particular cobalt espinels are, are important because they are active, high active. This is uh, related to the presence of vacancies that can activate the N2O molecule. And because of uh, uh, the redox couple, cobalt 3, cobalt 2, that uh, uh, participates in the mechanism. So uh, to tailor the catalyst activity, both the composition and the morphology of the uh, cobalt spinel can be modified. However, for a large scale application, also the catalyst shaping is, is important. So uh, parameters such as the catalyst effectiveness, the mass and heat transfer, the pressure drop, and the mechanical strength of, of the catalyst should be considered. Uh, structural catalysts are not new for uh, this, this type of reaction. And uh, uh, recently, open cell forms have been used as support for cobalt espinels. Uh, two works uh, are in the literature dealing mainly with uh, uh, ceramic foam, carbon, silicon carbide, and some aluminum and some zirconia foams. Uh, and the tests were operated at low gas service velocity. The main conclusion of these uh, uh, studies were that uh, the activity of uh, the cobalt espinel uh, strongly depends on, on how the samples of the structures catalysts were, were prepared. Uh, uh, in the same period, we also were working on uh, uh, rhodium-based catalysts for the N2O decomposition, but supported on uh, metallic open cell phones. In our cases, uh, we observed that we can get similar properties uh, uh, both chemical, physical, and uh, in terms of activity, when we compare uh, uh, our catalysts on the foams and our catalysts on pellets. Uh, the reason could be uh, related to the deposition uh, method. In our case, we use uh, the electrobase generation method, that is a simple uh, precipitation that occurs uh, directly on the surface of the foam. So we just take our uh, metallic foam that is immersed in an electrolyte containing uh, uh, nitrites of uh, some cations that we want to deposit. We applied a cathodic potential for a short time, and uh, what we um, obtain is uh, uh, the reduction of nitrites and also some water generating hydrocytes. These hydrocytes are uh, generated very close on the surface of the, of the foam, so what we are doing is increasing the pH, and in this case we can precipitate the cations forming some hydrocytes which uh, after calcination uh, are converted in, in, in our catalysts. So uh, taking into account the work uh, reported in the literature and our own results, uh, we decided to uh, uh, extend the preparation method to, to uh, uh, coat uh, uh, iron chromium and low uh, open cell forms with relatively high pore density with uh, a cobalt hydrocytes that after calcination will decompose into uh, cobalt espinal and test uh, the activity in the end of the composition. How we prepare our catalyst, uh, we just uh, we started by uh, two types of uh, iron chromium alloy foams. So we were working with cylinders of eight per uh, seven millimeters and discs uh, that are flatter, of course, uh, of nine per uh, 1.6 millimeters. After some pretreatment by washing, we did the, the electrodeposition in a home cell, um, in, a, in a cell that we built for doing the electrodeposition that is just a, a double compartment, three electrode uh, flow cell. 
that operated and the synthesis were performed at minus 1.2 volts. In, uh, in this case, we were using a electrolyte cobalt nitride, so only in our solution we put cobalt nitride, and we investigated the effect of uh, the concentration of the cobalt nitride and the deposition time on the properties of the coating. Once coated, uh, the foams were calcined at 600 degrees C for six hours. Just uh, to give you some uh, uh, um, uh, characteristic of our coatings, uh, what we observed is that, that uh, with uh, this coating, we were able to uh, code the properties, uh, to control the properties, sorry, of, of the coating, so we can control the loading and the morphology. So, uh, uh, for instance, by uh, using some cylinders, by tailoring the electrolyte concentration and the reaction time, we can uh, control uh, the solid loading. And for instance, with three sets, sets of uh, reaction condition of the synthesis condition, we can get a similar 27 uh, weight percent loading. This is for the uh, big uh, cylinders. And we uh, uh, realize that we can also do the same for the small disc by just uh, a further tailoring the, the synthesis time. So what is this, uh, this coating? Looking at, uh, at it, uh, we observe that we have uh, some uh, cobalt hydroxide uh, needle-like particles. We have this blue uh, uh, coating that is, uh, uh, has a thickness of around 15, 18 uh, micrometers that is quite well distributed and, and compact. So after calcinating, we are converting the cobalt hydroxide in cobalt espinel, as confirmed by uh, Raman spectroscopy, but without uh, uh, having a large uh, morphology change in, uh, in, in, in the solid that is coated. This uh, cobalt espinel is reducing the hydrogen TPR as a single uh, uh, reduction step, with maximum that's around 415 degrees C. And uh, it has the coating has a specific surface area that is uh, 22 uh, square meters per gram. Just to tell you that this uh, 22 square meters per gram are uh, very similar for than uh, for an spinel prepared by the conventional precipitation method. So once that we uh, uh, prepared our catalyst, we analyze uh, their activity in the N2O activity test. We perform several tests for both uh, uh, types of uh, coated forms, so the cylinder and disc. However, today I will only show you some uh, selective results for, for the disc. But I just wanted to, uh, to tell you that uh, we can get a similar activity if instead of the disc we use the, the cylinders. And we can also get a similar activity if we load um, uh, samples prepared uh, by different synthesis condition, but keeping constant the, the, the solid loading. And that the results I will show you uh, uh, are only attributed to the coating because in a, a test with a calcine bare form, we didn't observe any, any kind of activity. So uh, coming back to the test with uh, uh, the uh, coated disc, we load it in our fixed bed reactor five coated uh, disc that uh, contain a solid loading of around 24 milligrams. Uh, the tests were performed at a space velocity of 75 uh, milliliters per hour per gram of, of catalyst. And we uh, uh, investigate the N2O decomposition by feeding at uh, 25,000 ppm N2O uh, gas stream. And uh, also uh, we evaluated the fact that inhibitors by using uh, uh, by adding 50, 500 ppm of NO and uh, uh, 500 ppm of nitric oxide and 2% of oxygen. How uh, the tests were performed? They were performed by uh, temperature program surface reaction. So we did several cycles of this uh, TPSR. Then uh, we uh, investigated the uh, stability by doing a long test for 24 hours at 500 degrees C. Uh, only feeding N2O, and at the end of this test, we repeated uh, this, the initial uh, temperature program uh, uh, reaction. The effect of uh, the inhibitors of nitric oxide and nitric oxide and oxygen were, uh, was only evaluated by a uh, temperature program uh, uh, reaction. So uh, in this slide, uh, you can observe that uh, our catalysts uh, start to be active in the N2O decomposition at uh, around 350 uh, degrees C. And we can reach uh, an almost uh, 100, uh, a conversion that is near 100% at, uh, at uh, 550 C degree, with a T50 uh, uh, value of 465 degrees C. 
this activity is uh, uh, quite stable uh, after repeating the test for uh, 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 one and uh, two times. So uh, the T50 is only shifted by around 55 uh, degrees C. So we can say that uh, uh, our uh, Cobalt espinel total foam does not lose activity during doing this uh, uh, ramping test. This uh, stability is further confirmed when we perform uh, the test for uh, 24 hours and 500 degrees C. Indeed, uh, after a small uh, uh, loss of uh, conversion of around 5-6% in the first four hours, the activity remains uh, uh, really stable. Indeed, if we repeat again no, the first temperature ramp, we observe that the T50 is only shifted by uh, five uh, over five degrees C. However, so we can uh, uh, conclude at this step that uh, uh, for our form, several PPSR cycles and 25 uh, uh, hour uh, test, stability test, that does not modify, do not modify the, the activity. What about the effect of, of the inhibitors? So what we observe is that uh, uh, both feeding uh, nitricocyte and nitricocyte and oxygen, uh, the uh, curves are shifted by around 50 degrees C in the case of nitricocyte and 100 degrees C in the case of nitricocyte and oxygen. This is because of uh, both, uh, uh, both type of compounds uh, could absorb on the active sites of the catalyst so uh, making them unavailable for uh, N2O and um, for oxygen recombination. Interestingly, what we observe is that uh, when we do the test by increasing the temperature and uh, feeding N nitricoside and decreasing the, uh, the temperature, we observe some uh, kind of hysteresis loop. So uh, the effect of, uh, of this inhibitor, the same is observed also when we put oxygen, uh, seem to be uh, irreversible. Uh, the characterization of this catalyst uh, after uh, catalytic test is uh, still ongoing, but uh, now I can say that uh, uh, the first thing that we did is to uh, uh, analyze the stability of the coatings. And uh, uh, it seems that uh, the coating, even uh, after both uh, short test and stability tests or long tests, is uh, stable. And uh, uh, there is not a large uh, loose of uh, coating uh, because of detaching and that cobalt spinel is, uh, still, uh, is uh, still present. So uh, just uh, to uh, conclude, uh, we can say that uh, our uh, uh, electrode deposition can be used to, to prepare uh, cobalt spinel catalyst, so to deposit uh, uh, cobalt hydroxide layers that after calcination give rise to a stable coating of a high surface area spinel. These catalysts are stable for uh, more than 24 hours in absence on inhibitors. Of course, uh, uh, the formulation of this catalyst should be uh, uh, still improved uh, to uh, make a catalyst uh, um, uh, more resistant to inhibitors such as uh, nitricoside and oxygen. And we could uh, this uh, and this could be done just by adding some copper or cerium. Uh, to the uh, uh, catalyst composition, for instance, during the electrode deposition. So uh, thank you very much, all of you, for your attention, and, um, and I'm available for some questions. Yes, thank you, Professor Benito. Very nice presentation and a very nice performance of catalyst. Now, if anyone has question or discussion requirement, you can unmute and communicate with uh, Professor Benito. Okay. Anyone has question? Maybe I have one question. Uh, I would like to know the, the structure of the catalyst look like a very large Marco pore. And uh, in this catalysis, uh, maybe they have, do, do these catalysis have a uh, Marco pore, Marco pore, or just has the Marco pore? 
Okay, um, of course, uh, we have uh, uh, micro macro pores uh, due to the to the to the to the foam. No, uh, we have this pore that can be uh, around uh, um, uh, 200, 300, 400 micrometers. Uh, then our coating is mesopores. So uh, these uh, needle-like particles for a solid coating that uh, we have mesopores. So I mean we have pores in between uh, two to forty uh, nanometers. So we have, of course, the mass macroporosity of, of the foam, and then we have uh, our uh, mesoporosity of, of the of the catalyst itself. And this this coating is is, is quite uh, okay. It's, it's around 15, uh, 18 micrometers. So we can combine. Uh, uh, both type of porosities. Micropores not because for this type of, of, of solids it's, uh, it's quite difficult to prepare them micropores, but mesopores, yes. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. If anyone has question. Uh, can I make a question? Yes. Patricia, very, very nice talk. Uh, could, you, could you have some words about the motivation since N2O of course is an issue in different uh, processes after treatment from, from cars or heavy duty vehicles or industrial processes but of course concentration and also process constraint are totally different so what kind of application do you have in mind for these uh, foam based systems Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so we can uh, apply them uh, for uh, in, in, uh, in, um, in pipe of nitric acid. Indeed, the, the concentration of N2O that we are using is, is, is in the range between um, uh, the production of, of nitric acid. I just saw some 25,000 ppm, but we have some tests at uh, 10 ppm. Uh, of course, in, the, in this test, uh, uh, we can only take advantage of the mechanical strength of, of the foams and, the, and the, if we are operating at a high um, space velocity. However, we cannot take advantage of another property of, of the foams, that is the, the, the heat transfer, no? uh, more specific of the metallic foams. So uh, if uh, we move from the nitric acid uh, 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 treatment uh, and, and, uh, to the adipic acid, where the uh, uh, amount of uh, of um, of uh, I can I don't know you can see it of uh, uh, of N2O is much higher. We will uh, have also to deal with uh, with the heat production, not because this reaction is highly exothermic. So in this case, we can also combine the advantages of of, um, of metallic forms. I don't know if I reply well to, to your question. Oh, you 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 addressed it quite well. Thank you. You are welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Benito. Okay, okay. Thank you. now let's welcome oral presentation three experiments in operating a pilot plant for the swag sludge utilization in the fluidized bed of catalyst. Speaker is Dubin from Broskov Institute of Catalysis of the Siberian branch of Russia Academy of Science. Let's welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, please, the previous. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. trying to do it. So. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know because it uh -huh. disappeared. My. I'm not an expert. So, so uh, I know that I'm not looking at, at the right uh, mode. Please end uh, screen. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank okay. you. Okay, now I can do it. So, uh, hello, dear participants of our conference. Did you hear me right? Or did you see my presentation? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, today, I want to tell you our experience in operation of a pilot plant for the sewage sludge utilization in a fluidized bed of catalyst that we uh, create in Russian Federation in the city Omsk. So uh, I think that it, it's uh, undoubtful that uh, the problem of uh, uh, such kind of uh, waste like sewage sludge is very urgent in terms of its utilization. You know that uh, just in Russian Federation, annual wastewater uh, formation, sludge formation 
is about uh, 7 million ton tons uh, in terms of uh, absolutely dried matter. So this kind of material has uh, such peculiarities like uh, high humidity, very low calorific value, and uh, of course, high toxicity. So there are two uh, main uh, ways to utilize this kind of waste. Uh, is uh, like a storage in the waste dumps. Uh, and uh, the, another one way is the thermal treatment, including some different kinds of pyrolysis, gasification, and combustion. Uh, all these uh, methods uh, have their own advantages uh, and drawbacks, but all in all, we uh, propose our catalytic combustion in a fluidized bed technology. So, uh, if we will take the worldwide uh, wide experience in sewage sludge combustion, uh, we should say that uh, uh, there are maybe two main types of combustion is uh, mono combustion of sludge uh, with a humidity less than 25% or joint combustion of sludge mixed with uh, some traditional fuel like, like coal. Uh, in the very high temperature range, uh, up to 10, uh, up to 1000 degrees C. These kind of technologies you can find uh, all over the world, mainly in Europe, in USA, uh, Japan, and so on. And these uh, units uh, based on these technologies are very, uh, have, the, have very high cost, up to hundreds millions of euro. So for example, uh, here you can see is a few technologies working nowadays uh, in different countries. The, the general drawbacks of these uh, combustion technologies are large sizes of these installations, high requirements for materials uh, because of the high temperature, uh, expensive gas cleaning systems, and low, sometimes low productivity, and of course, as I said before, very high cost. Uh, in Russia, we have only one city, St. Petersburg, where uh, we utilize sewage sludge uh, somehow uh, uh, in terms of combustion. Uh, we use the technology of combustion in the flood bed of inert material, quartz sand. So these uh, plants, the three plants in the city was built uh, in 1997 to 2007. Um, based on the French, uh, French technology and the cost of the one unit was about uh, 40 million euros. Uh, also, uh, this technology has the same drawbacks uh, as all uh, another technologies of combustion, of traditional combustion or combustion in uh, uh, flood as bed of inert material. But we propose the catalytic combustion in flood as bed. So we use not only the quartz sand uh, as a bed uh, in the reactor, but also the uh, deep oxidative catalyst. So using this uh, system with the catalyst, we can uh, lower in the temperature of the process down to 650 or 750 degrees C, uh, as well as reduce size and material capacity of constructions. And as a sequence, we have the absence or very low concentration of uh, pollutants in the flue gases. Uh, here you can see the typical uh, scheme uh, of the catalytic reaction, uh, reactor uh, using uh, with the technology of the desbed of catalyst. The main peculiarities of our technology in terms of fuel or some waste uh, combustion are the autothermal combustion mode at the sludge humidity up to 75%. Uh, so you can't find any technologies that can work with the so high uh, level of uh, humidity. The low process temperature in uh, comparison with another methods uh, around 700 degrees C. The low uh, concentrations of harmful substances below all the limits, uh, also the low value of catalyst attrition, very high uh, sludge burnout degree up to 99%, low hazardous S formation, and of course, using this technology, we can uh, create the plants with uh, various productivity, up to four with a half tons per hour in terms of dry matter. And also, as I said before, we, uh, have no need to use some complex gas cleaning systems. 
Why we believe in our technology? Uh, because previously, uh, using the catalytic combustion fluidized bed, we already uh, built a few uh, catalytic heat supply units in Russia in different regions with a different productivity, a thermal productivity. So here you can see the photos of our boiler houses and the list of the objects in Russia and their productivities. Uh, when we come starting to compare our catalytic heat supply units and the previously stated uh, traditional layered furnaces, we can see that our technology give us the advantages in uh, economical way and as well as uh, in ecological. So that is why we are start to uh, provide our experiments in terms of uh, sewage sludge combustion in the fluidized bed of catalyst. First of all, sure, we made some laboratory experiments and here you can see the uh, scheme of our installation to provide such experiments. You can see also some parameters and uh, the types of fuels that we used for experiments, not only the sewage sludge, but uh, the different solid and liquid fuels. So uh, first of all, we provide the experiments in the uh, small scale unit of 50 grams per hour productivity to, uh, to achieve the dependencies uh, on the temperature. So using these experiments, we found out that uh, the best uh, results uh, show the, uh, that the experiments showed, showed the best results in the temperature region between 700 100 degrees C to 700 with a half. Here we have the high burnout degree up to 99% and the lowest uh, CO emissions. So then uh, using this temperature 700 with a half, we uh, provide our experiments in the uh, laboratory unit of two kilo per hour productivity. And here we focused on the ecological aspect of this process. So providing these experiments, we find out that uh, our process is very uh, ecologically safe. Uh, all the parameters in terms of uh, ecological factors were lower than uh, any limits that we have uh, in our country, as well as the limits in terms of uh, dioxide concentration in the fluid gases. So uh, then uh, having these results, we uh, calculate the parameters for uh, pilot plant unit and compare these uh, calculations with some uh, already known, already working installation like uh, Tsukishima Kikai. And also we have that uh, our catalytic unit uh, would be uh, much more effectively and uh, the cost of uh, one ton of sludge combustion would be about uh, six euro per one ton. So then we start to uh, create our scheme of our installation. Uh, here you can see the scheme, including the uh, sludge supply, uh, reactor, uh, recuperator, economizer, uh, filters to remove uh, the ash, also the wet scrubber and the chimney. So. Then we're starting to build this uh, unit in Omsk. Uh, as I said before, with the uh, calculated productivity of six tons per hour for sludge with humidity 75%. Uh, and here you can see the stages of uh, the production of our uh, pilot plant unit from the July 2019 till the December 2020 when the all equipment uh, was uh, uh, was planted on the on this uh, building and uh, fitted each other to each other so then uh, also you can see these pictures inside the reactor hall before some uh, just when we start to uh, put it inside and uh, how it looks like now so uh, current status of this uh, development, we uh, start to work in on the sludge combustion and achieve the productivity uh, up to eight 
80% for the sludge with humidity is 65 to 75%. Uh, also, we measure uh, the ecological parameters like CO, SO2, and NOx uh, uh, concentration in the flue gases, as well as uh, the hazard, hazard class of the ash. So uh, all of these parameters are in the good range for such types of the units. And also the cons uh, customer, uh, Omsk uh, Water Supply and Company, uh, planned to build, to create uh, two more uh, reactors, two more installations to cover all the need needs of this city. So our project team is, uh, as I said, uh, Omsk uh, Water Supply and Company. Uh, our Boreskov Institute of Catalysis as a main scientific uh, support. The general contractor is uh, the joint stock company Avantgarde from St. Petersburg. And also uh, engineering support, uh, the one company, joint stock company, CKTI uh, from uh, St. Petersburg. It's also well-known companies that work in, in uh, power uh, equipment, in uh, engineering for more than 50 years. Uh, so thank you for your attention and uh, I'm ready to uh, answer some of your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dubinin. Uh, if, now, if anyone has question or discussion requirement, you can unmute and communicate with uh, Mr. Dubinin. And I have one question. Uh, what is the key factor in improving the reactor performance? The key factor is the uh, catalyst presence in the reactor. Because uh, when we start to work without catalyst, we can't uh, achieve such parameters like in sludge humidity in, uh, this, is in these temperature ranges, yeah, and as well as uh, the CO concentration in the flue gases. So when we remove the catalyst from the reactor, uh, the CO concentration uh, grows very high and we can't achieve the outer thermal mode for this combustion. Uh, so. yes, very nice result. Thank you. Um, anyone has question? Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Dubin. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's welcome presentation four Advanced Flue Gas Cleaning by Wet Oxidative Scrubbing Using Sodium Hypochlorite Aqueous Solutions. Speaker is uh, Black Elo from University of Nablus, but the recall too. Please know that the presentation needs to be controlled within 15 minutes. Yes. Okay. Th thank you for your presentation. Uh, you see my presentation? Yes, very clear. Okay, okay, okay. I start. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Domenico Flagello, uh, postdoc at the University of Naples. The name of our group is the Sustainable Technologies for Pollutant Control Laboratory. And uh, today I will present uh, uh, our last finding about uh, uh, the wet oxidative scrubbing using uh, sodium chloride for, uh, uh, for the control of uh, SOx and NOx emissions. First slide reports the main search of SOx and NOx emissions divided in land basin installation and transport sector together with the recent regulation at the European level that fixed the reduction for uh, SO2 and NOx emissions in this decade and from uh, 2030. The average reduction for the next years are about 70 and 60, um, uh, uh, 65% for uh, SO2 and NOx respectively. The next slide show the limits for land-based installation, for example, for high power generation plants, and the current limits for the main country are reported in this table. We can see that uh, uh, an high reduction in emissions are required between the existing and the new plants. 
finally, the regulation about the maritime shipping are also reported. In fact, uh, in the last 20 years, these regulations have become more and more stringent. The International Maritime Organization uh, set the limits in the open sea and in some areas near to coast and the port. Um, the limits consist in the reduction of sulfur content in the fuel that is proportional to SOx emission, while for NOx the limits are based on engine technology and engine speed, uh, speed in navigation. The current technologies adopted to prevent the SOx and NOx emission are divided in two options. The first consists in the reduction of sulfur in the fuel and improve the combustion technologies for NOx. The second is the use uh, of the after treatment plants and the most common flue gas treatment technology consists in the combination of flue gas desulfurization and the selective catalytic reduction but their integration is very complex uh, due, due to uh, several, uh, several cons reported in right side, for example, high cost, uh, large science equipment, and some problems about the SCR uh, working. As alternative to conventional treatment, we propose uh, the wet oxidative scrubbing that consists in the use of a, a wet scrubber feed with uh, oxidant reagents. Uh, this technology provides uh, high desox, uh, denox performance, uh, low installation and operation cost, water and energy savings, smaller size equipment, but we have to consider the cost about the, air, the reagent and the effluent treatment. The main oxidant used in the, in the open uh, literature uh, uh, are reported below, and uh, sodium chloride was selected in our experiment in base of uh, several pro that you can see. In this slide, I show how our previous finding on uh, oxidative scrubbing about the desox system using only sulfur dioxide in flue gas, we found an experimental correlation based in a lot of experiments between the removal efficiency uh, of sulfur dioxide and operating dosage. That is the ratio between uh, the sodium chloride and sulfur dioxide molar feeding. As well, you know, uh, the sulfur dioxide is a very soluble gas and can be absorbed uh, we, uh, in, pure, in pure water by hydrolysis mechanism, but the use of sodium chloride provides an higher water saving up to 70%. The, main re uh, the, the removal results were very similar at different solution pH, confirming that the process was controlled by acidic mechanism. The absorption mechanism is reported below, and we can see that uh, uh, the hydrolysis reaction lead a very fast acidification of the system and further oxidants formed by chloride, uh, uh, chloride dismutation provide a fast oxidation of sulfur dioxide in uh, a sulfuric acid. Uh, we also found uh, that the operating dosage uh, for a complete desox was about 1.1 very close to the stoichiometric ratio. About the NOx system using only uh, uh, NOx in the flow gas, uh, you can see the results in terms of removal efficiency of NOx and wash water pH in function of the sodium chloride loading and parametric with uh, liquid to gas ratio. Uh, in this case, we found that uh, a maximum NOx efficiency was uh, 35 per, uh, 35% compared to only 3% with pure water. In fact, the NOx is a very insoluble gas in water. From uh, uh, the wash water pH uh, results, we can see that uh, the pH values were above uh, the seven value, and the process was con in this case the process was controlled by oxidative mechanism under basic condition. Uh, however, the NOx performance could be improved with the activation of an uh, acidic mechanism and uh, we have to investigate on the effect of uh, artificial acidification, for example, adding uh, other acid or uh, uh, and the rule of sulfur dioxide in the flow gas for a simultaneous absorption. The aim of the work is to evaluate the performance of uh, the wet oxidative scrubber using uh, sodium chloride. Uh, for a, a simultaneous desox denox from flue gas. This technology can be suitable for the retrofitting of existing uh, uh, FGD when a greater efficiency are required to comply to recent stringent regulation or for a new after treatment plants in place of the combination of FGD and SCR. 
the main parameters investigated are the dosage of sodium chloride, the liquid consumption, and the pH of scrubbing solution. The pilot plant used in this work is an absorption column equipped with uh, uh, 0 0.892 meter of Mellapak structured packing and with uh, 0 0.1 meter of ID. We can see uh, the feeding section of the flue gas and uh, scrubbing liquid and uh, the analysis section for the flue gas and wash water. The experiments are divided in two sets. In the first, we have only NOx in the flow gas, and the liquid flow rate and solution pH are the investigated parameter, parameters uh, set the sodium chloride at 1% in weight. In the second, uh, we have the simultaneous presence of sulfur dioxide and NOx in the flow gas, and the sodium chloride addition, liquid flow rate, and solution pH are the investigated para parameters. This slide showed the results of set one for only the NOx system. In the figure, um, the figures are reported the, uh, the, the NOx removal efficiency and wash water pH in function of the scrubbing solution pH, parametric with uh, the liquid to gas ratio. With artificial acidification, the NOx efficiency increased from uh, 35% data report in our previous work up to the complete for uh, the complete removal for the maximum uh, liquid to gas ratio used. The improvement is due, is due to uh, the activation of uh, acidic mechanism because the, uh, the new pH data uh, all uh, uh, are below the seven. Uh, in fact, uh, the under, uh, under acid condition, the new oxidants formation from the composition of chloride provide a new fast reaction and more NOx is oxidized in the uh, nitric acid. The presence of uh, uh, further oxidants, uh, chlorine dioxide and chlorine, uh, is confirmed by the color changing of solution in greenish. This, uh, this slide showed the results in the second set for simultaneous absorption of SOx, uh, SO2 and NOx. In the figures uh, are reported the removal efficiency of sulfur dioxide and NOx in function of the sodium chloride loading and the parametric with the liquid to gas ratio. We can see a complete desox using the sodium chloride. In fact, in this case, the operating dosage is greater than 1.9, 1.1 value found in uh, our previous work. Um, and uh, no uh, competition effect uh, with NOx is observed. In addition, the use of uh, sodium chloride provides uh, a water saving greater than 80% uh, respect with the use of pure water. The NOx efficiency in simultaneous absorption increased up to uh, six, uh, 65% compared to uh, 35% obtained uh, with the previous work. The Denox improvement uh, is due to uh, the activation of uh, the acidic mechanism thanks to the presence of sulfur dioxide in flow gas, which provide during the absorption uh, rapid and natural acidification below the pH 7. And uh, the fo uh, and formation of further oxidants promote the oxidation uh, the NOx in nitric, uh, in nitric acid. In addition, we have investigated on the effect of artificial acidification on simultaneous absorption, set uh, uh, the sodium chloride at 1% in weight. The desox efficiency is, uh, is complete uh, at different pH, data uh, are not shown. Uh, and denox efficiency increase up to complete removal when the pH decreases below the seven value. In this case, the double effect provided by artificial acidification in presence of sulfur dioxide make the process more efficient. Finally, uh, we propose an oxidative reaction network for NOx. Uh, you can see uh, the NOx in the gas phase that can be absorbed in the liquid phase. The first mechanism is negligible because the reaction rates of uh, hydrolysis uh, reaction are very slow and NOx react with chloride. This is a, a first mechanism under basic condition that we see in the previous work. Um, 
uh, if uh, if the, the acid concentration increase up to uh, up to reach the pH below the seven, for example, with addition of uh, uh, the other acid or in presence of sulfur dioxide, start a new mechanism with uh, the formation of further and stronger oxidants that react with uh, with NOx and close the cycle. However, we think that the improvement of DENOX is due to uh, the activation of another mechanism. In fact, the chlorine, the chlorine based oxidants can be desorbed from the liquid phase when the pH are very low and react with NOx in the gas phase. In this case, the hydrochlorhydric and the nitric acid uh, that are very soluble gas can be absorbed again in the liquid phase and dissolve tank to hydrolysis reaction and uh, close the cycle again. In conclusion, uh, this technology can be adopted for the simultaneous control of SO2 and NOx emission in land-based application and uh, marine installation, uh, for example, for the retrofitting of existing flow gas desulfurization or uh, for a new plant generation in place of the FGD and uh, SCR combination. This efficiency is complete with sodium chloride in simultaneous absorption, uh, and uh, we can see that the process is controlled by acidic mechanism with a very fast reaction, and no competition effect with NOx is observed. Then efficiency increased in presence of sulfur dioxide in flow gas uh, and with artificial acidification. In fact, in this case, uh, SO2 plays a synergistic role in the simultaneous absorption. Act, uh, activating a faster reaction mechanism under acid condition, and uh, the addition of other acid in simultaneous absorption improved the DENOX performance because provide a greater formation of further oxidant, chlorine and uh, uh, chlorine dioxide. A complete reaction network for the oxidation of NOx is proposed. We can see the basic and acidic mechanism for the, the oxidation and uh, design and scale up criteria for uh, wet, uh, wet oxidative scrubbers based on uh, operating dosage are, are proposed uh, for a complete removal uh, for SO2 and NOx. Uh, in fact, we see the, um, this ratio for desox is equal to uh, 1.1, uh, while for denox is about 2.8 under acid condition, in particular when the pH is below the 7. Further investigation will be uh, on experiments to determine the oxidation uh, rates in order to improve the scrubber design equation and uh, the study of treatment uh, uh, of scrubber effluents. The presentation is, concluded, uh, is concluded and uh, thank you for uh, your attention. Okay, thank you. Very nice work and uh, I and uh, there is significant improvement in the catalyst. And uh, I, I, I have one question about yes. your future work, how to measure the reaction rate of your system. Yes. Uh, in, uh, uh, for the reaction rate, we, we can use another system. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the reactor with the uh, falling film liquid because the, the mass transfer is, uh, um, is very controlled. For example, uh, uh, we, we have done uh, uh, other uh, experiment for determine the oxidation rate about another oxidant. For example, uh, the oxidation of sulfur dioxide with uh, hydrogen peroxide but uh, with uh, sodium chloride, not yet. Okay. Um, if anyone has question or discussion requirement. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, the question is the following. So um, you uh, provide the abatement <coughs> of sulfur and nitrogen oxides. Okay. Uh, but what is the final form of uh, chlorine? after the process? Is it chloride or something else or active chlorine? And is it mm, so from the positions of yes. secondary toxic waste, is it dangerous or not? 
Yes, yes, very interesting question. Uh, uh, the sulfur dioxide and uh, uh, NOx uh, um, uh, become uh, uh, sulfuric acid and nitric acid, mm -hmm. but uh, the chlorite become uh, um, uh, chloride and uh, uh, chlorine dioxide and chlorine and uh, these compound are, are harmful and uh, we uh, we want to study the the, the after treatment uh, for uh, uh, the effluent mm -hmm. for the scrubber effluent okay thank you mm -hmm. yes you're welcome mm -hmm. any question Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Th thank you for uh, this opportunity. Okay. You're welcome. Let's welcome our presentation by thermal degradation of nylon 6 and the real mixture of uh, sol sol solid plastic waste and experimental and the kinetic modeling study. Speaker is Professor Pellucci from Politecnico di Milano. Uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for your uh, introduction. Um, what I'm presenting today is a, a work we have done in collaboration uh, between two groups at Politecnico di Milano. Uh, one is the Crack Modeling Lab of the Department of Chemistry, Materials and Chemical Engineering, and one is the Laboratory of Catalysis and Catalytic Process of the Department of Energy. Um, this work deals with a not topic, uh, which is uh, uh, very much of interest uh, in the latest, in the last years, which is uh, uh, chemical recycling of solid plastic waste. And in particular, I will show you uh, what has been done at Politecnico di Milano, focusing on uh, polyamide degradation, and in particular, as a polyamide, uh, we selected nylon-6. Um, like we are all familiar with, uh, the goal of chemical recycling will be to uh, make solid plastic waste from being a waste be resources for the chemical industry. Uh, what is currently done instead, like you see in this uh, histogram here, is uh, about 40% of the solid plastic waste undergoes energy recovery. There are some advantages and disadvantages. Of course, disadvantages are harmful emissions, but as an advantage is the feed flexibility, high efficiency, considering the high eating value of solid plastic waste, and 90% mass reduction that will leave just 10% of solid residue. Um, another thing that is done uh, about 30% solid plastic waste is mechanical recycling. There is the advantage of actually being a recycle, uh, but involves some complex uh, and uh, highly costly process of separation, sorting, washing, and grinding, and so on. Uh, there are some issues with the melting of complex mixtures, and uh, uh, after a few cycles, we get thermal uh, degradation and lifetime degradation of the recycled polymers. So it's a good option, but still not the best one. Of course, the worst option you can have is landfill because that doesn't make uh, any sense at any level. Um, if we look at what solid plastic wastes are, and if we look at these two uh, cake diagrams, um, we see that they're quite different. Uh, there are uh, uh, more simple uh, mixtures that have been investigated in the, in the literature on the left side. And there are actually the real complex mixture of solid plastic weight where you get uh, calcium carbonate, you get polyamide, which is the main scope of this work. And you get different types of uh, polyethylene, for example, high density, low density, and so on. Uh, this complexity um, is a function of many different things, geographical area, uh, legislation, uh, the season, and of course, like we started finally to learn, people consciousness. The real issue is uh, though uh, connected to food packaging or packaging materials in general, there are actually not single polymers, but they're multi-strate materials involving different layers of different polymers. And you uh, might imagine that this is uh, not convenient 
for mechanical recycling because it will need the separation of all the different layers. And this is actually where the chemical recycling technology play or may play the major role. Uh, what we want to do in a circular economy um, frame is to exploit the high energy content, uh, consider the solid plastic waste have 18 values that are in the range of diesel fuels, uh, the low oxygen content of solid plastic waste, uh, therefore the high carbon efficiency, ensure higher margin compared to biomass, for example. And the goal of this uh, circular economy approach would be that of producing monomers and feedstock for the petrochemical industry. Uh, there are many different available potential processes. Uh, some have been tested, some are on the way. Um, what I'm focusing, what the application of what I'm focusing on is mostly pyrolysis and gasification, so uh, purely thermal processes, but there are also, of course, uh, catalytic processes like catalytic fluid cracking and so on. What is the advantage of chemical recycling uh, is the feed flexibility. Uh, is good for highly contaminated feedstock and multi-strate materials, like I said, and it produces uh, three different streams of char, so solid residue, liquids, and gases. The challenges are related to the wide product distribution. Many of the polymers, uh, particular polyolefins in the solid plastic weight mi uh, mixer, uh, have a random fragmentation mechanism when they undergo thermal degradation. And these, of course, um, produces a wide range of product and requires downstream processing. Uh, we want to ensure, of course, also high volumes is not exactly right uh, processing oil uh, because they have a collection uh, loop of solid plastic waste and you want to ensure continuity in feedstocks. Uh, another big issue is polyvinyl, polyvinyl chloride um, that hopefully can be turned into hydrogen chloride, uh, but uh, as you will see towards the end of this presentation, uh, this is challenging because, first of all, uh, we don't want to exceed maybe 10 ppm of chlorine content in the, in the product stream. Otherwise, for example, catalytic processes um, would be a be a negatively affected. And in the end, what we want to do is optimizing process conditions and product distribution. So look at how those varies with temperature, composition, the level of micromixing and residence times. And we approach this problem by developing uh, detailed or semi-detailed uh, kinetic models, trying to figure out what, the what is the condition that maximizes the product values and avoid uh, unwanted products. Um, the crack modeling lab has a mm, quite long and consolidated history in uh, modeling um, the kinetics of uh, uh, fuels in general, and in particular also solid fuels like polymers. So uh, back uh, about 20 years ago, uh, or even more, um, they started to develop um, uh, kinetics for uh, polyolefins, polyethylene, polypropylene, styrene, and polyvinyl chloride. Um, and, and following this stream, uh, we extended this recently together with the LCCP lab to PET, polyamide, and so on. Uh, plastic volatilization is a liquid phase radical mechanism. Uh, we can subdivide in two macro pathways. One is the depolymerization mechanism, so molecular weight decrease producing uh, light gases, uh, tars, and waxes. Uh, and the side group mechanism that involves elimination reaction, uh, formation of unsaturated um, chains, uh, chain scission, cross linking, uh, cyclization, and, and more and more complicated patterns. We approach the problem uh, like uh, usually done when developing uh, detailed kinetic models by defining reaction classes and assigning rate rules to the different uh, reaction classes. Uh, so you see a few examples of typical radical chain mechanisms where you have initiation, uh, propagation reaction, termination reaction, and so on. I'm not going much into the details of uh, all of these different reaction classes uh, as we have uh, recently published a, a, a review paper together with uh, Ghent University on the potential of uh, chemical recycling, highlighting uh, challenges and, and future perspective in the kinetic modeling and in the uh, modeling of heat and mass transfer phenomena that are also uh, a big challenge in, in this frame. Um, during this study, uh, we perform uh, experimental analysis at LCCP lab. Uh, we perform uh, TG, DTG, DTA analysis uh, using this apparatus. Uh, we explore different mass range of the samples to highlight possible effects of um, the mass of the sample. Uh, different nitrogen flow, of course, different eating rates from 5 to 50 uh, Kelvin per minute, 
and uh, in, in the TG were done in the uh, temperature range from 40 to 80 uh, and 800 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, and of course, the, then the, uh, the window where the degradation of course depends on the polymers like you will see. We also done uh, offline GCMS and uh, online GMS experiments. There are, uh, so speciation measurements that are now in the process of being interpreted uh, through these um, preliminary models and, and the uh, ensemble of the different models the two pro, to try to model the uh, solid plastic waste mixture. And these are uh, very good guidance in improving um, kinetic pathways and improving also uh, model parameters. Um, like um, I, I want to show in this slide uh, briefly a validation of the polyolefins uh, mechanism. Uh, so you see polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, polyvinyl chloride uh, with these uh, typical two steps degradation mechanism. So the dehydrochlorination of chlorine first and then um, another uh, depolymerization mechanism leading to uh, the formation of some char residue. And also PET uh, recently developed that I won't be focusing on. Uh, but as you can see, the model is in good agreement and we can also predict the char residue of about 20%. Uh, the most important picture is uh, uh, the one uh, bottom right where you can see that beside 10, uh, 15 Kelvin, maybe deviation uh, forward, backward of the model, we can actually get the different reactivity uh, of the different polymers and the char residue that is left at the end of the degradation. Uh, concerning uh, polyamide nylon 6 uh, that we took as, a, as an example, as a uh, reference, let's say, uh, species for the complex, uh, for, for the different polyamides, um, there are very few studies in the literature, and the few studies suggest that the thermal degradation of nylon 6 mostly produces the monomer, with some dimer below 10% in weight at temperatures uh, higher than 400 degrees Celsius. Uh, this kinetically means that. Uh, mostly four-centered molecular reaction, of course, producing the monomer or the dimer. So starting from this observation, we started to define reaction classes. So you can have an N-chain reaction producing the monomer, uh, where the monomer is epsilon caprolactam. You can have N-chain reaction producing the dimer. And you can have, of course, intra-chain reaction producing the dimer and intra-chain reaction producing the monomer. Of course, the dimer can also decompose via four center molecular reaction, producing two molecules of epsilon. Uh, These are the uh, rate constants that we implemented in our Kempkin format uh, mechanism uh, that then can be used uh, as Kempkin format for a, a kinetic simulation that are of relevance for chemical recycling process. A few notes clearly when you consider a polymer degradation, it is uh, impossible to think about um, having a model that is as detailed as the reality is because uh, the chain has different lengths. Uh, you would have uh, uh, an unmanageable number of intermediate species. So what we do is we use pseudo species. So we have uh, four pseudo species, for example, in the polyamide mechanism. Uh, one is the polymer structure in liquid phase. One is the monomer structure in gas phase. One is the dimer structure in liquid phase. And one is the dimer structure in gas phase. I want to talk a bit about how those uh, kinetic parameters were determined. If you consider, for example, reaction one, the end chain reaction producing the monomer or the intra chain reaction producing the monomer R4, they have one big difference. Uh, R1 has the H atom in the four center transition state intermediate. Uh, this uh, creates a, a nitrogen bonding with uh, the nitrogen atom, and this leads some, to some weakened bonding due to this non covalent interaction. So this 47,000, uh, 49,000 of the R4 is corrected by 2,000 calories per mole uh, to highlight the uh, enhancing effect of having a non-covalent uh, interaction. Considering the difference, for example, within two end chain reaction, one producing the monomer, one producing the dimer, as you see, they have the same activation energy, but they have a very different about a factor of 20 difference in the pre-exponent. Uh, this is due to um, entropically, entropic effects. So the formation of the dimer R2 is entropically uh, less favored uh, because uh, uh, to happen this elementary step, uh, it needs to have uh, 14 indirect rotors that are required. Each indirect rotor stemming from rules that comes from the previous studies, uh, the crack modeling lab, introduces a decrease about 10 to the 0 0.2 for each rotor. This would mean uh, uh, 
a decrease, like you see in the slide, of a factor of about 20 in the pre-exponential. These are the validations for the polyamide, uh, so TGA analysis up left, uh, uh, isothermal runs to the right uh, from the work from uh, Bockhorn uh, et al. And down below, uh, you see the uh, speciation from that same study that uh, motivated our approach based on a four center molecular reaction. And as you see, uh, the model gets uh, the increase of the dimer as the temperature goes up, but is not very accurate in predicting so. Uh, we slightly overestimate the production of, um, of the dimer, and we slightly uh, underestimate instead the production of the monomer. But we still have a good um, model as a, as a starting point that, of course, should be uh, revised. Um, of course, I'm, I'm not showing uh, all the validation targets. We have considered the literature data, we have considered uh, dynamic runs, isothermal runs, and speciation uh, for all of the different polymers I'm, I'm, I'll be talking about. Uh, then we, together with LCCP, we tackled the problem in a more systematic way. So we started from PVC because that was the main focus of the work, and we started to analyze more and more complex mixer, including P, PP, PS, and then PEP. Again, the model is capable of reproducing uh, reasonably well uh, all of the different mixtures, but the last one where we have PVC together with uh, PET, uh, P, PP, and PS. And you see there's a first area of uh, mass loss uh, that highlights some evidence of non negligible interaction between single polymers. The question is which polymers uh, interact and don't allow the model to be uh, uh, appropriately uh, representing the data. Um, another uh, thing that has been done in the past by Faravelli and co-workers is to analyze uh, binary mixtures. And what they came up with is that um, a so-called completely segregated model can be good enough to represent uh, binary mixtures, at least. This is an example of a PEPS 50-50 mixture. Uh, as you can see, the completely segregated model, where you assume that the two polymers decomposes independently and the results are just a combination of the two degradation uh, fits much better with respect to a completely mixed model. So CSM can better reproduce this experimental data, and we can uh, prove in this way that there are negligible interaction between polyolefins, at least PEPS, PPPS, and so on. And we've done the same with PVC. Uh, and, and it works with PVCP binary mixture, it works with PVCPP, it works with PVCPS. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with PVC PET. Again, uh, confirming that the interaction might be between PVC and PET, and that should be modeled more uh, in detail. The implication of uh, not understanding what these chemical interactions are are many uh, loss of valuable products and detrimental compounds that might be produced uh, and, and might uh, negatively impact uh, downstream processing because you might produce from PET, PVC. Uh, from speciation measurements, uh, we observe the formation, for example, of uh, chlorinated benzoic acid and so on. And you don't really want to waste that uh, potential benzoic acid by ruining it with the uh, with chlorination. Um, in the end, if you look at the left of this slide, this is a real solid plastic waste mixture. And again, uh, the model is able to reproduce quite well the experiments. This is, of course, uh, biased by the fact that PVC and PET content are uh, about 10% total. So uh, in the end, we are wrong in only a 10% of that 90% solid plastic waste mixture. So uh, concluding chemical recycling of solid plastic waste uh, can actually provide energy and feedstocks for the petrochemical industry and pyrolysis and gasification seems to be a promising solution. A fundamental understanding of uh, the kinetics is necessary uh, to determine the optimal operational parameters to maximize product distribution, char, tar gases, and minimize the residual chlorine to make uh, the product stream suitable for downstream processing. Detailed and semi-detailed uh, kinetic model allow to uh, correctly reproduce experimental measurements of thermal degradation of single polymers and, and mixtures of increasing complexity. Uh, the polymer kinetic model uh, has been uh, extended in this framework uh, by adding PET and polyamide to the uh, already existing PEP, SPP, and PVC kinetic model. And we've done TGA analysis and speciation measurements for a few polymers 
complex mixers, of course, going gradually from pure polymers to binary and so on. Um, coupling with um, speciation measurements is extremely important. Uh, as it allows for more detailed insights in product distribution and guides the definition of kinetic pathways. Uh, something we have to really work on uh, is the interaction between uh, heteroatoms containing polymers that should be uh, better assessed to increase the reliability of, uh, and the accuracy of our models. Uh, with this, I'd like to thank for uh, your attention and thanks uh, uh, for uh, this opportunity and this uh, nice conference. Thanks. Oh. Okay, thank you for very interesting work. And uh, I think the conclusion, the, the TGA combined with the GCMS maybe will provide more detailed information about the kinetic process. And I very hope to see the result of your work. Okay, now if anyone has question or discussion requirement, you can unmute and communicate with Professor Bellucci. Anyone has question? Um, uh, I have one question about the reaction network. How to how how, how do you uh, how, how, how do you know the reaction network of the process? Uh, um, it's very complicated. Yeah, um, well, um, if you think, if you talk about uh, polyolefins, um, the, the degradation mechanism is not very different from that of a long straight chain hydrocarbon and the reaction classes uh, of pyrolysis and or combustion or any. Uh, gas, more, more gas phase processes, let's say, are quite well known. And so by analogy, um, you, in the past, uh, the group guessed those uh, different reaction classes. Uh, concerning polyamide and also PET that I haven't talked about, um, like I said, uh, we based our uh, guess of kinetic pathways uh, based on a few experimental observations that were highlighting the fact that the, the polymerization mechanism uh, forms uh, mainly uh, monomers and dimers. So uh, this means that, of course, there are traces of uh, uh, radical chain uh, products that might come from radical chain mechanisms, but they are uh, minor compared to monomer and dimer yields. And so from that, we started to think of the reaction classes and we came up uh, with um, also following the literature with some uh, four center molecular reactions. Concerning the uh, kinetic parameters, um, what we are doing and we're trying to approach the problem is use uh, an ensemble of uh, ab initio molecular dynamics simulation of liquid phase um, systems. Uh, but up to now, what we do is um, when available, take an, a, a, a model molecule for which we know the kinetics from uh, accurate theoretical calculations in the gas phase and just correct uh, by means of the delta G of solvation. Um, that's, and, and of course, then the pre-exponent, um, you can come up with rules uh, to determine that, like I have been talking about. Uh, but then, of course, uh, at some point, you need to define uncertainty and, and perform some tuning to better match the experiment. So uh, we are far, I would say, from being um, fully predictive in the condensed phase, but we are, we are working on, on that too. OK. Thank you. Do anyone has a question? Uh, I have one. Uh, question is, uh, to what extent can you control the composition of the uh, gaseous products uh, you obtain? Um, OK. Let's, uh, typically, uh, what we try to do is uh, to uh, be able to represent as much of the speciation product that uh, are, um, are, are seen in speciation measurements. Uh, clearly, um, lumping uh, species and using uh, pseudo species, of course, has some uh, little uh, drawback in the sense that you might not be able to catch, uh, let's say, um, products that are in traces uh, because uh, trying to catch that product in traces uh, would need the inclusion of um, an excessive number of 
species and intermediates that will make the model unsuitable for, um, let's say, larger scale simulation where you consider also heat and mass transfer like uh, CFD, for example. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, I think is a bit of a, the curtain problem. Um, we can we can cover our face, we can cover our feet, and, and so we try to balance between um, a simplified approach and a detailed approach that can cover uh, the speciation of problem. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now let's welcome last oral presentation, thermal and uh, catalytic pyro, py pyrosis of West polystyrene in a semi beige reactor. Speaker is Professor Lemons from Institute Superior Technicals. Okay, let's welcome. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you are hearing me. Yes, yes, very okay. clear. So good morning, everybody. So uh, I'm going to talk about the parallels of plastic waste from waste from electric and electronic equipment. Uh, um, although we didn't agree upon, I'm going to continue a lot about what we heard from the previous uh, the previous communication. Uh, this is uh, we are working on chemical recycling of waste plastic as well. And our main objective in this work is to control what we get in gas phase. So I'm going to start with a very short introduction on what we want to do with, uh, with uh, plastic waste. Uh, we have already heard from the previous speaker that plastics are increasing everywhere. This is data from uh, the Plastics Europe Association from 2020. So plastic production around the world has been increasing, although in Europe, the plastic production has decreased a little bit. Uh, in fact, uh, worldwide it has been increasing and the China market has been increasing very fast and not only in terms of consumption, but also in terms of production. And this poses the problems that everyone knows about the problem, the plastic waste that is uh, sent to the environment. And in Europe, the situation right now is that only about one third of the plastic that is produced is actually recycled by conventional mechanical thermal recycling methods. Uh, as we have already heard, a lot of the plastic is still sent for energy recovery essentially by burning with uh, uh, general waste. And this is actually a rather significant waste of material because uh, plastics are a good carbon source. They can be used as uh, to produce feedstock for the petrochemical industry. And so uh, this is a general waste of material. And there's still a very significant portion of the plastic that is produced is going to landfills, which is a very uh, bad solution. So the industry has been turning to chemical recycling. You can see this is a recent uh, news item, and also from Plastics Europe. And the chemical industry is seeing chemical recycling as a game changer in the sense that we also have already heard a little bit about or that chemical recycling by depolymerizing the uh, plastics can be used for uh, to close the circular economy chain in plastics to produce monomers that can be reused again to produce new plastics but also to produce other valuable feedstocks that can be uh, valued by uh, conventional refining. So chemical recycling will allow us to uh, recycle plastic waste, which would be otherwise incinerated or sent to landfill. Uh, and this could significantly decrease the amount of material that is put into, um, into the production of plastics. There are a lot of problems that are associated with re chemical recycling of plastic waste, some of which we have already heard the Professor Peluki talking about. Uh, 
plastic waste is usually highly contaminated. You can imagine when you send a plastic package to the garbage, the amount of contamination that it has, this makes uh, thermal recycling unviable. Uh, it is usually contaminated with a lot of other materials. Uh, it includes a lot of plastics and it includes also biomass. This for chemical recycling is not a particular problem as biomass can also be paralyzed if we are using pyrolysis as a way to chemical recycle. Uh, the Plastics are usually of, uh, um, constituted by a rather wide range of plastic types, even if you have a, a, a source stream that is fairly constant. Usually the plastic material is designed to be useful, to be, it, it is designed so that it has uh, good properties. It is not sought for the recycling stage. So, uh, it is usually difficult to recycle in conventional ways. And moreover, plastic waste has a very low density, and this does not justify long range transport and processing. So new technologies for the local uh, uh, processing of plastic waste are uh, important. We have already heard our previous speaker talking about the uh, products. But plastic waste pyrolysis is prone to the formation of waxes. It is true that monomers and dimers are uh, significantly produced, but uh, larger oligomers are also produced. And this, is, this can constitute an operational problem in, uh, when you are using uh, actual pyrolysis. So uh, in our objective, is to analyze the processing in, of mixed plastic wastes, uh, which is, as I have just told you, the usual situation, and develop a, a, a combined reaction separation process by using a reactive distillation approach that would prevent the formation of waxes, or at least prevent the uh, waxes from leaving the reaction system and so favor the production of liquid products and contribute to the uh, recovery of uh, the monomers that are present in the plastic. In this work, we have used a mixture of two plastics that are commonly, uh, uh, commonly appear in waste from electric and electronic uh, equipment, which is acrylonitrile butadiene styrene, ABS, and polystyrene in this type of waste in we these plastics are often contaminated with for example of flame retardants these materials are used for a lot of uh, small equipment uh, like televisions blenders uh, whatever and they are usually contaminated with a lot of different uh, materials apart from different plastics themselves so we are going to talk about the uh, processing of these two plastics in a mixture. We have used a very simple laboratory uh, setup that we have already used for other polyolefins in the past and we have uh, already reported. Uh, this is a relatively simple system uh, that um, where we have uh, just uh, the mixture of plastics that is put in the reactor. And then we only allow a certain uh, uh, certain products to emerge, and we collect both liquids and gases through this setup. Uh, the arrangement has two thermocouples. The thermocouple that measures the actual reaction uh, temperature, which we'll talk about in a minute, and the other one, which is used for the PID controller that controls the temperature. And the thermocouple one is not used for the PID control because of the heat transfer limitations that uh, increase the delay in reading and make would cause problems for the PID controller. So we are going to start by looking at uh, the plastics degradation by means of TG analysis. We have actually done this with a TG DSE apparatus. So we, have, we also have the 
uh, heat flow measurements, which we are not going to present here. And we can see here that uh, ABS degrades at a, starts degrading at a temperature a little higher than polystyrene, which is the green line. This first, the drop in uh, mass in polystyrene, which is clear here in the DTG signal, uh, is associated not with the plastic, but with the degradation, the decomposition of the flame retardants that are present in this material. This uh, polystyrene came from an old TV set. You are going to hear a little bit more about this polystyrene in the next presentation uh, by Professor Amalie Lemsch, who is going to talk about polystyrene specifically. Uh, but here, what we are interested in is in looking at the interaction between these two plastics. We have also heard uh, Professor Pelucci also talking about the interactions that make uh, the simulation uh, more complex. And this is also true here, as we will see. If you look at the uh, curves of the mixtures, they cannot be interpreted as a simple um, uh, linear combination of the pure uh, plastic decomposition curves. This is also seen in the reactor. Here we have the results uh, for a 90 minute reaction with a set point temperature of 500 degrees. As we'll see, this is not the actual reaction temperature, but we can see here that uh, ABS produces the most, um, the largest amount of liquids. Polystyrene also produces uh, a lot of liquids, but less than ABS. But if you look at the mixtures, you can see that the amount of liquids is actually uh, higher than what would be expected by linear combination. And if you look at the solids, the waxes that are left after this reaction, uh, polystyrene still had about 30% of wax, but if you add a little bit of ABS, the amount of wax that is produced decreases very sharply. This can be seen more clearly in this uh, chart where the solid lines correspond to what would be expected by the linear combination of the two uh, products of the two feedstocks that we are using and the uh, symbols correspond to what we obtained for the mixtures. And you can see that uh, solid products are always below that line and uh, liquid and gaseous products are always above. And you might see that gas is actually less impacted than liquids, but uh, this is just uh, because the amount of gas that is produced is much smaller because at 20% ABS incorporation, you have uh, almost double the amount of gas that is produced uh, from polystyrene and ABS mixture. This difference is also uh, clearly seen in uh, when you look at the reactor uh, data. Uh, I'm not, I do not have time to go much into details here, but you can see here the uh, heating of the material, the reaction starts. And as I've told you, this is a reactor where uh, reflux is bound to setting the heavier components will be produced, will be taken to the gas phase, but then they will be condensed by the uh, cooling system. And you can see that polystyrene reaches a temperature of around 340 ABS, around 400. But when you mix both plastics, the, the temperature profile changes drastically. Even if you have only a relatively small amount of ABS mixed with the polystyrene. So the 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 synergistic effect of mixing both plastics uh, is evident in all of this data. Uh, we are also trying to uh, get modeling, including molecular modeling, to understand exactly what, what this, why this happens. 
we have already seen and we have already published some results on other polyolefins that also show that uh, the conclusions that we wanted and that we wish to take are actually uh, feasible. So we can conclude that both ABS and BS can be paralyzed with good liquid yields, uh, that the clear synergies is observed when the two plastics are processed together. Both gas and liquid yields are actually larger when you produce, when you process the two plastics together than when you try to process them uh, separately. So processing of plastic mixtures seems to be actually more efficient uh, than single processing, which would save a lot of uh, trouble in separating uh, plastics and would solve a problem that is currently well known in uh, conventional recycling. As I told you, I've already seen this in P, PP, and uh, HDP, LDP mixtures. Mixtures of plastics uh, seem to be uh, easier to process than actual uh, separate plastics. Okay, so just acknowledge financial support from our Science Foundation in Portugal. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Professor Lemons. Very nice uh, presentation and the slide. And uh, now, if anyone has question or discussion requirement, you can unmute and communicate with Professor Lemons. Anyone have question? Uh, I, I would like to know uh, what is the typical temperature for the operation for this process? Typical. Okay, okay. typical operation temperatures for this is thermal uh, processing. Uh, and if you look at the uh, results from the reactor, this is a very particular type of reactor because it is a reactor where you have a condenser so you are um, you are setting up reflux conditions so that the heavier components do not leave. Uh, you will see more data on this in the next uh, uh, communication. But you can see that polystyrene degraded at about 340. Uh, as uh, Professor Peluti said, this is similar cell to catalytic cracking. So the actual temperature range would be also similar from 350. Uh, you can also use a catalyst, sometimes with good results, sometimes with not so good results, as you'll see. Uh, but it's, I would say that from 350 to 550 would be good operating temperatures for this type of process. Okay, thank you very much. And um, anyone has question? Okay. Um, okay. Thank you again for uh, Professor Lemons. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, now, uh, the next section uh, is end. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.
Diz? Então, estão, estão a ouvir? Hello. 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 We can start right now. We can start. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back. We are going to start the. Technic University of Lisbon, who is going to talk to us about the uh, thermal and catalytic paralysis of polystyrene. So, Professor Lemos, whenever you are. Okay, uh, can you see the screen? It's okay? It's working? Yes, everything is okay. Yes? Okay. So, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Amelia Lemos, and it's my pleasure uh, to talk a bit about some of the work we are currently doing in our lab related to the thermal and catalytic pyrolysis uh, to process uh, waste polystyrene obtained from waste from electric and electronic equipment. Uh, the objective is to recover styrene and promote the circularity of this type of waste polymers. Um, as it's well known, and it has been uh, said here several times, plastics have become omnipresent in our daily life. So as a consequence, the production of plastics in various version forms has been increasingly worldwide and uh, they become an important environmental issue and the adequate management of waste plastic is really crucial. Uh, currently in Europe, recycling has been increasing as well, but due to many difficulties associated with conventional recycling processes, it still accounts for less than one third of the plastic waste that is collected and is sometimes restricted to some types of plastics. So efforts are being made constantly to increase the circularity of plastics and the European Union has uh, created an alliance. This alliance uh, has this purpose, but nevertheless, most of the emphasis is still put on conventional or secondary recycling. Uh, chemical recycling can be used to close one of the another section of this circular route for uh, plastics. It can be a really, uh, really a game changer in the recycling industry, which is now abreast with the problems associated with non-conventional recyclable plastic. Using chemical recycle, recycling as a complement to mechanical recycling could well double the ability to reuse and recycle, recycle plastics from waste. So, uh, we plastics, uh, that is plastics from uh, electric and electronic equipment, uh, are, uh, have some particular problems, you have heard this before, which uh, can be non-exhaustively listed here. And uh, uh, one of the problems is that plastics in me have a very heterogeneous composition, even for plastics of similar type. Another problem is that they need uh, compounds like brominate flame retardants, uh, domestic use and so on. So uh, chemical recycling can also address some of these issues and in particular by allowing the processing of mixed materials. Well, the objective of this work was what? What was to uh, develop a process that will contribute to circular economy of waste plastic from we 
And for that, we have analyzed the degradation of a waste polycyclor of we using uh, thermal analysis techniques and using our uh, reactor that is um, a reactive distillation setup that, that you have already heard in the previous communication. And uh, this reactor was uh, designed to prevent collection of heavy components. Uh, we analyze the following samples. We have fresh samples from Aldrich and they were used as received and we have waste polystyrene samples they were obtained from the carcass of an old tv set and uh, they were crushed to, uh, to four to five point six millimeters for uh, used in reactor experiments and less than two millimeters to use in the tg experiments uh, the reactor was, as I said, a semi batch reactive distillation reactor and on what the cold top of the reactor keeps heavy components inside to continue the conversion. So what have we obtained? Let's look at some of the experimental results we have. Uh, we start with the TG analysis. You can see on your left the profile degradation uh, profile tg degradation profiles and your on your right the dtg uh, profile uh, on green you have the waste uh, polystyrene samples and the other ones are fresh samples what can we see you see that uh, um, waste uh, polystyrene degrades around the same temperature as the uh, pure the fresh samples uh, more closely to the one with lower molecular weight and uh, uh, pure uh, polystyrene um, waste is apparently slower to degrade you can see there and uh, 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 these waste samples uh, uh, presents a broader range of degradation uh, temperatures and an additional degradation peak here marked with an with, sorry marked with a, an arrow and this um, additional peak may be associated with the decomposition of antimony based flame retardants uh, with the polystyrene samples leave a small amount of um, uh, residue that is not degradable up to 900 degrees. Uh, this residue may be associated again with the additives of uh, on these polymers that are always present, uh, like carbon black uh, that is used to color the plastic. Uh, although not in scope of this presentation, we already have uh, actually have seen that. Uh, with adequate pretreatment, it's possible to degrade the residue as well. So uh, when the conversion is carried out now in our reactor uh, for 90 minutes of reaction at three different temperature, we uh, um, show here 400, 450 and 500 degrees, we see as the temperature increases, as temperature increases, the liquid reduction of solid remains. But the conversion level obtained with the fresh PS polystyrene is um, significantly higher, 86% against 59% at 500 degrees. So again, there is a clear difference between uh, the reaction rate uh, in terms of reaction rate between the waste polymer and the samples, the fresh samples, uh, uh, waste polystyrene uh, is slower to degrade. In those cases, what you see is that little gaseous products are obtained with the slightler, a slight uh, larger yield for gas in case of waste PS. This again 
can be associated with the presence of additives. So in particular, the flame retardants, which are themselves degradable into volatile species. However, the amounts collected were uh, not enough to perform um, meaningful analysis. Uh, comparing now the liquid product distribution from the pure polymer and the waste polystyrene, which is uh, um, the pure polymers, they, they don't, do not differ significantly dependent on the molecular weight. Um, polymerization producing always more than 70%, more than 70% of uh, a C8 fraction, mostly styrene. With the polystyrene, the composition has larger yields. Uh, uh, interesting to notice that in all cases, the fraction of heavier components increases with the processing temperature. And uh, but but the, the distribution of the lighter components, uh, uh, especially in the fresh samples, um, remains the same. So indicating that the underlying mechanism is unchanged, and that the bone breaking reactions that originate the different products will probably have similar activation energies. Uh, what about the solids remaining in the yeah. Well, the composition of this The speaker's internet, I'm going to. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure where I stay, but I more or less here. Do you see the 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 screen? It's okay. No yes, way. Okay. <laughs> uh, my internet is not complying. Am I back? Yes. Okay. So I think I was here. More or less, yes. More or less. <laughs> so I was talking about the solids that remain inside the reactor. What about them? The composition, um, what we have seen is that uh, the solids from the fresh polystyrene is um, uh, mainly uh, the fresh polymer that uh, was not degraded. So it's... Uh, 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 polystyrene at 400 degrees and the, uh, while when you waste polystyrene we see that the solids uh, 
seem to com be composed of a compound 200 degrees, a value that is compatible for what we know with, with, with what can be predicted for styrene dimers or alpha methyl styrene dimers. So, uh, in, in this figure now, we can see the comparison between the thermal and the catalytic processes after 90, 90 minutes of reaction. Uh, when you use a catalyst, in this case it was uh, ZSM, HSM5, the conversion does not change in a significant way, but it only increases slightly, you can see here. So, um, we obtain around 60% liquid yield at 500 degrees. Uh, well, this was to be expected as the polymer is composed of very large molecules which are not capable of entering the zeolite microporous structure. Uh, however, this is also true for other polyphens which are very sensitive to the presence of catalysts. And uh, the results in terms of liquid products distribution also show that the, catalytic, uh, uh, the catalyst does not have a very large impact on the product distribution you can see it so uh, although there is a significant difference that is for all temperatures for all temperatures the presence of hgs gsm gsm5 increases the yield in c7 c8 and c9 uh, reducing the formation of heavy com heavier components so this is particularly clear at highest temperature where the amount of heavier components decreases significantly in favor of the C7 and C8 fractions. This may be due to the cracking of the heavy components formed in the thermal process. The increase in C8 fraction Okay, we seem to have been Am having technical problems again. Yes. Am I back? Do you okay. do you hear? Yes. Okay. I'm gonna share. Okay, we have only a couple of minutes, so please conclude. Um, but um, sorry, my internet is not working, so I have some problems with that. Okay, we seem to have lost the speaker again. So just okay. okay, so we seem to have lost the speaker for some time perhaps we can move on to the next one and then we can come eventually back on so the next uh the next communication 
is on 3D printing of absorbents for increased productivity in carbon capture applications. And it's uh, going to be uh, presented by Dr. Switcher there from TNO Energy Transitions. Uh, so we can, Dr. Switcher, if you wish, we can. I hope that my uh, internet will uh, work and there won't be any okay. difficulties. I will share uh, the screen. Okay. Uh, can you see it? Yes, it's not in presentation mode yet, but we can see it, yes. Okay, I switched to presentation mode, so I okay. hope that now uh, you can all see it. Okay. okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Soraya Sluiter. I work at uh, TNO in the Netherlands, and I have the honor of presenting to you uh, some highlights from the 3D Caps uh, project, also on behalf of the University of Kluge, uh, UBB, and also a lot of the work has been performed at Sintef in, in Norway. So uh, Caps uh, within the 3D Caps project stands for um, uh, carbon capture. And I think that I don't have to explain the current pressing need for uh, carbon capture technologies uh, to reach the uh, Paris Agreement targets and mitigate climate change. Um, but what you might perhaps not know is that this uh, carbon capture technologies are nowadays uh, hindered by uh, their large scale and, and the high costs uh, that these technologies still have. So if you look at the pictures uh, here, um, in the bottom of the uh, slide, you can here see a full train pressure swing adsorption system uh, and the little man standing next to it uh, for a, a, a conventional system. And here on the left, we can see uh, also a full train pressure swing adsorption system, but then um, with a structured sorbent. So by structuring, we can increase the productivity of um, uh, a capture a carbon capture process uh, and by that reduce their size and the corresponding uh, capex and also operational costs. So if I talk about productivity increase, I mean the amount of CO2 that can be captured by volume unit by time per time unit. And the goal within 3D caps was to increase this productivity and enable a uh, cost reduction for carbon capture technologies. We had two use cases uh, within the project. Uh, first one was uh, post-combustion capture from NGCC plants, and for that we used um, A-mines that were supported on uh, a solid silica support, and we call that uh, imo amo for immobilized A-mines. Uh, and the second use case uh, was the application uh, in pre-combustion capture for hydrogen production. Uh, at TNO, we're developing uh, a technology for that, uh, which is called sorption enhanced water gas shift reaction, uh, CWEX in short, and we use hydro telsite uh, materials for that. So in the 3D CAPS project, we looked at very uh, different uh, aspects of this productivity increase. Um, different partners were involved in uh, uh, activities ranging from modeling, uh, CFD modeling, but also process modeling, uh, the actual actual preparation of the uh, sorbent materials and of course testing of these uh, but also for example a business development side was taken into account uh, but in this presentation i will focus on the cfd modeling that was performed at ubb uh, the, the 3d printing that we did at tno and the testing of the resulting um, uh, sorbents mainly the mo amo sorbent so why do we want to use 3d printing um, 3D printing has the advantage that you can make um, almost any, any structure that you want to have um, um, compared to, uh, for example, traditional means such as extrusion. You can only make simple structures. And uh, with these limitless uh, opportunities, uh, we can optimize uh, different properties uh, of, the pro of, of your material, such as the mass, mass transfer properties uh, and dispersion. Um, of course, this is usually in trade-off with the pressure drop, uh, and here you can uh, do some modeling and optimize the design of the shape that you want to make. So for the, I think this is true for sorbents, but also for catalysts, uh, catalytic processes, so that might also be of interest uh, for others uh, 
that are working in that field. Um, so for the remainder of the presentation, it's important to understand uh, this, this graph on the right. I cannot see it fully, but I hope that you can. Um, and uh, what we do here is we feed a certain gas having CO2 and we measure how much CO2 is coming out of the reactor. So in the beginning, all the CO2 is being captured. Uh, but at a certain point, CO2 starts to break through. And, uh, and this was measurements done at several flow rates. And if we want to increase the productivity, we would like to increase uh, the flow, for example. But if you do that, you see that the slope of your um, uh, CO2 breakthrough curve becomes uh, less steep, uh, which has an effect on the CO2 uh, purity. Um, so we would like to have a very steep curve even at um, high flow rates, and that's what we try to uh, um, yeah, uh, bring about with uh, 3D structuring. So I would like to start with uh, a few results from the CFD modeling performed at, uh, at UBB. So the goal of this CFD modeling was to investigate the effects of the shapes of the sorbent materials, specifically on mass transfer during adsorption uh, within the CWEX process. Um, uh, the PhD student developed a model in COMSOL, uh, and we have validated that, that within the, the project. So if you can see uh, from the, the bottom uh, graphs, uh, we did so at different flow rates. The full line is the um, uh, simulated breakthrough, and the dotted lines are the um, experimental breakthrough. So you can see that both in terms of the times at which the CO2 uh, breaks through and also uh, at the shapes of the curves uh, uh, have a very nice fit. Also at different uh, pressures, we could see that we have a nice fit of this, this model. So when we had the model, this was used to, um, to show uh, that indeed having a structured uh, um, sorbent uh, has a beneficial effect on the adsorption um, uh, breakthrough curve, as you can see here. The, um, the blue diamonds is the um, experimental breakthrough curve of a packed bed, so that's what we normally use. And the simulated breakthrough of a packed bed is the, the green line. So if we compare that to the simulation from the model for a simple monolith, so that has not been optimized yet, but just a simple monolith, we already can see that we can get a, a very much sharper um, uh, breakthrough curve. And this model was also uh, used to predict uh, the effect of, of, of more complex uh, structures, for example, having a, a cone structure with a larger or smaller inlet, and also having a, a zigzag channel to induce mixing. And then you can see that indeed, uh, also having a more complicated um, uh, shape can uh, improve the productivity for CWEX in terms of the, the breakthrough curves that we see. Uh, so then printing the, the structuring of the sorbent materials, uh, we've used a technique called digital light processing or uh, DLP in short. Uh, and in this um, process, you start out with uh, a slurry, having your active material, your sorbent material or the support um, as a powder, but there's also uh, additives and a photo initiator and a monomer. Uh, which ensure that upon elimination, uh, a polymerization reaction occurs. And in this way, you build up layer by layer uh, the structure that you want to have um, um, with this technique. And in the end, you end up with the, the shape that you want to have, but it still has a lot of plastic in it. So after the printing, we need to do a delimination step to get rid of, uh, of the polymeric material. And finally, we did need to do a sintering step to, to provide strength to the structures that we, we make. Um, I also have a short movie, uh, I hope it works, uh, showing you how such a structure is built up. So we have a foil which is moving and that uh, ensures that a new slurry is uh, deposited uh, and uh, the, the structure is pushed onto that uh, and in this way, uh, the structure is built up. So I'm very happy to tell you that uh, 3D printing of both materials was successful. We printed the, the potassium-promoted hydrotelsite materials uh, for the CWEX process, and we saw that there was 
uh, virtually no decline in the CO2 um, capacity. For uh, the AMO materials, it was a little bit different. We printed only the silica support, and then we had to do an extra step to uh, put the amines on there. Um, at Sintef, they investigated several routes to this, but in the end, the, this um, aminosilane um, precursor was used to... is to see what's the cost for, for example, capture one ton CO2, something like that. Thank you. Very good question. Indeed, this was also taken into account in the uh, 3D CAPS project. Uh, I wasn't involved in that activity, so I do not know by heart. Uh, but indeed, it's the idea that you can have such uh, um, productivity um, benefits that, that outweighs the, the cost of, for example, the, the the higher cost for 3D printing of these materials. Um, I think uh, for the, the CWEX, so the technology that we are developing, uh, we can even have a, not the 10 times productivity increase, but the eight times productivity increase, uh, which is really, really important for uh, having a viable case for uh, CO2 capture. Uh, but the exact numbers, I do not know by heart. Uh, sorry, I can get back to you on, on that. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, I do have one question. Uh, in 3D printing is interesting, but to, what would you, your comments be on the production of the absorbance material at an industrial scale? Yes, uh, I get this question uh, quite often. I think uh, I at imagine. this moment. So uh, <laughs> At this moment, it's not the idea of printing an entire column yet, uh, but of course, this technology is also uh, very much under development. 
we had uh, one uh, spin, one uh, startup company also involved in the project, and they believe really that um, yeah, in the future this should be possible to fill an entire container with uh, 3D structured materials. Perhaps not with the DLP te technique that we are using, but with different 3D printing techniques. Um, and of course, it's also the idea that the, the size of your installation and the columns that you're using, the reactor columns, will be smaller. So you should not think of the, uh, the, the size that they are now, uh, but still uh, several meters should be possible. I hope that answers your question. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I think, yes. Okay, thank you very much. So is there any further, are there any further questions? If not, thank you again for your presentation. And You're we welcome. can move on to the next one. So it's the final one before the coffee break. Uh, it's entitled The New Family of Single Atom Catalysts for Degradation of Pharmaceutical Water Pollutants. And it will be presented by uh, Dr. Gian Vito Ville from the Polytechnico di Milan. Okay, Professor Ville, if you. Yes, I, I think you should be able to see my slides. Yes, not in presentation mode at yes. the moment. We can. Okay. Um, so uh, thanks a lot, first of all, for the uh, also for accepting my uh, abstract and for giving me the opportunity to um, present my work in the field of single atom catalysis and in particular today uh, on the use of single atom catalysts for degradation of water pollutants. Um, first of all, let me start to um, say what a single atom catalyst is. So when we talk about catalysts, we typically um, distinguish about homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysts. Uh, homogeneous catalysts are uh, um, uh, typically are considered like with a well-defined uh, structure where the atoms is uh, coordinated with a variety of ligands around. Uh, we have a very high metal utilization, but these materials are very difficult to separate. Uh, they might change the oxidation state the, the, the metal might also le leach, and finally they have low stability. Heterogeneous catalysts instead uh, are easy to separate, are easy to uh, have high stability, but typically they have uh, low metal utilization because only a small fraction of the metal is available for catalysis. This is the metal which is available at the surface of a nanoparticle, for example, and they also have, uh, they are, they are also heterogeneous in structures, which means that it's very difficult to uh, uh, typically characterize such catalysts and also understand what is the real active sites in this material. Single atom catalysts are a new, uh, a new way to approach catalyst design where we are using still heterogeneous catalysts, but we, um, we dispersed um, atomically the, the, the metal on a, on a porous carrier. And this enables us to have the advantages of the homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis. So we, we have material which are easy to separate, they are stable, but they also have a well-defined structure and they have a high metal utilization. Um, why we, um, why nowadays this topic is gaining more and more attention? M mainly also because single atom catalyst meets sustainability goal, in particular the, the goal on uh, responsible consumption, particular responsible consumption of metal. Um, catalysts typically are based on transition metal, and we know that transition metal like palladium, platinum, um, rhodium, rutinium, iridium, uh, they are typically rare, rarest elements, so they, they are rare on, on the Earth. And therefore, having a catalyst which minimizes the use of this material um, and enable to, to optimally uh, utilize only material at the surface uh, without wasting a lot of metal in the bulk of a nanoparticle, for example, meets this goal on uh, responsible consumption. Over the year, I've uh, used single atom catalysts for alkane semi-hydrogenation, also for Suzuki coupling, more recently also for uh, the hydrogenation reactions. Um, and today I'm going to um, present the use of single atom catalysts also for um, the degradation of water pollutants. 
In particular, this material, um, the material that I'm going to present today, were um, uh, prepared by uh, following the traditional way of uh, preparation of single atom catalysts. And in particular, we have been using uh, carbon nitride as a carrier for single atom um, material uh, deposition. Uh, in particular, we have prepared the graffiti carbon nitride structure, which is um, um, represented here by calcination of the chanamide and then by thermal exfoliation we were able to uh, obtain nanosheets of carbon nitrates. On these nanosheets, we have prepared both uh, nanoparticle uh, of nickel and also single atom catalyst of nickel. And we have done this to understand also what is the function of single atom catalyst uh, compared to, uh, to a traditional catalyst made of nanoparticle. Also, the, um, we have been testing um, pure graffiti carbon nitride and nanosheets of carbon nitride in, in our catalytic application, also to decouple the function of the, uh, of the, the, the active sites, which is, of course, nickel, from the pure, um, uh, from the pure catalytic uh, function of the, of the support. In terms of um, single atom catalyst deposition, the material were prepared by following the same um, preparation of the, of the nanosheets of carbon nitrates and then by microwave irradiation as this deposition where the precursor of nickel was dispersed um, before uh, uh, microwave irradiation in, in, a, in, a, in a flask. Um, and therefore, this enabled to spread the nickel and incorporate the nickel in the cavities of, of, uh, of carbon nitrates. The material was characterized by using uh, traditional but also some advanced techniques um, in terms of uh, more traditional techniques. In these slides, I show uh, the XRD and the XPS characterization. Um, in the XRD um, uh, figure, we can see this uh, characteristic 100 and 002 um, reflection peaks, which are um, assigned to, um, particularly the 002 uh, peak, um, uh, is assigned to the, to the stacking motif of the carbon nitrites uh, layers and the 100 um, uh, reflection instead is assigned to um, to the um, to the interplanar um, packing motif uh, of, of, of carbon nitrate. Um, what we can also see by looking in particular to the reflection peak at 27 degrees which is a sign of course of the 002 um, uh, reflection uh, is that the, 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 the peak is slightly shifted when we consider the nanosheets, the single atom and the nano nickel uh, catalyst. And this is uh, mainly because of course of the, diff of the, of the stacking layer between the different nanosheets of, uh, of carbon nitrates. Um, the XPS characterization um, uh, proved that the material is made of a MLM structure, which are, which are the characteristic structure which are repeating over the uh, nanosheets of carbon nitrates. Um, we have some impurity of oxygen which remains in the, in the, in the carrier, and this is typically uh, the case for carbon nitride motifs. And in terms of nickel um, um, metal states, I mean, the majority of the peaks that we see are actually all the peaks that we see here are characteristic of uh, nickel 2 plus, um, which says, of course, that the nickel is in the, in the, in the ionic states and coordinates with the nitrogen uh, to, um, to the nitrogen of the, of, the, of the carrier of carbon nitrides. Um, the material were also inspected visually by microscopy. In particular, here we can see um, uh, TM and STM um, um, uh, micrographs. Uh, and in, it, it's clear that we do not have nanoparticles um, as we would expect in a traditional uh, nanoparticle based uh, material. Um, the small dots that you see here uh, are assigned to, um, to nickel uh, uh, single atoms. And and uh, this was also, of course, um, corroborated by mapping the same elements uh, by ADS uh, mapping. Uh, just to give uh, also a comparison, the same, um, if we compare now the single atom with the nano uh, nickel material, we can see immediately that the nano nickel material is instead um, a, a nanoparticle which are spread around uh, the carrier with a variety, with, with the various particle size distribution, which is typically what we expect by a traditional uh, incipient wetness impregnation. 
The material were also um, characterized by uh, x ray absorption spectroscopy, and in particular, this technique, the, this technique gave a, a final um, a proof of single atom um, um, incorporation of the material, mainly because uh, if we, uh, sorry, if we consider the, uh, the, the Fourier transform of the uh, exafs, um, we can uh, as we, we can better understand where actually these peaks are, and by uh, also so um, um, uh, fitting these peaks with model, uh, we see that uh, in the case of single atom uh, material, we have actually a, a peak um, which is a, um, indicative of nickel and nitrogen neighborhoods. Um, and we also have some nickel which is uh, um, interconnected between the different layers, while in the case of the nano nickel, we have the two characteristic uh, uh, peak which are instead assigned to the oxidic uh, uh, nickel. Um, this material were tested in the degradation of gene fibrosy, which is one of the um, drugs which is, uh, um, um, which is on the list of the European Union, in particular for uh, drugs that are difficult to degrade. Um, and uh, this material um, uh, was efficiently degraded with our single atom catalyst. In particular, we can see in these slides the degradation with just uh, pure um, graphitic and nanosheet um, uh, carbon nitrates, uh, the nano nickel catalyst and the single atom catalyst. Um, these two nickel catalysts have the same loading. We have a loading of uh, around um, uh, 3% um, nickel. Uh, so one question, of course, that could um, come is whether this uh, difference of uh, um, nickel uh, activity normalized, of course, to the exposed um, uh, active sites which are less in the case of a nanoparticle will be uh, will make the nanoparticle catalyst more active than the than the single atom catalyst for this reason we have also prepared a catalyst with a higher uh, amount of nickel in the nanoparticle form but with the same um, if we normalize to the exposed uh, amount of nickel that we have in the single atom with the same amount of nickel and therefore um, we, what we can see by using the same exposed amount of nickel on the surface is that indeed, indeed the single atom catalyst remain more active than the nano nickel uh, material. And this is uh, indeed, um, can, can be indeed um, assigned to the different um, active sites that we have in the material. Here we have mainly uh, nickel two plus, while here we also have some nickel zero, which we have considered like less reactive in this specific application. Uh, in terms of um, uh, understanding of also the catalytic performance, if we um, now uh, consider the, the whole um, uh, plot, catalytic plot that I shown before, and we can see that this plot actually follow the photoluminescence uh, trends of the material. Uh, to understand actually what this uh, um, plot uh, represent, we typically in a photoluminescence um, uh, characterization, what we trying to uh, understand is the separation uh, rate of the photo um, of the photo generated electron uh, hole pairs and we try to, uh, to to see actually when the time of the photoluminescence um, ends now in this case the single atom catalyst is a lower um, is, is a lower um, uh, time of uh, photoluminescence compared to the nano nickel and to the to the pure uh, carbon nitride material and this this um, indicates that the introduction of nickel in this material um, promotes the electron transfer and reduce actually the photogenerated electron hole recombination, which could be uh, responsible for a lower uh, reactivity of the material. The um, material were also um, uh, tested also in the absence of light, and in this case, of course, we do not have uh, degradation of the of the of the of the drug, which is uh, indication that we need uh, photocatalysis for this uh, specific application. And also, uh, we have recycled the material um, a few times, and we do not we did not observe a dramatic drop of the activity. There is a very slight drop. 
uh, but the, the, the activity remain actually um, the same. What was very interesting actually to observe is that by, ex by characterizing also um, in, in depth the type of, uh, uh, of product that remain in the solution after uh, photocatalysis, what we can see, what we could see is that in the case of the uh, pure carbon nitride material, but also in the case of the nano nickel material, we have a higher fraction of organic moiety which remains in the, in the, in the product solution. While in the case of uh, nickel single atom catalyst, um, uh, the a fraction of, uh, of organic moiety, um, which are typically, of course, uh, aromatic moiety, which remain in the product solution, is much lower. Uh, to, uh, to close the carbon balance and also considering the degradation, um, uh, the degradation um, uh, path of uh, gen fibrosis, which is shown here, and you, as you can see, there are a variety of, uh, of, uh, of, of organic moiety that can be formed. So to close the carbon balance, we have assumed that the remaining are of course gas of species that are formed and they are uh, they are the lead uh, the, the the product solution and therefore what we um, in this product these gas of species are, are of course co2 and the and the and water so this is an indication of course of the full degradation which is more prone on the single atom catalyst compared on the nickel uh, on the nano nickel and on the pure carbon uh, nitride um, to, um, of course, we are currently better understanding this material, this, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this degradation path also with the help of some uh, DFT calculation. Um, but this anyway brings me to the, to the conclusion of my talk. Um, so in this presentation, I've shown um, a, a family of uh, nickel single atom catalysts, which are uh, more effective on, um, on uh, the degradation of uh, gen fibrosil compared to nano nickel uh, material and also compared to the pure um, uh, um, to the pure carbon nitrate. Um, what we are currently doing in this, in this direction, also in terms of, uh, of outlook, is preparing a, 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 a several other single atom catalysts based on other type of metal, uh, in particular the cobalt, zinc, um, and nickel, um, sorry, cobalt, zinc, uh, iron. And we are also uh, trying to, we want to understand actually what happened in terms of reactivity uh, on the material when we, uh, when we change the metal um, type and what happened actually on the, on the charge transfer effects that we have on this type of material in the degradation of the pollutants. And of course, as I've already mentioned, we are also trying to better characterize also the products um, to understand, um, actually to close better the carbon balance, to understand what type of products are we forming in over the nano nickel, over the single atom nickel, and in general over the pure carbon nitride uh, carrier. With this, um, um, I, I arrived to the end of my presentation. Actually, I would like to thank all the people that are uh, currently collaborating with me and then that they've also collaborated on these projects from uh, different institutions mainly in Europe. Um, and in particular, uh, the two PhD students and the postdocs that are currently working uh, with me on this and the other application of single atom catalyst. And um, thank you, of course, for your attention. And if you have any question, I would be very happy to address them. Okay, thank you very much. So we still have a few minutes. Anyone has any question that would like to put to Professor Villa? Okay, I do have one question. It's very interesting, the single atom catalysts. And you have shown that you can reuse the catalyst, but did you have any uh, Indication on possible leaching of the nickel from these, the smaller the size of the aggregates, usually the easier the. So we have characterized the used catalyst by um, TM, and first of all, we do not see aggregation of the of the. Um, of the nickel, and we have also um, analyzed the product solution um, by uh, ICP, and we do not see uh, nickel. Of course, we are. Uh, um, it could be that we are leaching a very tiny amount of material, and we are below the um, below the the, the 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 level of measurement by from our techniques. But at the moment, we do not see. Um, at least we do not see a leaching of nickel on, on this material in, in the final product solution. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, anyone has any other question in relation to 
this communication. Okay, we are almost on top of time, so I'd like to thank everybody, all the speakers. And uh, we will now go into coffee break. And we will meet again uh, later for the next session. Thank you very much for your participation.
Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And can you hear me? Yes, perfectly, Andre. Oh, very good. Okay. So it seems to me that's already time we can start, right? Uh, I hope so. So, uh, dear colleagues, uh, hello. I am very happy to see you all here, uh, to see all people who I see and a lot of people who I don't see but who are present now currently in our Zoom. Uh, I'm starting uh, this opening, not because I'm the most important person here, it's just something like a dispatcher who will uh, give the words uh, to people um, to make some introduction speech. I don't. Speeches. I don't hear anybody. I don't hear Andre. Mm -hmm. Well, Enrico, do you hear me? Yes. I don't hear. I, can you unmute and then I can see whether I hear you or not? Yeah. Can I you hear me? You. I don't hear you. I can. Uh, I, I. I. I can hear you. <laughs> and uh, I can hear everybody else as well. Yeah, I can also hear him and I can also hear everyone else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, sorry, we, I, I think we have to go on. Okay. So yes, uh, now no, we'll I... start the opening procedure and uh, maybe uh, Matteo Maestro will. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So maybe uh, Matteo Maestro will also uh, say a couple of words before, before our uh, all introducing speeches. Matteo is a, uh, also one of the main organizers of this conference. Please yes. say a few words. Okay, so thank you, Andrei, and uh, dear colleagues and friends, is also my warmest welcome to Chem Reactor 24. Mm -hmm. So I think that together with uh, Andrei and the rest of the committee, we have finalized a very interesting scientific conference uh, from fundamentals to latest application in several fields. Therefore, I wish you an exciting and fruitful conference and I, I look forward to the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, now uh, I think we can uh, start uh, the real opening procedure. And uh, the first I would like to uh, dispatch uh, to follow forward uh, the award to uh, chairman of the International Scientific Committee of our conference, who is a traditional chairman uh, of this uh, scientific committee for many years. Uh, for, to Professor Parmon, uh, uh, in fact, he was not able to be present here um, in, in real time, let's say so, uh, but uh, so we have a recording uh, of the speech. So uh, Tatiana, can you please switch on the speech, the speech of Professor Parmon? Uh, dear friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is such pleasure for me to participate at opening of the 24th conference on chemical reactors, chem reactor. Well, it is honor for me to be <coughs> in contact with this conference for many, many years. I would like to uh, remember that uh, this conference was arranged firstly in uh, Soviet Union as typical, not very uh, large, uh, domestic national conference. But nevertheless, uh, the topic of the conference was so interesting and so attractive that step by step in uh, our conference came reactor, uh, international partners were participated and step by step uh, <clears throat> this uh, uh, chem reactor uh, conference started to be an international conference. Uh, we have experience to arrange it not only in Russia, in some uh, cities of Russia, but also in uh, other countries. And in the history, we arranged uh, the, uh, this conference in Helsinki, Berlin, Athens, Crete, Malta, Vienna, Luxembourg. The geography of participants was also very large. And now we hope that uh, the attendees will be from uh, 50 uh, countries. Uh, indeed, 
of the problem of basic research in the area of uh, constructing and uh, designing catalytic reactors and chemical reactors as well is very wide and very important for many uh, applications, many practical applications, not only for theoretical uh, training. Uh, indeed, we were very glad that uh, some uh, well-known universities throughout Europe uh, helped us to arrange this conference, for example, uh, Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, University College uh, uh, London uh, in the United Kingdom, Ghent University in Belgium. Uh, now uh, we had the honor to be invited, invited uh, by uh, the eminent uh, university uh, Politecnico de Milano. Unfortunately, the well-known situation with COVID did not allow us to you know, collect us uh, together in one place and uh, many events of our conference will be arranged by uh, special uh, technical systems. But nevertheless, I believe that uh, it did not prevent uh, very uh, serious discussion, uh, conversations, uh, new contacts and so on. So I would like to uh, wish the uh, very good results of our conference and indeed we would appreciate to uh, discuss possibility to continue these conferences in other uh, cities or other countries. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks to Professor Parmon for this speech. Uh, as he already said, that uh, this conference would be impossible without uh, such a significant and very helpful, efficient partner in our conference, uh, Milano Politecnico. Uh, of course, uh, uh, people from Milano Politecnico made a great job on preparation of this conference and uh, provided very excellent a uh, bunch of uh, contributions uh, to this conference. So I would like now to uh, give the words to representatives of Milano Politecnica. Maybe I think uh, the first one, uh, maybe to a choice, but uh, it, it seems to me that uh, I would prefer to give the word first to Enrico Tronconi, who is a participant of Chem Reactor Conference for many, many years. Enrico, could you please say a few, a few words? And thank you, thank you. Andre for the for the invitation and uh, dear colleagues, uh, uh, on behalf of the Catalysis and Chemical Reaction Engineering Group at Politecnico de Milano, it's it's my great pleasure to welcome you all, even though virtually, to Milano for this exciting new edition of Chem Reactor Conference. And in fact, our group is very proud of uh, being part of the scientific organization of Chem Reactor Twenty Four. And in this regard, I would like to express my, my appreciation to professors Giampiero Groppi and Matteo Maestri, and to all the colleagues and friends from the Boreskovi Institute who have made an exemplary effort in putting together a very, very nice scientific program for this, uh, for this conference. And on this occasion, however, I would like also to spend just a few words in memory of Professor Pio Forzatti who passed away last July. Pio was not only the founding father of our group in Milano and our mentor, but he also was the one who first established close connections between Milano and the chem reactor community. At the end of the last century, Pio was one of the few foreign participants in the conference, which at that time was still held only in Russia. And after that, he was for a long time a member of the International Scientific Committee of Chem Reactor. So I'm positive that he would be very pleased with the excellent scientific program of Chem Reactor 24. 
And now I just want to wish you all a stimulating and very successful conference. Thank you very much for your speech, Enrico. It's very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, uh, uh, now I would like uh, to uh, propose to say some few introducing words uh, to another person who did a lot for conference, the Cam Reactor Conference in general, and especially for this Cam Reactor 24 conference, Professor Jean-Pierre Agropia. Please, Jean-Pierre. Thank you, Andre. And good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, depending on the, your time zone. <laughs> First of all, let me say that would it have been a real pleasure to ask Cam Reactor in Milano, also because September could be a very nice period here, and actually the weather today is, is really fine. However, this was not possible under the present circumstances, and we're equally honored and delighted to assist our colleagues from the Borescov Institute in organizing the 24th Chem Reactor Conference by remote. Uh, Professor Permon have already illustrated the historical importance of this conference in the chemical engineering community, and more specifically in the chemical reactor technology field. I don't think it is necessary to add further works except for my personal involvement as an enthusiastic participant to previous edition of Chem Reactor. Conference, as you have seen in the program, has been structured in four different topics ranging from the chemical reaction engineering fundamentals to the experimental and theoretical methods for reactor design and scale up, and to the advanced reactor concept based on non conventional source of energy, on novel structured geometries, and on multifunctional integration of reaction and separator steps. It's an honor to welcome the conf at the conference, although regrettably not in Milano, all the plenary speakers and the uh, uh, keynote lecturers that who accepted our invitation to provide top level contribution. We will cover most of the key topics of the conference. I'm confident that the high quality of their presentation will uh, boost the discussion in the different thematic sessions all along the conference. Finally, let me thank in advance all the attendees for their active participation and our colleague from the Boreskov Institute for the impressive efforts they made to organize such an high level international conference under these difficult circumstances. Enjoy the meeting. Okay, thank you very much, Jean Piero. Uh, okay, we have some time, so I would like maybe to, uh, before our uh, next lecture, to give uh, some introduction, uh, maybe some statistics information about our previous chem reactor conferences. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. So, uh, yeah, yeah. from the beginning. So, just some introduction, statistics, some information about these conferences. So, so this is the chem reactor number 24. As you, of course, already know, uh, arranged uh, this time by uh, Bariaskov Institute of Catalysis in Novosibirsk and Milano Polytechnica in Milano, Italy. Uh, the history. So the conference statistics, uh, we actually tried to calculate how many people in general participated in all these events for all these years. It's definitely, I think, a few thousands, including uh, more than 1,000 participants uh, during uh, maybe the last 10 conferences. Uh, you can see uh, here the map of the world. Uh, so the green uh, is the points where the conferences uh, were already held. I should say it's a map from some previous events. So Italy is not uh, uh, colored here in green. Uh, I think uh, we will do it uh, in the closing event <laughs> of the conference. Uh, but you can see that uh, a yellow uh, color means particip participants. 
So you can see that practically we uh, already involved more than 50 countries during the whole history. And at each conference, we approximately have something like 200 participants from uh, more than 30 countries. But in total, we have more than 50 countries. And involving practically all parts of the world and all continents, except maybe Antarctica. So something wrong is with Antarctica and all other continents are participating. Here you see the list of these conferences, starting from uh, events in the end of last century, uh, which were uh, held in Russia, but uh, it's already starting from 1996. Uh, there were some international participations provided since that time. And you see that uh, from this century, from the year of 2001, we started to uh, arrange these conferences in Europe. In Helsinki, then in Berlin, Athens, Malta, Vienna, Luxembourg, Delft, London, Ghent, and uh, now uh, theoretically Italy, and uh, unfortunately, just theoretically, practically, we are online. Uh, now we have uh, conditions, but I guess this conference. So, uh, of course, uh, Italian uh, Milano Polytechnic uh, did a very great job to arrange this one conference. And uh, one of the most uh, important traditions of this conference is uh, the lecture dedicated to the memory of Professor Mikhail Slinko, who was the founder of this conference and very significant uh, scientist uh, in Soviet Union and Russia. Uh, you, you see the uh, list of uh, all activities, all his works uh, in chemical engineering. Uh, Maybe very briefly, I could say that he was one of the first person who implemented uh, the um, chemical reaction engineering is active participations of modeling methods. Uh, and uh, it was a great step forward, uh, not only in domestic scale, but uh, he was possibly one of the persons worldwide uh, to start uh, this very interesting and promising area. Uh, starting from the uh, year of 2008, uh, so it was decided to establish the honorary Slinko lecture. Uh, and it was decided uh, that the, for each chem reactor reaction, uh, each chem reactor conference, uh, it was decided that the right to present this lecture at each conference will be given to the world, world uh, recognized experts in the field of chemical reaction engineering. Uh, who, and uh, this person is traditionally selected by the members of the International Scientific Committee. Uh, this is the list of people who already, we, the first one lecture was made in uh, chem reactor at uh, Vienna, Austria. The first one was read by Pro Professor Matros, uh, who was actually the student of uh, Professor Slinko. Then in Luxembourg, uh, we had a lecture from uh, Andrzej Stankiewicz. In year of 2014, uh, we have even two lectures because it was the anniversary. It was a special year. It was the 100th anniversary of Professor Slinko. And uh, there we have uh, two lectures. You see by Jakob Mulain, Frick Kaptein, and Javier Perez Ramirez. And another one by Dan Lass. Mm -hmm. In uh, 2016 in London, uh, Gilbert Farma uh, provided a Slinko lecture. And at the uh, last event until our conference uh, in Ghent in 2018, this lecture was provided by uh, Jans Norskov. And uh, so this was a very brief introduction of this uh, tradition and uh, the following. Uh, Okay, and uh, uh, now uh, we can, we still have some time, but I guess we can uh, um, uh, softly uh, transfer to, we will have uh, this memorial Slinko lecture right now in a few minutes. Uh, so, uh, the only thing that I want to say now, of course, we will have uh, Afterwards, we will have the closing procedure and we will uh, maybe talk again and discuss the results of our conference and exchange our uh, opinions about it. Uh, currently, at the moment, I would like only to 
wish uh, all participants, uh, first of all, to express my gratitude to all participants who decided to participate in this not easy time. Uh, I see the attendance is very good, very in quality and in quantity. So very, it seems to me uh, we have very good perspectives for this conference. And uh, I would like to wish all participants to present their contributions in the optimal way and receive the maximum use of this conference and maximum positive uh, knowledge, emotions, uh, contacts. And so, so, so all good, I wish all people good luck. And I would like to transfer already the word to chairman uh, of uh, our next session, uh, Professor Dmitry Murzin and Professor Tapio Salmi. which time 11 at uh, UTC so yes. I think we should probably wait for some okay. five well, minutes for yeah. other people to join okay uh, yes would it, would, it, would it be the best solution I guess, yes otherwise. okay let's wait for five minutes I wait. think we just wait for five minutes and then we will start mm -hmm. thank you together with my excellent colleague, Professor Morzin. And we are very curious about to listen to the first plenary lecture. So soon we are starting. Where are you, Topia? Where? Where, where are you? I am in the seminar room, which has oh, the okay. name Rubidium. Yes, you know, the alkali, the alkali metal. Mm -hmm. Rubidium is the name of this seminar room. Uh, we have moved to this building uh, a few weeks ago, completely new building. Tatio and Dimitri, I just want to say that my computer was hacked uh, uh, one hour ago. So I had to do all kinds of things to be able to join in time. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm a bit nervous because it was hacked from, uh, uh, and my university told me it was from Germany. Um, and then the, they kicked me out because they, there was danger of contamination. Uh, and I, I just managed to join uh, half an hour ago again. Was it your laptop or? My laptop, yes. Oh, everything is okay. Now you're back to normal life. I think we will start in really a couple of minutes. In this couple of minutes, maybe I will say also some uh, words that we are very grateful also for preparation for arrangement of this conference to Ilios company, who is already our partner for many chem reactor conferences and uh, who also did a great job uh, in preparation of chem reactor 24.
Professor Slinko uh, is a very respected figure in the field of chemical reaction and chemical reactor engineering. Uh, he himself was a physicist by training, but starting from his very young years was exposed to chemical technology and chemical uh, engineering, was a veteran of the uh, Second World War, and then uh, uh, started to work at the Karpov Institute of Physical Chemistry in Moscow uh, in the laboratory of uh, technical catalysis uh, together with Professor Bariskov and uh, both of them moved to Novosibirsk at some point where uh, Professor Slingo was a deputy director and where he initiated uh, research in the field of uh, uh, chemical reaction uh, and reactor engineering. He was very instrumental also in uh, applying uh, mathematical uh, models for chemical uh, reactor engineering. Uh, and he was also the person who in fact initiated uh, the whole series of uh, chem reactor conferences. Uh, at first they were organized mainly in the former Soviet Union and then 2000 one was the first international emission of that conference, uh, which actually was held in uh, Helsinki. And one of the plenary lectures was given by uh, Professor Slinko together with a second person. Uh, it was actually me. So there were two plenary speakers at that conference. And the reason uh, for us somehow being associated together was that uh, Professor Slinko at some point kindly agreed to be an opponent of my habilitation thesis. And then later on, we uh, even uh, published a couple of uh, papers together. He was an, an amazing gentleman at the age of 85 or 90. He was able even to uh, derive second order differential equations and they just came uh, out of his head without any problems. Uh, so, some time ago, the organizing committee of this international uh, scientific uh, conference, Kim Reactor, decided to uh, award or establish the Professor Slinko honorary lectures. And there were several already awardees of this type of award. And now uh, the lecture. Uh, will be given by a famous uh, professor in uh, chemical engineering, chemical reaction engineering, in particular, Gimara. And I hope that my colleague, Professor Salmi, will say a few words about the uh, about Professor Gimara. Tapio, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. <clears throat> Gimara comes from the Laboratory of Chemical Technology and the Center of Sustainable Chemistry at uh, Ghent University, Belgium. Uh, the scope of Professor Moran's uh, research is very broad from chemical kinetics and chemical engineering, aimed at the modeling and design of chemical processes and products uh, from the molecular level up to industrial scale. He is member of the Royal Flemish Academy of Belgium for Sciences and Arts, and he has got uh, very many um, recognitions on the international level of chemical engineering. For example, he has given the P.V. Dankwitz Memorial Lecture in Chemical Engineering and Kinetics. Um, uh, Professor Moran is co-author of two books uh, and uh, author and co-author of more than uh, 700 original uh, articles in high impact uh, journals. Uh, he is also a co-editor of the very prestigious uh, journal, Chemical Engineering Journal. So at this moment, uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to invite uh, Professor Guy Marin, one of the greatest scientists uh, in uh, chemical reaction engineering, to give uh, the first plenary lecture of this chem reactor conference. 
Dear Guy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tapio. Uh, thank you for the very nice words. But I would like to use my own slides. So, so the slides that are shown now are those of yesterday, and I did make some changes. And I would, I would like to be able to, uh, to use my most recent version and to share that with you. Uh, so um, I did call Tatiana to, to ask her to do that. Probably you can, can, so, can request can so, the remote control when you see yeah, it, uh, I, clear view options. Maybe I, uh, can. I cannot start screen sharing while somebody else is sharing. Yeah, so, I think uh, you should go to view options and then request remote control. That's what I did now. I still cannot start sharing my screen. You should then ask the technical assistance. Yes. So I'm still seeing uh, Tatiana's screen. Uh, Andre. I'm trying, yes, I'm contacting technical people. So you already uploaded your presentation, right? Or not? Yes, but it's not long, no longer the most recent version. And I would like yes. to have full control of my slides. Yeah, so the best <laughs> is that uh, you will be allowed to have the, the control. Алло, алло, что там? Да, да, он просит поставить более, более свежую. I think I will start. Um, so, so first of all, I, I would like to thank all, all of you, uh, and in particular the scientific committee, to give me the honor to give this presentation. I, I feel very humbled by uh, having this honor, and um, I uh, I'm, uh, always have been very, very uh, much impressed uh, by the work of the, by the work of the Soviet School of uh, of uh, chemical engineering in general and the catal catalytic reaction engineering in, in particular. Um, I want to uh, organize my talk as follows. I will, uh, first of all, give an overview of what I consider being the challenges for our field today, uh, and also the corresponding opportunities. Um, and then, then I will uh, address the issue related to raw materials on one hand and energy on the other hand. Um, the uh, times are changing, um, uh, and to quite recently, we were used to use uh, fossil fuels, uh, natural gas, coal, crude oil, in order to come to useful products, 
uh, and uh, the process industry has done a very great job in doing so. Uh, but um, this was uh, um, do, done in a linear way. That means that uh, uh, we did not really uh, um, uh, worry about the end life of our uh, products, uh, uh, nor about the CO2 uh, emissions. Um, so uh, we want to change from this linear uh, type of economy to a circular type of economy. Uh, and in particular, uh, we want to either use, start using renewable uh, feedstocks like biomass or uh, plastic waste uh, and waste in general to uh, come to the useful services and products that are of interest to us. Um, circular economy can uh, be realized by uh, five types of loops. Uh, and uh, if you utilize all of them, uh, um, uh, a Dutch uh, recent study has shown that uh, up to 70% of the European chemical industry uh, uh, products can be uh, recirculated. Um, in what comes, I will uh, focus on uh, uh, three out of these four uh, loops. I will focus on uh, uh, renewable raw materials, on the chemical recycling, uh, and on energy recovery and carbon utilization. Um, climate change uh, uh, enhanced energy uh, um, is a crucial thing next to the choice of raw materials. What is shown here is uh, um, um, uh, uh, on the left, a uh, um, conventional technology to establish the high temperatures needed for a lot of the chemical process industry uh, processes. Um, and uh, uh, this consists of basically having the reactor suspended in a uh, gas-fired furnace. Uh, and on the right, you see uh, an alternative, so-called electric heating, uh, which uh, is relying on the Jolla effect to establish the desired uh, um, uh, temperature. And, and of course, um, and this would help the, to, uh, tackle, to tackle the climate change uh, challenge by um, uh, having uh, only if we could really um, manage to have a uh, electricity which is cheap on one hand and also green on the other hand. Um, one other way of, uh, of coming to a solution uh, uh, for the climate change is indeed to uh, uh, start uh, connecting different industrial sectors with each other. Um, in this slide, I show the um, um, uh, sector consisting of um, treatment of uh, uh, waste, organic waste from agriculture by anaerobic digestion, uh, which produces, as you know, a mixture of methane and uh, CO2, and which after um, uh, some separation uh, leads to biomethane, which can be injected in the existing natural gas grid. And then it can, you can imagine that you can combine this uh, uh, um, biomethane with the CO2 point emissions in order, for example, uh, to convert the CO2 into uh, CO and, uh, and next using CO as a new chemical building block. Um, what are the opportunities uh, uh, provided by these challenges for our field? Uh, well, uh, that is what I will discuss next. And you can all, all of them uh, put them into the category of process intensification. And uh, I've shown here two former uh, uh, awardees of this uh, lecture who are, have been advocating very early on uh, process intensification. Chemical engineering uh, and hence also process intensification involves a very broad spectrum of uh, length and time scales. And we start from molecules uh, and go up to, uh, to the size of uh, particles, catalyst pellets, for example, come to the size of a reactor, a complete plant, and then a full uh, enterprise. Um, the um, uh, um, voie royale to handle uh, these uh, multiple, uh, these huge uh, length scales uh, uh, spectra uh, and uh, time scale spectra is uh, uh, highlighted in this uh, slide. Um, the uh, um, um, Important to stress is here that uh, you want to, uh, to be able to, um, to uh, combine laboratory data with uh, ab initio calculations. Um, 
And this uh, leads to what you can call uh, microkinetic models. That means uh, kinetic models, which are not simple empirical rate laws, but which correspond to uh, insight into the reaction mechanism uh, uh, and are based on all the elementary steps that are involved in transforming a, a molecule into a useful product. And once you do have this uh, type of uh, uh, microkinetic models, it is sufficient between quotation mark to, uh, to um, um, uh, um, excuse me, it is sufficient between quotation marks to uh, apply the conservation laws of momentum, mass, and energy uh, um, um, in the form of uh, computational fluid dynamic models. Uh, to come to uh, process and or product uh, design. Um, let me go through, uh, through this uh, step by step. Um, uh, for example, uh, and this is an example of uh, up initial calculations of uh, 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 steps involved in the conversion of alcohols uh, catalyzed by zeolites. And the, um, the, uh, um, can, you, can you get the full screen? Is, is this, I see only now, I don't no longer see a full screen. Can somebody? Uh, Maybe. Uh, it's possibly on your side. Is it possible? Uh, okay. How you usually uh, turn on the full screen in your presentations? Yeah, okay, oh, there it is, yeah. Um, so, so, so the um, uh, what, what is shown here is an ethanol molecule interacting with an uh, acid site uh, of uh, ZSM5 in this case, uh, in, in, and uh, being uh, adsorbed. And uh, we can calculate with density functional theory the corresponding equilibrium adsorption equilibrium coefficients and the uh, um, rate coefficients. Um, Another important aspect that is uh, um, uh, popped up um, um, in the last uh, decades is uh, uh, several uh, huge advances in uh, experiment techniques. Uh, one of them being, for example, the so-called uh, uh, two-dimensional gas chromatography, uh, where you separate complex feedstocks uh, uh, based not on one property, but on two preferentially uh, orthogonal properties like volatility on one hand and polarity uh, on, on the other hand. I should not forget to mention also the huge progress that has been made uh, concerning the techniques allowing to characterize catalysts uh, 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 even during a reaction. Um, microkinetics is accounting for all the elementary steps uh, involved in the chemistry that is relevant. Uh, so at first sight, you would think that uh, um, this uh, requires the knowledge of the kinetic rate coefficients of uh, thousands of reactions. But fortunately, it turns out that by looking at the elementary reaction uh, step level, uh, you very quickly realize that uh, you can describe this full chemistry by identifying a, a limited number of elementary reaction families. Um, for example, like on the bottom of this slide, uh, beta carbon carbon scission. Uh, and hence, you can uh, um, limit the up initial calculations of the elementary step kinetics to uh, an up initial calculation of heads of reaction family. And uh, once you have identified these elementary reaction families, uh, you can uh, translate these, uh, this identification into chemical rules, and you can translate these chemical rules into algorithms which allow to generate uh, uh, fully automatically. Uh, the full reaction network. And of course, in order to do so in an efficient way, uh, you have to take uh, advantage of uh, um, um, all the uh, um, uh, commercially or freely available software packages combining the know-how uh, in the field of computer sciences, chemistry and, and mathematics and uh, allowing advanced species representation and very importantly, unique species representation. Um, which can be even three-dimensional and even take into account of, of chirality, and which is based in, princi in principle on substructure and matching. And then computational fluid dynamics is, of course, a, a, a booming field. 
uh, with the toolkits which are more and more uh, user friendly and available for, for everybody. Uh, um, you can, of course, uh, do this in a rather rough way, which corresponds to Reynolds uh, average Navier Stokes uh, uh, modeling. Uh, you can do it a little bit more sophisticated by so called large eddy simulation uh, 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 modeling. Um, uh, and the, the most uh, sophisticated one is a direct numeral, numerical simulation. Uh, for reactive flows, uh, um, um, runs are, are very often used, and more and more also large eddy simulations. And as you can see on this, uh, this slide here on the, on the bottom, the more expensive your uh, CFD technique, the more detailed you can uh, simulate uh, reactive flows. And then this combination of elementary reaction kinetics uh, on one hand and the uh, sophisticated computational Fourier dynamics allows you to uh, come up with a computer aided reactor design. Uh, shown here are uh, um, two examples on the left. Uh, uh, this is uh, the inside of a, of a, of a, a, a cylindrical uh, tube um, with inserts. So there is there a, a, a rep uh, um, um, added to the internal surface of the, uh, the, 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 the reactor wall uh, in a discontinuous way uh, and creating uh, um, um, uh, eddies which are uh, in, be beneficial for heat uh, and eventually for mass transfer. But as we will see later, detrimental uh, uh, when it concerns a pressure drop. On the right, you see a so-called vortex reactor, uh, um, um, which is um, um, uh, um, a type of reactor that we have been investigating uh, in the last decade at Ghent University, and uh, which uh, um, um, uh, consists of a, uh, um, uh, a rotating bed uh, uh, of a gas uh, of either um, biomass or catalyst pellets. Uh, these uh, pellets or this powder is brought into a rotating movement by feeding a tangentially uh, gas to this uh, bed. Um, and uh, the, the, this leads to a, a centrifugal force, uh, um, which is maintaining the fluid as bed uh, inside the uh, reactor, uh, um, uh, despite the very high uh, 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 gas slip velocities. Um, and uh, this uh, very high gas slip velocity uh, allows a very good, uh, very intensified gas solid heat and mass transfer. Uh, on, to on top of that, the uh, fluid bed character of the rotating bed uh, um, leads to a high effective thermal conductivity of the rotating bed, uh, which has uh, offers a lot of uh, advantages with respect to heat management. Uh, there too, uh, of course, the combination of uh, modeling and numerical uh, uh, simulations with uh, uh, experimental data is very important. Uh, what is shown here, and I would have liked to be able to show you the, uh, the, the rotating uh, pine wood uh, uh, pellet there on the left. Uh, we, uh, we, we combine this uh, in a cold flow experiment with the particle image velocity, uh, velocimetry uh, uh, um, determination. Uh, leading to, uh, as a function of the distance from the reactor wall to the central exit, uh, to experimental values for the uh, tangential or the azimuthal uh, velocity. Uh, and uh, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the left of this slide is shown a uh, um, CFD uh, model uh, calculations um, uh, of this azimuthal particle velocity. Uh, this is, uh, of course, only a piece of the, of the circle. And uh, um, a, uh, what is shown on the right uh, is a simulated on one hand and an experimental uh, field of the RC mutual particle velocity. And as you can see, uh, uh, the models that we have been employ uh, employed for this uh, validation indeed uh, allow uh, a good correspondence between simulated uh, velocities and the experimental velocities. So having, having gone through the challenges on one side and uh, the opportunities and the, the available toolkits, uh, tools for chemical reaction engineers, uh, and I will now try to, uh, to show um, uh, how we apply this to uh, um, 
the conversion of uh, raw materials to useful products. And I will start with the, uh, uh, the conversion of bioalcohols. Um, uh, and on this slide, uh, um, um, by means of uh, biobutanol. Uh, so biobutanol uh, can be obtained by uh, uh, um, uh, biotechnology uh, techniques uh, in, uh, from um, biomass uh, in general and the waste uh, in particular. Uh, and then uh, it's up to us chemical uh, reaction engineers to convert this biobutanol into uh, uh, butenes. Um, um, and uh, of course, uh, in order to do that in an efficient way, we have to understand in detail the, uh, the chemistry and the catalysis of this dehydration of uh, biobutanol to, to butenes. Um, this uh, slide shows you the, the, diff the different parts that uh, are possible and that do occur uh, in this uh, conversion of butanol to butenes. Uh, I will uh, make it simple to focus only on part A, uh, the conversion of one butanol to uh, one butene. Uh, and I will show you results of uh, um, uh, apinitio uh, uh, calculations. Um, the, um, what is shown here for part A alone are the different elementary steps uh, and uh, uh, highlighted uh, uh, on the right, a, a transition state for one of these elementary steps. Uh, and we have been doing this calculation for all these elementary steps. Um, and we have obtained, uh, hence, uh, corresponding uh, Arrhenius parameters allowing to, to, uh, um, to uh, understand the effect of the catalysis of the zeolite type on one hand and the effect of process conditions on the conversion of uh, one butanol to uh, one butene. Uh, we have done a similar exercise for uh, bioethanol. Uh, and uh, um, we have been able to uh, compare our up initial micro determined microkinetic model uh, with uh, data uh, uh, provided by uh, uh, industry uh, in the form of a, a US, uh, USA uh, patent, um, uh, where are reported data on a, a unit producing 220,000 uh, tons of ethylene per year uh, in uh, two uh, uh, adiabatic reactors. Uh, and with the uh, heating in, uh, in between the two adiabatic reactors. And uh, um, what is shown here are the calculated, the up initial calculated uh, uh, ethanol uh, conversion, ethylene yield, and uh, the temperature uh, throughout the two beds, uh, uh, and also uh, by ways of symbols, the reported uh, yields and the uh, uh, conversions and temperature. So, and this without adapting any any kinetic or thermodynamic parameter to uh, the uh, uh, reported uh, experimental uh, data. So, so the take home message uh, here is that indeed today we are capable of accounting for all the, uh, the scales uh, that are relevant uh, for a heterogeneously catalyzed uh, process from uh, the scale of the active site via the scale of the pores, of the crystallites, of the pellets, and of the of the of the of the reactor, um, and this should allow us to indeed uh, combine uh, uh, design of a catalyst with design optimal design of a of a reactor. The second uh, uh, example uh, of application is uh, related to uh, CO two as a raw material. Um, the uh, um, and this is. Uh, commonly uh, known today as carbon capture and utilization. Um, what is shown here is uh, on one hand on the top, the uh, um, um, uh, total amount of CO2 emit emitted by industry, so-called point emissions. Uh, um, uh, and on the other hand, uh, the uh, um, production of uh, biomethane by this anaerobic fermentation or organic waste I have been referring to in the beginning of, uh, of my talk. And uh, um, uh, if you uh, manage to uh, uh, um, produce out of these two streams CO, uh, you can combine it with hydrogen, uh, preferably, of course, green hydrogen, uh, to indeed uh, produce uh, the full spectrum of molecules that we are uh, using uh, today. Um, and, and I will focus on this uh, so-called super dry reforming process that indeed is uh, um, converting uh, three molecules uh, with uh, uh, one methane molecule 
to four CO molecules and two water molecules. And this in contrast to a dry reforming, uh, which is uh, only converting one CO2 molecule per methane uh, molecule. And uh, um, the trick here is that uh, we have, uh, um, by in the process that we call super dry reforming, uh, um, avoided the water gas shift uh, reaction. How does the super dry reforming process operate? Well, it is a cyclic process. It consists of two steps. Uh, in the first step, uh, we uh, um, bring into contact uh, um, uh, methane and uh, uh, CO2 uh, via nickel, uh, which uh, converts it into CO and hydrogen uh, with iron oxide. Uh, and this CO and hydrogen is reducing the iron oxide into uh, uh, iron while producing water on one hand and the CO2 molecules on the other hand. But the CO2 molecules on the other hand, in black there on top of the, the, the square shown, uh, these, these two uh, CO molecules together with the supplementary two green CO2 molecules on the right hand side are, uh, as they are fit or as they are formed, immediately absorbed on calcium oxide, which is also present in the reactor and uh, transform the calcium oxide into calcium carbonate. And as soon as uh, you, uh, you uh, are afraid of having breakthrough of, uh, of uh, uh, CO2, you uh, um, um, start, you switch from step one conditions to step two conditions. Uh, you start um, uh, but maintaining the same temperature. You start then uh, the blue step, which is uh, converting the calcium carbonate back to calcium oxide, liberating CO2 molecules, which are, have a sufficient oxidating power to reoxidize whatever iron that has been uh, formed during the reduction of the iron oxide into iron oxide. Hence, in this uh, uh, process, we close the two loops, the redox loop of iron and the carbonation decarbonation loop of, uh, of, of calcium, uh, while producing uh, in the first step, uh, uh, water, and in the second step, CO molecules. Uh, this uh, means that uh, you, uh, you, you can, you, uh, this is a dynamic process in principle, uh, uh, but uh, uh, by putting uh, um, the same materials, not in one reactor, but in eight reactors in parallel, and uh, operating each of these eight reactors in uh, such a way that they are in different stages of the uh, cycle, uh, you obtain time uh, average wise a steady stream of uh, set water, pure water on one hand, and a steady stream of pure CO uh, on the other hand. And this is really uh, today called uh, chemical looping, uh, um, um, but it is one, only one example of uh, a transient operation uh, uh, of, a, of, a, of a fixed bed reactor, uh, like uh, for example, the reverse flow reactor uh, advocated by Matros, the first awardee of this uh, plenary type of lecture. Um, I will go on with uh, methane as a raw material. Uh, methane, which uh, obviously today is typically a, a natural gas a fossil, uh, but it can also be more and more the biomethane I was mentioning uh, before. Um, and I will uh, briefly uh, take the opportunity of uh, discussing oxidative coupling of methane to uh, C2 products, preferably, of course, ethylene, uh, uh, to introduce the concept of uh, uh, catalyst descriptor. Um, um, there are three types of challenges for oxidative coupling of, uh, of methane. Uh, um, there is the uh, heat management issue, because it's an overall very exothermic reaction. Uh, uh, there is the selectivity issue, uh, because, of course, you uh, form CO and CO2 uh, as a side product. Uh, and uh, there is the uh, um, fact that methane is very inert, so that uh, you need high temperatures to activate methane molecules. And these temperatures are so high that uh, um, uh, you uh, cannot neglect gas phase reactions. Even in the presence of catalyst, you, uh, you better account for uh, gas phase reactions. What are shown here are uh, um, all the possible gas phase reactions when you uh, uh, combine uh, methane and oxygen at the temperatures, let's say, at uh, uh, 700, 800 de degrees C. Uh, uh, um, the red ones, those with the red label, are um, desired ones, if you want, uh, and in particular, the coupling of metal radicals. Yeah? 
Um, and it turns out that uh, this uh, um, mythical radical coupling is indeed the, the, the desired reaction that uh, um, you want to favor by uh, um, adding to the gas phase also a catalyst. Uh, the main function of the catalyst being indeed, and that's the very first reaction on the left of this slide, the main function of the catalyst being indeed the, the, the generation of middle, middle radicals, which then subsequently combine in, in the gas phase to C2 products. Um, what is shown here are, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, different uh, elementary steps. Um, um, those in red are uh, desired steps. So the catalyst uh, is uh, having functions there, which are uh, um, um, uh, uh, favorable for uh, high conversion and high yield of C2 products. But uh, typical catalysts also have uh, uh, um, undesired effects, uh, which are corresponding to the elementary steps that are highlighted here in, uh, in black. Um, uh, highlighted with the uh, arrows, uh, um, uh, the big arrows, are the kinetically significant steps on a particular type of catalyst, uh, tin, uh, lithium, uh, magnesium oxide. Um, for the, I want also to stress the, the concept of elementary reaction families. So there is plenty of elementary steps here, but there is only a limited number of elementary reaction families uh, that are involved. And hence, you need to, to, to determine only uh, the values of uh, rate coefficients of a limited number of uh, uh, elementary reaction families. Uh, and you can, you can uh, um, um, uh, uh, do this type of microkinetic modeling uh, for different types of uh, catalysts. Uh, uh, and as you can see, uh, you can adequately describe the conversion of methanes, uh, oxygen, and uh, the formation of a C product, C2 products on a broad range of, of, of catalysts. Uh, and this is important, uh, this uh, without changing all the kinetic parameters in the microkinetic model. Because we do distinguish in the microkinetic models that we have developed for oxidative coupling of methane and that we have developed in general to other, applied in, to other uh, types of reactions too. We distinguish, and others, of course, have done this too. We distinguish between uh, so-called kinetic descriptors, which are more or less independent of the catalyst, and catalyst descriptors, which are the values of which are very strongly determined by, by the uh, catalyst, and which, of course, then do uh, determine the catalyst performance. Um, uh, here are the four most important uh, catalyst descriptors. It's the the reaction enthalpy of a hydrogen uh, abstraction from methane, so the methane activation and the formation of metal radicals, the chemisorption heat of oxygen, uh, the sticking probability, and that's a black one, so that's something you want to be as low as possible. Yeah, yeah. the sticking probability of metal radicals on the catalyst surface, basically, and then an obvious one, the uh, total concentration of uh, uh, active uh, sites. Um, and uh, depending on the values of these catalyst descriptors, uh, you end up with the uh, active catalyst, uh, the green one, uh, uh, less active catalyst, the blue one, the lithium magnesium oxide, and then highly selective uh, catalyst, uh, the, the red one, the, 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 the sodium, manganese, uh, tungsten, uh, silica uh, catalyst. And by playing of these uh, values of the catalyst descriptors, you can at least in theory come up with an optimal catalyst formulation. Uh, um, uh, which corresponds to optimized values of the catalyst descriptors, uh, which are uh, an example of which uh, is shown on the uh, on the bottom left of this uh, slide, where you have shown uh, where they are shown uh, on the on the z, z axis the yield for C two products as a function of two of these four catalyst descriptors, the oxygen chemisorption uh, enthalpy and the enthalpy for the hydrogen abstraction from uh, methane. And you can see that there are clearly distinguished uh, peaks uh, which give uh, much uh, higher yields than, uh, than those obtained with, uh, with high other values, non-optimized values of the catalyst descriptors. So the take home message here is that uh, the microkinetic models that uh, um, um, you develop uh, 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 can be used to come to a model-guided uh, catalyst design. 
The, the next uh, uh, raw material I will discuss, and that's of course very important in the concept of plastic waste, are the, uh, um, is the, in the context of circular economy rather, is plastic waste. Um, um, and this is uh, the loop four of uh, the five loops that I have been showing in the very beginning of, of, of my talk. Um, what you see here is uh, uh, you start from the top left with plastic waste, and then uh, you end up with, uh, with uh, um, uh, products. Uh, one of the products being uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, NAFTA loop oil wax uh, uh, on the right of this, of this uh, um, slide. Um, this uh, uh, NAFTA loop oil wax uh, um, can be analyzed with uh, GC uh, and GC uh, 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 um, techniques uh, as discussed uh, in the beginning of my talk. Uh, and the light green uh, uh, part of this uh, um, fraction is, uh, um, is the one that uh, um, is most interesting uh, as a possible source for uh, the production of uh, uh, light olefins. Um, the, the, the orange one on the, the bottom right uh, is, uh, is uh, um, 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 causing problems uh, um, and uh, can eventually lead to coke formation. Well, uh, is this reasonable? Uh, well, in order to uh, to uh, um, to evaluate this, uh, we have been in order to evaluate whether we can add plastics um, next to the uh, classical feedstocks uh, shown on the left of the slide to a steam cracker for the production of uh, the products that are shown on the right of, of this slide. Uh, um, uh, well, we have uh, been performing experiments in the uh, pilot plant that is uh, available at the uh, Ghent uh, University. Huh? And uh, it is a, a gas fired uh, pilot plant uh, um, with a, a very sophisticated uh, online uh, analysis uh, section. We have a very long history, which, uh, which started with uh, uh, one of the other uh, awardees of this. Uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, Slinko uh, lecture, uh, Gilbert Froman, uh, uh, in the 70s, uh, and uh, has been evolving uh, since uh, um, by improving continuously the pilot plant uh, 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 and uh, correspondingly improving the microkinetics models. Microkinetic models, which urgently have been led, have led to the, uh, 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 the commercialization of computer codes uh, with a graphical user interface, which is very uh, user friendly and which is today or since 2015 commercialized by a, a spin-off company, Avgi of Ghent University. And indeed, uh, uh, th th these are the, this is a summary of the test in this pilot plant, where you see that uh, indeed with plastic waste feed, you can obtain very reasonable yields of the desired uh, olefins. Uh, but note on the bottom that you do make more coke uh, with that uh, feed than with the uh, the fossil uh, NAFTA feed. And this brings me to uh, uh, the uh, uh, energy issue. Uh, and uh, uh, discussing the energy issue, the energy challenge, uh, um, uh, I will, I will uh, do that by discussing steam cracking. Um, steam cracking is a, um, indeed uh, a very e energy consuming process. Uh, you need temperatures uh, uh, um, which are higher than, uh, way higher than 800 degrees C. Uh, um, the uh, reaction is on top of that uh, very uh, endothermic. Uh, uh, so you need, in order to reach these temperatures and maintain them, you need to suspend the reactor coils uh, in a uh, gas-fired uh, firebox, shown on the bottom left of this uh, slide. Uh, the scale is huge, uh, as you can see on the right of this, of this uh, uh, slide, uh, um, and also in terms of energy consumption. Uh, you, uh, um, one million ton uh, ethylene pr producing plant uh, consumes, roughly speaking, one gigajoule uh, in uh, energy. 80% uh, uh, of it uh, in the form of uh, combustion of uh, uh, fuel uh, to fire your uh, um, uh, your firebox. Uh, and these are uh, the results, what I show here are the results of uh, uh, computational free dynamic simulations, uh, uh, accounting for the combustion chemistry, of course, uh, uh, on the firebox side of the, of the furnace. Uh, um, on, the, on the bottom, you see there 
uh, one uh, of the uh, on the, the bottom placed uh, um, burners. Uh, this uh, bottom placed burner is, uh, of course, uh, um, feed fed by uh, fuel in in the middle of the the green circle. Uh, primary air is fed um, uh, at the at, at at the position of the green circle, and so-called secondary air is fed uh, via the red circles. Um, uh, so you, uh, um, you, you, you realize that this is a very uh, multi-scale type of, uh, of modeling exercise, uh, um, going from uh, the chemistry of the combustion uh, to that of the secondary air inlets, uh, to that of the whole uh, firebox. Uh, and uh, on the left uh, is shown a snapshot of the flames uh, via the so-called flames, because what is shown there is the temperature field, of course. Eh? Yeah. Um, and uh, the effect of the ratio of primary to secondary air on the, the, the temperature field um, uh, of the gas on one hand on the left side. And then on the right, bot right, right top, uh, you see the uh, uh, two metal temperature, the, 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 the temperature of the external uh, skin of the uh, uh, coil. Uh, and you see that uh, depending on uh, the ratio of primary to secondary air, uh, you, you have a higher or a lower uh, temperature of this uh, uh, tube skin. And this, of course, affects the, also the temperature of the inside uh, of the reactor tube. Uh, um, um, what you see here is uh, 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 on the left uh, a picture of the coke, uh, in the, which is formed. Uh, uh, and which, of course, is the result of the high temperature at the inside of the of the tube. And uh, uh, this uh, fog formation is, uh, of course, uh, very annoying uh, because it uh, leads to an increase in the trans in the resistance against heat transfer from uh, the furnace side to the uh, process gas side. Uh, um, it also needs leads to higher pressure drops, uh, uh, and it can even eventually via carburization lead to uh, a breakage of, of, the, of the coils. There is different ways to uh, to uh, um, minimize this coke formation. Uh, I will focus on uh, uh, the geometry uh, of the uh, uh, tube uh, at the, the inside of the uh, uh, coils. Uh, you have different possibilities there shown on the right side of the. Of the Slide. Um, I will. I will and, uh, in the middle of this slide, you see rips which are discontinuous, huh? and uh, um, that's what I will focus on in, in what follows. Um, you see here two uh, 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 pieces of uh, of rep, uh, um, um, uh, which on, on one hand you see the uh, uh, simulation of the uh, flow field. Uh, um, 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 and then on the right, uh, you see simulation of the heat transfer coefficient uh, um, uh, here represented by the uh, uh, Nusselt number. Um, and um, um, you see that uh, there is a drastic uh, effect of the presence of this of these uh, um, rips, this continuous rips on the heat transfer resistance uh, uh, from um, gas. Uh, um, uh, furnace site to uh, process gas site. Uh, this is calculated with the uh, uh, CFD, uh, but uh, before uh, trusting that kind of uh, calculations, we want to validate our CFD models. Uh, uh, and uh, um, we have done this uh, both uh, um, related to the simulation of the flow feed and uh, related to the heat transfer. Uh, um, and we have done this uh, in uh, collaboration with the von Karman Institute for Fluid Dynamics uh, in uh, Brussels. Um, uh, what, are shown, what is shown here on this slide is the result of uh, measurements performed at, the, uh, performed at the von Karman Institute by means of uh, liquid crystal thermography, which allows you to uh, measure uh, by visual inspection uh, the uh, temperature of the uh, uh, tube skin uh, and uh, infer from there uh, values for the heat transfer coefficient. Uh, and uh, it's uh, these values of the heat transfer coefficient in the form of a Nusselt number, which is shown on this slide. And uh, this Nusselt number is related, of course, to the Nusselt number corresponding to a bare tube uh, that is uh, a classical uh, tube without any 3D aspects. Uh, and, and you see that uh, indeed we have a very good correspondence 
between the experimental uh, uh, nusselt uh, number field, heat transfer coefficient field on one hand, and the numerical uh, uh, heat transfer uh, coefficient uh, field. Um, these kind of modifications are, are modifications which consist of uh, adding an obstacle to the uh, to the inner side of the of the reactor wall. You could also be inspired by by golf uh, and uh, um, uh, by the dimples. Uh, uh, so it's an it's an indentation rather than an, an, an obtrusion that uh, you could consider in your wall, and uh, that's what we have done too. And uh, what is shown on the on the right part of this slide is the uh, a comparison in both between the simply ribbed that's what we have been discussing till now on one hand and a dimpled uh, 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 tube on the other hand uh, and and you see that indeed the uh, um, uh, because of the, uh, the the improvement of the of the heat transfer uh, because by the the ribs and by the dimples you have compared to a, a bare tube uh, a, a decrease uh, of 53 for the reps and of 45 degrees Kelvin for, for, for the dimples of the uh, inside tube uh, temperature. Um, so that's the good news. Huh? Uh, and of course, the good news is the corresponding decrease in the rate of coke formation, 50% uh, for the reps and 39% uh, for, the, for the dimples. Um, the, uh, um, um, uh, if you would only look at, uh, at the, these figures, uh, you would go for the reps. But when you look at the pressure drop uh, uh, differences between the bare group on one hand and the reps and the dimples on the other hand, you see that uh, you have a penalty uh, uh, for the reps, which is much more pronounced than the penalty for the dimples. And that's why we, we advocate uh, uh, and we have patented together with BISF uh, uh, the idea of uh, dimples uh, in the uh, uh, tubes. And uh, these dimples are shown uh, again on the on the left of this slide. Uh, and we have been playing with the, uh, um, uh, the, of course, the configuration of the of the dimples with respect to each other on one hand. But not only uh, that, we have also been playing with the shape of the of the dimples uh, and, uh, on the Bottom left are shown different possible shapes uh, uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, via a um, 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 mathematical description of this shape uh, with the, by using so-called Bezier curves uh, uh, and using a, a Dakota available software, which is based on an optimization of an objective function uh, via a genetic uh, uh, algorithm. We have come to a hard shape uh, uh, as an optimal shape uh, for the uh, performance of the uh, reactor coils during steam cracking. Um, and uh, um, there again, of course, we have been during this optimization, we have been confronted with a, uh, um, um, uh, a Pareto front. Uh, um, that is um, uh, the good news uh, uh, of the effect of the dimples is that the nusselt number is increasing. The bad news is that the, the pressure drop is increasing compared to a bare tube. Uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, you cannot uh, um, increase the uh, nusselt number uh, at one point uh, without uh, also increasing the pressure drop. Uh, and uh, that's the so-called Pareto front, uh, which corresponds to the red lines uh, um, in this uh, slide. And uh, uh, the color code actually corresponds to the generation number. We have been optimizing the shape of the of the of the dimples, starting from uh, from spheres and ending up by a heart over more than thousand generations of uh, of uh, values for the Bezier curve uh, parameters. And then finally, we have been uh, uh, um, simulating a millisecond, an initial millisecond propane cracker for the uh, production of, uh, of ethylene, uh, propylene in particular here, of course. And uh, um, uh, you see that uh, indeed, uh, um, when you look at the temperature field on one hand, uh, uh, and on the right side, uh, the rate of coke formation, uh, that uh, there, there is uh, clearly uh, um, um, an effect of these uh, hard shapes uh, on the uh, corresponding uh, fields. Uh, 
uh, when you do the calculation uh, um, of the uh, savings uh, because of these heart-shaped dimples compared to bare troop, we arrive at uh, a 4% CO2 emission reduction uh, um, for uh, such a millisecond propane uh, cracker. Um, for a very mature technology like steam cracking, that's a lot. But when you put that into the perspective of the uh, uh, climate change, and some people call it climate crisis, and into the perspective uh, of uh, the targets set by the European Commission, for example, uh, and for example, the Fit for 55 uh, uh, plans of the, of the Commission, uh, this is uh, not way, way beyond what we really need for uh, um, in terms of CO2 reduction. Uh, and of course, uh, DIMPLUS is one thing, and I'm sure that uh, by, by uh, implementing other changes to the existing steam cracker process, you can for sure uh, on a time scale of, uh, let's say five years, five to 10 years, reach a 20% reduction of the CO2 per ton of, of uh, ethylene produced. Uh, but the question is, can you go beyond uh, with this uh, uh, type of technology? Uh, and is there uh, uh, an alternative future for uh, steam cracking? Um, so could it be the electrification of uh, steam cracking? Um, um, and uh, we have at the very beginning of my talk, I've been, I've been uh, uh, mentioning um, uh, JOLA heating, resistive heating, uh, as a, um, uh, for example, uh, published in the paper, science paper of people from Halder Toxo and uh, the group of uh, the TU. Uh, uh, um, Technical University of Denmark, uh, um, of Korkendorf, um, but um, there is of course also uh, and applied to uh, steam reforming in that case, but you could also apply this to uh, steam cracking, I could think of doing that. There is inductive heating, uh, there is microwave heating, uh, and uh, um, um, a basic difference between uh, this microwave heating uh, and eventually even uh, uh, depends how you implement it, inductive heating, is that um, in contrast to uh, um, the, the heat transfer mechanism we have been uh, discussing till now for steam cracking, uh, microwave heating does not uh, is a bulk phenomenon. It, it, is, it does not require transfer via an interface. Okay? Uh, and it is indeed this interface, uh, interfacial uh, heat transfer, which indeed was uh, causing this Pareto front, uh, that. Uh, this dilemma, which uh, consisted of saying that you could not improve the heat transfer without getting more pressure through. With microwave heating, where you don't need uh, 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 interfacial uh, transfer of uh, energy of heat, uh, you do not have this dilemma. And the same holds for, uh, and this is also an, an, an electric type of uh, uh, technique, is uh, the so-called rotodynamic reactor technique uh, uh, advocated by the company Coolbrook. Um, which is uh, uh, an artist impression of which is shown on, on this slide. Um, it, it's starting from uh, electric power, which is uh, rotating a shaft. And on the shaft uh, uh, is uh, fixed a so-called rotor uh, in the middle of three uh, um, um, uh, uh, cascades of veins. Uh, the first one is a, is a static one. The third one is also a static one. And the middle one is the rotor one. And uh, uh, by the, the dimensions and the geometry of the, the static uh, veins and of the rotating veins, the, uh, um, um, the uh, gas which is entering the, uh, the reactor uh, uh, and transformed from inlet to outlet port via a veinless space is heated up on a very short uh, time, time scale uh, uh, by uh, um, converting the kinetic energy that the gas gets uh, via the rotor not in contrast to what's happening in a compressor, not into pressure, but into heat. Uh, and uh, um, Coolbrook is uh, indeed claiming uh, that uh, on a time scale of 10 milliseconds, uh, um, the uh, temperatures needed for uh, steam cracking uh, can be uh, uh, reached via a, a, a mechanism that does not require interfacial heat transfer by bulk heating of the gas phase by having uh, kinetic energy of the gas phase converted into uh, heat via dissipation of this kinetic energy. This brings me to the conclusions uh, and perspectives uh, of, of my talk. And there will be very, very, very high level type of conclusions. Huh? Uh, um, I hope I, uh, I have convinced you that uh, by combining theory and experiment, 
we really can come up with uh, with the design uh, and uh, of uh, new catalysts, new processes, uh, which we will which we will really need indeed if you want to tackle the challenge of our uh, period. Um, and uh, um, uh, if you want to put the timeline uh, on the solution to these challenges, well, it is uh, on the bottom of this uh, of this uh, slide here, uh, uh, and it uh, will consist of a transition from uh, hot flames to green electrons uh, on one hand, and it will uh, consist of uh, substituting fossil uh, raw materials by renewable uh, sources of energy and of materials, uh, uh, including in a transition period also uh, uh, methane. Um, and and uh, um, we are all of us are working on, on, uh, on this, uh, and what I want to uh, mention in particular, uh, Synergy, which is a consortium of, uh, of uh, um, uh, companies uh, and the academic groups um, um, uh, working today, uh, this, this very moment, uh, um, to apply for a uh, so-called coordination and support action uh, uh, with a deadline at the end of this month uh, to indeed uh, contribute as a community to this type of uh, scenario. At the very end, of course, I want to acknowledgement, uh, acknowledge my, 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 uh, all the people that who have been uh, helping uh, uh, to come to all the results I've been showing, uh, the LCT faculty and, and visitors, uh, for sure. Uh, the people working at the spin-off company I briefly mentioned, uh, uh, postdocs uh, at the Laboratory for Chemical Technology. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, I want to take the opportunity to also mention uh, a book that I have been uh, co-authoring with uh, Gregory Jablonski, you all know, and uh, Denis Kostales, a mathematician uh, we are closely collaborating with. Uh, and uh, having said that, I want to thank you for your kind uh, attention. Thank you very much, Guy. That was really a pleasure to listen to you. So a round of applause, uh, even if we cannot probably hear this uh, applause from the audience. I think it was an excellent uh, example uh, of uh, the top level uh, chemical reaction and reactor engineering and very much uh, in line with the spirit of the work which was uh, uh, done by Professor Slinko. So experiments, theory, and then design. So we are really grateful for uh, this lecture. Do you want to add up your something? Thank you very much, Guy. You nicely illustrated how to go beyond the classical reaction engineering on one hand to EFT calculations, then to CFD and to process intensification. In one sense, we can be happy that we go from linear economy to circular economy, because that puts not only new challenges, but for new opportunities to our science, which I think is flourishing nowadays, because uh, uh, not only the theoretical inventions, but the practical needs and the societal demand is so great. Thank you very much, Guy. Thank you. Uh, and then we can move probably to the uh, second plenary lecture. Can we get the slides? Who is now taking care of the slides? Professor Zagoruka hopefully can help us. Uh, maybe, uh, Guy, possibly you have to uh, stop your presentations. There is some in the upper part of the screen. Yeah. Well, give it a try, but I think the most easy thing is that I leave you. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's also an option. That's, that's, a, that's a, the most drastic option I would take. <laughs> well, possibly uh, it's resolved, huh? Okay, one moment. In the upper part of the screen, Uh, but we need to go to mm -hmm. the next present anyway. Yes, just a minute. I will contact Tatiana.
30 years plus experience in the field of uh, uh, chemistry, refinery, oil and gas and, and energy industrial sectors. He graduated uh, from industrial chemistry in Venice and then started his industrial career in 91 uh, with uh, ENI corporate research and development. Uh, he has several uh, or served several projects in Africa related to uh, LNG, floating LNG, gas to liquids, fish trucks, methanol, gas to power, ammonia, etc. And today we will hear the plenary lecture devoted to process technology for energy transition. And that will be about production of hydrogen and CO2 capture, storage, and utilization. Dr. Zanaro, the floor is yours, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your uh, kind introduction. Uh, and the special thanks to the, the conference organizing committee. It is really uh, an honor for me to, to have been invited to this prestigious event. Uh, first, to, to start, I would like to know if uh, you you see my, my screen? Yes, it's perfect now. Yeah, that's yeah, we, we can see. Please go ahead. That's fine. That's fine. So uh, uh, let me let me start in uh, uh, along this lecture. I, I would like to give you uh, an overview on the use of hydrogen as a key driver for the energy transition towards the, the replacement of the fossil energy fuel. Quite a tough argument in this uh, in this period. At this scope, I will briefly describe the the result of the most recent scenarios with a focus on the European strategy for the green and blue hydrogen. Uh, uh, and then I we will see the status of the low carbon and green hydrogen production technologies and the technological trends for its uh, storage and and delivery. I will then uh, close my presentation with. Uh, an overview of some of the activities that my company, uh, an energy company, ENI, uh, is, uh, is uh, carried out, is carrying out projects and technologies necessary to the achievement of the challenging decarbonization targets that ENI and we all have uh, in, uh, in 2050. Uh, so the, the first world production picture as uh, as usual, concerning the, 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 the pure hydrogen, according to IEA and the rest of the energy, in 2019, there were about 74, 75 million tons, almost entirely used as a chemical uh, raw material for industrial uses, and only a marginal share was used as an energy source for the so-called art to abate industrial sector. Uh, another 45 million tons that are not included in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, figure here, uh, was the hydrogen produced as single gas component for specific application, like, uh, for instance, methanol synthesis. Uh, the hydrogen production, as you see, uh, 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 is entirely supplied today by fossil fuel, natural gas, with uh, around 6% of the world natural gas consumption, and uh, coal, uh, with about 2%. Uh, percent of the, the world consumption. And this uh, is uh, the cause of about 830 million tons per year of CO2 emission. Uh, first of all, I would like just to share uh, very briefly what uh, has become the new hydrogen color code, which indeed, uh, as we all know, is a colorless gas. So obviously, the need uh, was dictated by the, 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 the ease of identifying with a simple color a specific hydrogen production chain. Uh, and, and this certainly helps the communication, especially in non-technical sector. During the presentation, uh, we will see essentially the blue-green hydrogen passing through to the turquoise hydrogen, which means uh, the, the methane uh, pyrolysis uh, system just as uh, one of the new way considered. Uh, going back uh, as uh, for the hydrogen expansion figure, in the last year, the analysts produced dozens of scenarios with different trends 
based on the different global warming uh, degree limit considered. In the top right graph, uh, there is an elaboration, an, uh, an internal, an ENI elaboration, which sum up the 2050 global proje projection of the hydrogen share in the energy consumption coming from uh, uh, the main agency and the consulting group. There are, uh, uh, in all these uh, analyses, uh, uh, three scenarios, uh, the base reference scenario, the two degree C scenario, and the most challenging 1.5 scenario. And uh, uh, let me see if I can uh, activate uh, the, sorry, yeah. okay. Okay, so uh, as you see the, the, the largest difference or uncertainty, if you like, is in the final, uh, in the final projection at 250, especially for the most challenging scenario, the gap is six to 17% of energy or uh, hydrogen share in the, in the gross energy consumption. According to the IEA net zero emission scenario, uh, very famous in, uh, in this period, uh, the global hydrogen use will expand more or less uh, to uh, 80 million tons in 2020 to more than 200 million tons in 2030. So in, in 10 years, there is a, a, a step increase. It is interesting also to observe that uh, the percent of low carbon and green hydrogen versus uh, 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 the, the, the green hydrogen is uh, uh, increasing considerably from 10% in 2020, 7% uh, in 2030, up to 98% uh, uh, in 2050, and with gray hydrogen production almost, uh, 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 almost absent, uh, uh, almost disappear. Uh, now let's uh, have a look uh, at the situation uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, for uh, uh, the recent uh, uh, Fit for 55 update package uh, that the uh, EU uh, Green Deal uh, uh, applied, the, which increases uh, at minus 55% the emission reduction in 2030, uh, has accelerated the national and European policymakers to develop the decarbonization framework. It is well known uh, that the, 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 the uh, uh, hydrogen is an integral part uh, for the European Green Deal strategy uh, to reach the carbon neutrality. Uh, the so-called EU hydrogen strategy uh, 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 is uh, more specifically based on uh, a, a phase low carbon hydrogen penetration plan. As you, as you see, it's phased in uh, three main, uh, let's say, periods. Uh, by 2024, with the installation of at least six gigawatt of water electrolysis to produce one million tons of renewable hydrogen. By 2030, 40 gigawatt uh, of renewable hydrogen electrolysis are foreseen to reach uh, in, in 2050 all r 2 based sector uh, with something like 500 gigawatts of uh, electrolysis, electrolysis capacity and the diffusion of the renewable hydrogen technology on a large scale. This plan, uh, as you see, is uh, supported in 25 years by a sustainable financial mechanism uh, for uh, uh, several, uh, several billion euros, especially for the, the green hydrogen. And the uh, European uh, Clean Hydrogen uh, Alliance, uh, uh, which is a collaboration between public authorities, industry, and civil societies, as the task of developing a, a, an investment agenda and a pipeline of uh, concrete, concrete projects. Um, ENI has uh, recently joined the Hydrogen Europe Association, 
and also the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance, and was uh, one of the 17 partners uh, from the energy sector who, who funded the, the, the Hydrogen for Europe study that is available on, uh, on the website. This study uh, was prepared for the sole scope of assessing the contribution of low carbon and renewable hydrogen uh, to the European energy transition. And they considered two interesting scenarios or pathways. Uh, the technology diversification pathway that uh, is based on uh, first uh, already approved national targets uh, and very important no obstacles uh, to the development of different technologies, especially the, the low carbon uh, technologies, the blue hydrogen, just to be more, uh, more precise, uh, uh, and uh, a perfect match uh, between uh, the market request uh, and the investment decision to be taken. Different, the renewal, renewable push, uh, push uh, pathway uh, prioritize the deployment of uh, the renewable energy technology, wind, solar, water split, uh, uh, through the increase of targets uh, on the share of renewable in the gross final energy consumption that probably are also beyond the, the current policy goal. The, the main messages from, from this study were, were, was uh, uh, Europe is, uh, is the area with the highest hydrogen growth prospect uh, to the respect of a global uh, situation, which consider um, more than 20% of share of hydrogen in the final energy consumption in 2050. The, the hydrogen produced from renewable energy source uh, has the highest priority, but the low carbon hydrogen production is not excluded, like uh, blue hydrogen, and in the scenario appears also the, the, the methane, methane pyrolysis. Uh, and uh, hydrogen base or not 100% renewable electricity, uh, which, uh, if you recall, uh, the, the color uh, the color code uh, is the purple and the yellow and the yellow hydrogen. All these form of uh, low carbon high hydrogen, according to the study, are needed in the short medium terms to reduce emission first uh, from the existing hydrocarbon production and complement the renewable hydrogen until. Uh, a sufficient green capacity is available to, to, to cover the future demand. Uh, just a, a couple of uh, information captured from, uh, from the study, the, 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 different, the very different assumption of this scenario um, highlights uh, the different hydrogen penetration rates. In the renewable push scenario, uh, 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 the, the, the green hydrogen in 20 years, uh, uh, in 2040, became the, the largest source of hydrogen with a step increase uh, up to 72% uh, in, uh, in, in 2050, which uh, could raise at 81% if we consider also, according to the scenario, the imported green, uh, green uh, hydrogen. Uh, while uh, in the technology diversification, uh, a more homogeneous uh, uh, in, in, or, or balanced uh, uh, growth of the renewable energy is, uh, is, is shown uh, uh, is, uh, with, uh, let's say, arriving in, in 2050 with a more or less, if you see, 50-50 balance from green hydrogen and the blue, the blue hydrogen. Uh, as shown uh, in, in the bottom right uh, uh, graph, uh, the two pathways uh, bring to a very different uh, uh, cumulative investment estimate. It is uh, 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 an estimate which includes all the, 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 the life chain of the technology applied uh, in this scenario. And, uh, 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 you see that, uh, especially the renewable push pathway, 
arrived in 2050 with the impressive uh, uh, cumulative investment of around 3 trillion, mostly linked to 100 and uh, sorry, 1,600 gigawatts of installed capacity for uh, electrolyzer. Also, offshore electrolyzer, uh, offshore wind is included in this uh, in this uh, uh, in, in this figure. Uh, going ahead, uh, let's now move uh, into the status uh, of the hydrogen production, transport, and storage technologies. Uh, 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 in this new energy transition contest. Uh, the traditional hydrogen production routes uh, are mainly based on thermochemical convention with the catalytic reforming, partial oxidation processes or gasification processes. The, the downstream presence uh, of a CO2 capture and sequestration process uh, process make the difference in the final Product valorization, of course, as uh, in the case of the the, the, the blue hydrogen uh, production. Uh, thermochemical process also include uh, methane pyrolysis uh, uh, or methane fracking. It is an endothermic process that produces solid carbon and uh, uh, gaseous hydrogen and hydrogen. Uh, the technological maturity of this technology covers all stages between an advanced R&D activity for the, the new, uh, especially uh, plasma application to commercial application. Indeed, uh, the latter relates uh, to plant address more to solid carbon production instead of hydrogen. For the green hydrogen, uh, there is no story. The electrolysis technology uh, with electricity coming from the carbonized uh, system, nuclear or renewable source uh, are uh, the, 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 the one to, to consider. Uh, moving ahead, just uh, uh, um, a focus uh, in the new, considering the new paradigm dictated by the energy system transition, the hydrogen production by natural gas reforming is the process uh, uh, mostly considered today. With a new interest from uh, licensor as well as scientific community in studying new way to increase uh, the plant efficiency, especially when they are integrated with carbon capture uh, uh, plant. We, we just heard about uh, 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 the, the possibility to consider as the electrification of steam cracking this is uh, for sure an area of, uh, of, uh, of interest. Uh, the standard technology for the steam methane reforming that is widely used uh, uh, to produce uh, high purity hydrogen in the refinery, the feedstock uh, range from natural gas, uh, of gas from refining processes, LPG, and also in some cases, liquid fuels like naphtha or kerosene. The typical fire tubular reformer is based on a radiation uh, section uh, uh, with specific catalytic uh, tube with different geometry depending on the, uh, uh, the technology provider and uh, a burner arrangement. And a second uh, uh, aside convective section for the important uh, part of the heat recovery. Methane steam reforming is an endothermic uh, reaction catalyzed by nickel supported catalysts at high, relatively high temperature uh, and low pressure. A typical uh, uh, feedstock flexible hydrogen plant include also a pre-reformer unit, a downstream water gas shift unit, and a PSA, a pressure swing absorption package for purifying, uh, for producing pure hydrogen. Concerning the other technology, uh, the autothermal reforming, this is uh, dominant, a dominant technology when seen gas rather than pure hydrogen is the desired product, especially at large capacity 
or for low production of low hydrogen CO ratio, like uh, for use in the methanol reaction or fischer tropsch uh, reaction. The APR uh, reactor consists of uh, uh, a burner that is the, a key element uh, to provide the mixing of the feed uh, streams in a turbulent diffusion flame regime. Uh, the combustion chamber it follows uh, uh, the fixed catalyst bed section, the reactor lining, and the pressure shell, as, uh, uh, as uh, reported in, uh, in the picture. This uh, reaction is a combination of thermal partial oxidation with uh, uh, oxygen and uh, steam reforming. The, the heat released in the gas phase oxidation at substachiometric ratio is used for the endothermic uh, uh, reforming stage, uh, catalytic uh, reforming stage based on catalyst based on nickel, also in this case. And there is, uh, in principle, no need to external heat supply. This is a very important uh, point, uh, especially in view of uh, the, the, the final uh, uh, CO2 emission uh, figure of this, uh, of this system. Uh, oxygen is, uh, is produced from air, so it is required an ice separation unit. And the specific uh, electric energy required is about 500 kilowatt hour per tons of, uh, of oxygen. Also in this case, uh, uh, to arrive at an hydrogen production, it is uh, necessary first a pre-reformer unit uh, for flexibility on the feedstock and a downstream water gas shift and PSA package. Uh, in the, in the following uh, uh, slide, um, I wanted to, uh, uh, to put the attention when uh, the system, SMR and ATR, are combined, uh, are combined with uh, um, a carbon capture plant. In terms of uh, uh, CO2 emitted and also uh, 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 the possibility to capture at a high rate the CO2. For the, 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 the SMR, as, uh, as you see in, 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 the two, in, the, in the three figures here, there are uh, at least two options to capture the CO2. The, the CO2. Uh, uh, in one case, uh, uh, the system, the capture system, is uh, upstream the PSA unit with two possible uh, uh, configurations. Uh, one in uh, recycling back the tile gas from PSA to the SMR furnace, and a second one uh, which uh, is recycling back uh, to the SMR uh, uh, burner system, also a uh, raw hydrogen from the, the water gas shift unit. This uh, has uh, um, an impact uh, in, in the final uh, CO2 emission uh, figure of the system, as well as uh, in the, in the uh, maximum CO2 capture rate. The third figure in the bottom is, uh, is considering a second option uh, in which the, the carbon capture plant is placed just outlet, the, is placed in uh, uh, the flue gas stream from the methane reforming furnace. It's a typical post uh, uh, combustion case as you can uh, as you can see in the bar chart as a result uh, of this different configuration in this case uh, we consider the the IEE JNG technical report uh, and, and we analyze it in introducing some uh, uh, emission factor very important for the LCA analysis as you can see, I was saying there are a significant difference from option to difference from option to option. In the most favorable case, we reach 90% capture, CO2 capture, overall CO2 capture, and a fairly low 2.2 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of produced hydrogen. That, in comparing with the an SMR plant without capture, the figure is quite different. 
the two options highlighted here, the one and two, is, uh, is giving to a different capture rate, uh, I would say considerable. Of course, uh, the use of hydrogen is reducing the emission at the uh, Fournay side. Uh, let me uh, give you uh, a few elements in the comparison from uh, SMR and ATR, both cases enhanced uh, with uh, the capture system. And uh, you see that uh, the, uh, uh, you see it is uh, almost know that uh, the SMR is a net steam and heat importer uh, uh, and appears more emissive than ATR. While the ATR is the largest electricity user due of course uh, to the high separation units present. From a specific CO2 equivalent emission point of view, the comparison in any case could arrive at the same result if uh, we uh, basically maximize the steam recovery and the thermal integration in the SMR uh, uh, plus capture case. Basically, the, the HP steam produced by a steam methane reforming can be used as driving fluid in a steam turbine to produce electricity power and low pressure steam for the carbon capture plant we are considering a standard amine uh, unit uh, uh, in the in the regeneration in the regeneration column in the case of atr they use uh, the use uh, of uh, an electricity mix from the grid with a relatively low emission factor. And in this case, we use the average value in 2019 in Europe that accounts for something about 24% of renewable source. You see that the result could be comparable. This is a, a, an interesting aspect that we have to, to consider uh, in the selection of the of the technology, uh, another element important here is uh, uh, the uh, uh, importance in the quality, especially for the SMR, in the quality of the imported natural gas used as a processed feedstock and, and fuel gas. In fact, the emission factor of the imported natural gas may greatly impact the indirect. GNJ emission of the system and, and of course the overall CO2 equivalent specific emission. Uh, the graph here uh, uh, show the impact on the overall CO2 emission uh, by increasing the natural gas uh, uh, emission factor, the impact factor. Uh, for different uh, solution, uh, the CC, uh, CCS enhanced methane reforming uh, with uh, uh, um, an imported steam with auto production of steam and two ATR uh, uh, um, enhanced with capture a different uh, uh, electricity impact factor a different content of uh, renewable energy source uh, the graph report also this is very important the taxonomy threshold set by the European community at three kilograms CO2 equivalent per kilogram of, of oxygen, uh, which puts the blue hydrogen only marginally taxonomy aligned. Uh, basically, project based on blue hydrogen production uh, means needs uh, are eligible to sustainable to the sustainable financial package by the European community. Commission only when uh, natural gas has a low GNG emission factor, this is a key point, and the electricity comes from a mix of high renewable content. Um, let's have a look, a brief look uh, at the uh, water electrolysis technology perspective. Uh, the technology, as well known, uh, are the uh, three at different maturity, the, the, the alkaline electrolysis that is uh, uh, well mature, uh, commercial technology since uh, 1926, 
uh, hydrogen ions are transported in the two electrodes operating in a liquid alkaline electrolyte solution uh, and separated by a diaphragm of composite material. Uh, the proton exchange membrane, membrane electrolysis that was first introduced in the 60s by the General Electric to overcome some problem uh, of the uh, alkaline uh, electrolysis. Uh, and finally, the least developed electrolysis technology, the solid oxide electrolytic cell, the SOEC. They have not uh, yet been commercialized, although individually companies are now uh, aiming to bring them uh, in, uh, in, into the market. Uh, some of the water electrolysis characteristics are very important in the future application perspective. I simply recall you the, the European hydrogen strategy target of, 20, of 40 gigawatts in 2030 and 500 gigawatts in, uh, uh, in 2050 for the green hydrogen production. And the graph here reported that are uh, um, an elaboration of the IEA analysis uh, clearly show the step increase in efficiency uh, uh, in the stack, stacks uh, uh, lifetime, uh, the stacks module uh, lifetime, and the capacity decrease in the next uh, 30 years. Uh, the main reason for such technology cost reduction is mainly ascribed to the technology uh, innovation, of course. Uh, it's for instance, in the field of the material, the, the material for uh, the electrodes and the membrane, the presence or not of noble metal. Uh, and uh, very important, the industrial learning by doing evolution, especially, especially for the SOEC uh, system, and the economies of scale in the manufacturing of, of, uh, of the processes. From a production cost perspective, the levelized cost of blue hydrogen, these are data recently, um, uh, recently presented in August by BIS, uh, uh, are fairly constant, as you see, uh, and flatting uh, in, in the range of 2.7, 3.1 kilograms, uh, euro per kilograms of hydrogen. While for uh, the, the, the electrolyzer system, besides the electricity cost, the grid electricity cost, which dominate uh, the production cost, it could be appreciated again, especially for the SOEC system, uh, the trend in capacity decrease over time, and the incidence of the variable cost associated to the periodic replacement of the, the, stax, uh, the stax module. Um, Okay, let's move now uh, in a brief, uh, let's say, view of the hydrogen storage and, and delivery technology, technological status. Uh, the, 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 the hydrogen like oil gases can be stored and transported and there is a considerable experience uh, that uh, dates back uh, the, the, the beginning uh, since last century. Uh, nevertheless, uh, such experience is limited to a small to mid-sized industry. Today, the growing uh, uh, green hydrogen scenario uh, needs a sustainable scalability of hydrogen storage uh, and delivery at very large capacity, as we have seen from the, from the European and not only projection. The, the application of hydrogen storage can be divided in two main groups. Uh, the stationary storage, the on-site storage at the point of use, or the on-site storage at the point of production. And this, uh, as we will see, is uh, linked to the concept of the hydrogen valley and the mobile storage, or uh, if you prefer, the storage for, uh, for mobility. Uh, due to the, uh, uh, let's say, due to the uh, hydrogen low volume energy density compared to the fossil fuel, physical and material based transformation are uh, required to limit volume 
weight of the containment system and of course reduce the relevant uh, the relevant cost uh, in, if concerning storage and deliver technology of course uh, they have a very different volumetric and uh, gravimetric different ranges resulting as, as it is reported in in the table a, a different uh, applicability of the storage volume or uh, or, or uh, the instance uh, of transport uh, and in this case uh, the physical base uh, transformation like compression and liquid hydrogen are of course state of art technology with a TRL, TRL 8 or better 9 uh, fully fully industrialized technology. On the other side, uh, the material-based transformation that is a very interesting uh, uh, area for the material science uh, are, uh, are less mature. I'm speaking about uh, uh, the molecular, or organic, molecular organic framework, uh, the, the, the carbon system, uh, uh, the hydrates, and they have uh, a relatively low readiness uh, level. We will see uh, something about that in, in a while. So among the physical based transformation, compressed hydrogen and cryogenic liquid storage and transportation do not need too many descriptions. Uh, compressed uh, hydrogen transport is today carried out both via track strain at a pressure up to 300 bar. It is worth to mention that from a containment system point of view, it is growing the use of composite pressure vessel of type three, the one based on uh, a carbon fiber, uh, 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 carbon fiber graph on an internal uh, thin liner of steel or uh, aluminum. Uh, new routes in, in the area of physical transformation are the, 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 the very high, the high pressure cylinder designed to work at 950 bar at room temperature. Uh, these systems are classified as a type four pressure vessel and they are based on carbon fiber wrapped on a uh, internal uh, liner of uh, uh, high density polyethylene. As a result, uh, uh, these cylinders are lighter and more resistant to hydrogen embrittlement than the type three cylinder, the one with the, the metallic line, liner. Um, the picture you see uh, an example of, uh, of these uh, uh, cylinders arranged in uh, isomodal rack. Uh, a curiosity is uh, the first example of hydrogen transport by means of a cryogenic carrier, uh, uh, similar to the, the, the LNG ship behind the street is the AGSC project, the hydrogen uh, energy supply chain uh, linked by Kawasaki. Uh, the project, uh, the aim of the project is to demonstrate the transport, the liquefied hydrogen transport on a distance of 9,000 kilometers from Japan to, to Australia. In, this is the picture of the uh, the, the, the first liquefied hydrogen carrier launched in December uh, uh, 2019. Uh, okay, the liquid organic carrier is another uh, interesting uh, uh, in, in example of uh, material transformation, in this case is chemical transformation. Uh, it is moving into the final demonstration step before its commercialization. The storage and transport concept is typically based on a reversible catalytic hydrogenation and dehydrogenation reaction with different chemical couples of organic compounds, like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the one used by the Japanese company Choda, uh, that is Toluene uh, and uh, uh, methylcyclozene. Choda announced last year the Spera hydrogen project with the intent to demonstrate the entire transport chain concept to connect the, the city of Spark in Brunei with uh, uh, the Kawasaki city in, uh, in Japan. 
Uh, Armonia is another attractive hydrogen storage medium for, uh, for several reasons, as you, as you see uh, highlighted also in, uh, in this slide. Of course, the, the very high volumetric density, uh, the very mature synthesis handling and transportation, and the fact that uh, the ammonia plant could in principle be easily retrofitted uh, to the use of hydrogen from, uh, from electrolysis. Uh, there is also a possible ammonia use as a carbon free fuel in internal combustion engine and, and, and gas turbine. Uh, the, the, the last and probably the, the most interesting concept of hydrogen material transformation, as uh, I introduced before, is the storage by absorption. It is uh, uh, very attractive because uh, it has the potential to, to lower the, the overall system pressure for, uh, for an equivalent amount of hydrogen, yielding safer and operating conditions. This is extremely important. Uh, and the, uh, the advantages of this methodology uh, are that the, the volumetric and cryogenic constraints are basically abandoned. Of course, uh, the mobility sector is paying large attention to the development of this area. Um, as already introduced, the hydrogen carbon material has a relatively low technology readiness level, and uh, uh, are still ongoing several validation, uh, R&D validation program. The, the US DOE is periodically setting uh, the, the KPI target as the material performance increases. Uh, the, the storage material can be classified in uh, nanoporous material and uh, hydride, which uh, respectively capture hydrogen by physisorption and chem chemisorption process. Nanoporous material like the metal organic framework, uh, the carbon nanotubes have the advantage of an absorption, absorption process uh, completely uh, reversible and a fast kinetics. This is in contrast to some hydrogen absorption by several metal and metal hydrides and complex hydrides that are uh, somehow reported in, uh, in, the figure, uh, in, the, in the figure here, uh, uh, where it is also indicated what are today the minimum requirements established, uh, established by, by the DOE in terms of gravimetric storage density, is the, the, the blue dotted line, and uh, sorry, the, yes, the blue dot in line and uh, the, the, the volumetric capacity of the system. Very important element for the vehicle mobility sector. Uh, in, the, in the last part uh, of, my, of my presentation, I, I am pleased to introduce you an overview of the ENI activity with a focus on uh, uh, the decarbonization project and our proprietary technology. Just to, to give you an example of how the, the energy company are today moving in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, challenging, uh, challenging uh, uh, period, uh, uh, especially in perspective of the uh, target that we have. Uh, with few let's say, light detail. Uh, I don't want to, to bother you with this uh, organizational uh, uh, change, but in June last year, and he launched a new organization business uh, uh, with two new business group, functional to the new strategic objective that it is reported in the uh, right-hand side of this slide. The natural resource, which is focuses on the sustainable valorization of the upstream oil and gas portfolio, the wholesale, wholesale gas marketing, uh, and projects related to, 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 to forest conservation and CCUS, and the energy evolution, dealing with the, the evolution of the energy uh, generation systems, business, and power, and refinery, and chemistry as well, 
and the transformation in sale of products from fossil to bio, blue, and green. Uh, there is also a, a, a central structure, the new technology R&D and digital unit, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, which has a strategic relevance uh, to to ENI uh, as uh, let's say research and development and technological in innovation innovation are considered key drivers for creating value and growth concerning. The new energy strategy, as you see, uh, it was defined uh, early this year. It, uh, it uh, relaunched the short and medium and long term operational objectives that, uh, as you can see, are uh, quite challenging. It will lead uh, to a carbon neutrality in 2050, including all uh, GNG scope one, two, and three emissions. Uh, 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 among the, the levers to target uh, uh, to target this uh, this objective, the net zero emission, there is also the blue hydrogen and green hydrogen that is uh, that was central to my to my presentation. Uh, any is uh, is evaluating. Uh, uh, a number of initiatives in Middle East, North Africa, Asia and Pacific involving blue and green hydrogen production, as well as also uh, blue and green ammonia. But uh, uh, let's say in Europe, uh, as you can see in, uh, in this slide, in this snapshot, uh, there is the, the, the concentration of, uh, of the ENI initiative. I, I would like to jump in one of the the, the, the most important, uh, since ENI has identified in the Ravenna area the opportunity to exploit the combination of uh, the, the, the depleted offshore uh, gas field with the infrastructure still in, uh, in, in the operation, uh, uh, in, still in operation. The first demo project uh, in Ravenna is announced for 2023 and it will allow us to, to gain competencies on the entire uh, CCS value chain. This process, which is based on safe and validated technologies, represents the fastest way to effectively reduce CO2 emissions without upsetting existing industrial processes. Ravenna Hub, uh, with an estimated storage capacity of 500 million tons, could give a significant contribution to the containment of the uh, climate changing gas emission in Italy. For instance, uh, by capturing uh, third party industrial CO2 emission, especially from the hard to abate uh, sector, uh, uh, reducing CO2 emission from the existing ENI plant, producing blue hydrogen to be used uh, as, uh, as feedstock uh, for uh, uh, biofuel production, so in our uh, biorefinery, to decarbonize our to abate sector, as said, and for heavy duty transport, shipping, and aviation. Uh, also, the production of blue power for decarbonize, uh, decarbonize electric production is uh, in, uh, in, intrinsic in this uh, development scheme, as well as also the fact that blue hydrogen and CCS uh, will contribute to the development of the, the concept of the hydrogen value, which is an uh, extremely in interesting one. Very rapidly, uh, in the N strategy, uh, uh, of course, there is the renewable uh, electricity. So we decided that to start a collaboration with Enel by sharing our competencies and experience. And we launched two pilot projects to produce green hydrogen through electrolyzer uh, uh, powered by renewable energy. The electrolyzer will be located near two of the ENI sites in, uh, in Gela, uh, the beer refinery in Gela and the Taranto refinery. Uh, each of the two projects uh, will uh, feature an electrolyzer of around 10 to 20 megawatts and are expected to start generating green hydrogen by 2023. 
uh, both initiative have been proposed also as uh, important project of community European interest, the IPSA project, uh, with the objective uh, to study the best configuration, to evaluate technically and economically feasibility, uh, the operational continuity, especially in, in, in the interconnection with the, with the site, and uh, to define the necessary reg regulatory framework. Uh, another initiative is uh, uh, the uh, hydrogen for mobility. Very briefly, uh, we have uh, considered, uh, we have signed two agreements with uh, Toyota, uh, one in uh, uh, San Donato Genesi, Milan, Toyota is the provider of the, the, the Mirai uh, FUSA car uh, for uh, the production and to, to realize a, a selling point, what we will call in the future ENI mobility point, uh, producing by means of an, an electrolyzer in the selling point uh, 700 bar of hydrogen supply to, to the car. In Venice, different, uh, it will be uh, installed a service station with 10 cars and three buses, and, and the hydrogen in this case will be transported to the station on a tank distribution uh, at different pressure, depending on the bus uh, or uh, car uh, uh, utilization. Uh, to conclude my lecture, I would like to present uh, three ENI proprietary uh, technology uh, that will play for sure a role in our decarbonization path. One is uh, uh, called key gas, is uh, uh, basically a short contact time catalytic partial oxidation. Uh, the technology is characterized by feedstock and uh, oxidant flexibility and the limit and it limits the use of some uh, high highly energetic intensive steps typical of the, uh, the, the traditional processes uh, the proprietary reactor and noble metal catalyst uh, which are integrated into four, four main sections as uh, identified in, in the picture here uh, could reduce uh, the reaction volume one to two order of magnitude compared to the, the current uh, steam metal reforming or box technology, giving to this technology also interesting application at, uh, at a small, uh, at a small uh, uh, scale. The, 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 the key gas technology validation is, uh, is progressing and the first demonstration plan is uh, under advanced construction inside the ENI refinery of Taranto with a nominal capacity uh, for single gas production of 8,000 uh, normal cubic meters uh, per hour or 5,000 normal cubic meters per hour of, uh, of, um, of hydrogen. Uh, in parallel, there are extensive uh, uh, engineering studies, uh, as I said, for the application uh, for instance, in the methanol production or the conversion of biogas in a small scale application. Um, the second uh, technology I wanted just to, uh, to briefly uh, introduce is the ESWIT, that is the ENI proprietary carbon capture technology. ESWIT fluid technology is based on a mixed solvent absorption system. Uh, which combine uh, the uh, ionic liquids uh, like DBU, that is uh, um, anamidine, anamidine uh, uh, organic compound, mixed with alcohol and, when necessary, a selected physical solvent. This, uh, this formulation enables not only CO2 capture, but also H2S and mercap tanks capture from natural gas and flue gas with some, let's say, advantages uh, that are here reported once for all, the, the, the ionic liquid regeneration lower duty. Uh, the, the third and last proprietary technology I wanted to, to, to show you in, in, in the next minutes 
is uh, the carbon capture mineralization. It is interesting because it's one of the rare examples of a carbon utilization project. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this is based on the reaction between the carbon dioxide and the, the olivine, a very common magnesium iron silicate, uh, white widely available in, in, in high purity house crops and uh, the reaction is is, is well known uh, is uh, exothermic thermodynamically favorable but uh, with a very slow kinetics occurring on geological time scale uh, any has filed a patent on a new carbon captured mineralization process to deploy the, the, the reaction at the industrial scale uh, with dedicated experiment program was carried out especially on the reactor technology selection to maximize the gas liquid mass, uh, uh, mass transfer. The process is very attractive uh, with a uh, high nominal uptake of CO2 up to 0 0.45 tons of CO2 per tons of minerals and uh, uh, forming, uh, let's say, non-toxic phases that can be directly used uh, in uh, cement formulation. This is in fact the, the, the application we, we, are, uh, we are considering. Uh, I think that uh, uh, this uh, technology, uh, I think, I mean, uh, there is a study in progress for this technology. And uh, just to conclude, uh, we would like uh, to apply this technology together with the ISWI technology in, uh, uh, in the Ravenna CCS hub project, as you, as you have seen, uh, as uh, this is the ideal context uh, that uh, can be considered for uh, the demonstration of, uh, of, this, uh, of this technology. I, I thank you for, uh, for your attention and hope that uh, I have passed, I have given to you some, let's say, messages to be used in the, in the scientific com community for the, the next technology improvement and innovation. Grazie mille, Dr. Zanara. So we are very grateful for uh, your lecture, also addressing the industrial side of uh, say the process is what we're dealing or oh, many uh, people here in the audience are dealing from the academic perspective and we're also grateful for sharing recent uh, projects and uh, uh, what you have at ENI some of them they would look fantastic even a few years ago including utilization of ionic liquids for CO to capture which was considered to be too expensive. So we are really looking forward and will closely monitor what is the progress of this and the other uh, process what you have mentioned. According to the program, uh, once again, thank you very much. According to the program, we should have a short break for 15 minutes and we will do that. Uh, and after that, uh, I strongly ask all the uh, participants to come back after stretching your legs and drinking coffee, because we have two more exciting uh, presentations, two more keynote lectures. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to conclude this particular uh, session. Thank you.
I, I think we can we can start mm -hmm. the session. Hello together. Hello. Hello. Can you see my screen and presentation? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Hello. So we, we, good afternoon, good morning, good night, depending on where you are. Uh, and welcome to the first Keynote lecture session of the conference. Uh, my name is Luis Gandia. I'm professor of chemical engineering at the public University of Navarre, the state. And uh, I would like to acknowledge the organizing committee for inviting me to chair this session is, is a big pleasure for, for me. Our first speaker is Professor Dr. Ingenieur Hans Freund from the Technische Universität Dortmund, Germany. Professor Freund was head of the Europe Catalytic Reactors and Process Technology Athletic Alexander University of Erlanger Nürnberg by nearly two years. And since the beginning of this month, he has taken over the position of chair of the Institute of Reaction Engineering and Catalysis at the Technische Universität Bordeaux. His research activity covers such as specific areas, such as model design of optimal chemical reactors, process, additive manufacturing of cellular structures as novel catalyst supports, and reaction kinetics. The focus of Professor Freund's research is on the development of energy and resource efficient chemical processes, with a special focus on the model based design of optimal catalytic reactor, in a comprehensive approach, innovative process, reactor, and material concepts are considered, which includes the evaluation of different process <clears throat> intensification options. 
In 2019, Professor Freund led the sixth international conference, conference on structure reactors and catalysts at German, and his author of more than 300 scientific contributions to prestigious journals and conferences. Well, the title of this, of, uh, this lecture is Additive Manufacturing of Tailor Made Catalytic Reactors with Optimal and Flexible Transport Properties. So, Please, Andrew, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luis, for the kind words, the kind introduction. And also, of course, thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me to give this keynote presentation. Uh, although it's not uh, in presence at Milan, I would have loved to be there, actually, but all of us, I guess. So we will do our best and see what we can do together here uh, at this meeting. So it's actually, uh, as mentioned, my first presentation in my new position as chair of the Institute of Reaction Engineering and Catalysis at TU Dortmund University. However, the results I'm presenting obviously are from the last years, last couple of years uh, we have achieved together with my group at the University of Erlangen. Uh, Nuremberg, however, um, actually, I have moved with more or less my whole research group to TU Dortmund, so you can expect more follow up work also in the directions I will show you today. And the topic is additive manufacturing of tailor made catalytic reactors that are optimal, but also we try to design reactors that are flexible and these I will try to show you in my presentation. Uh, at first, I will give you a, a brief overview of our research area. So everything is about reactors. So that's why it's a perfect conference actually for us. And uh, we try always uh, to achieve uh, an optimal reactor by rigorously optimizing um, the balance equations. So optimization problem using balance equations and kinetic expressions. And then we try uh, to, to answer the question, what would be the best optimal reactor? And in order to do this, you need obviously reaction kinetics. So this is another research line. So we do reaction kinetic experiments as well as modeling, both in smaller lab scale and also in, uh, I would say, meter scale, more industrial application reactors. And once you have done all this, you have this optimal result, then the question is how to realize this actually. So how can we now match the optimal uh, transport uh, processes with the reaction conditions we would like to achieve. And here, um, additive manufacturing of catalyst support structures comes into play. This is uh, this circle here, and this is uh, the talk I will give today um, about this novel catalyst support structures that we can design and we can fabricate by additive manufacturing. If you now compare, let's, let's start from the basics. Is if, if you now, uh, let's say, look at the options we have, we have, let's say, the two established uh, technologies. We have the randomly packed fixed bed reactor uh, on the one side. Uh, the main advantage is here that we it's an easy design and, and uh, it's a simple manufacturing of the cat pallets and you have a high catalyst inventory. However, with regard to the transport processes, this design is not so favorable yeah, because you have a high pressure drop and uh, you have a limited uh, heat transport in radial direction. Also, your design flexibility is quite limited. On the other hand, we have these monolithic honeycomb reactors that are also uh, well established, particularly where you have high flow rates because the pressure drop is low. So it has some really favorable um, properties but also here, the design uh, flexibility is quite limited. And also you don't have, let's say, an interconnection between these channels. And that's why we came up in Erlangen. And if I say we, I mean my colleague, uh, Wilhelm Schwieger and myself, um, we have done a lot of work in these periodic open cellular structures, short pox, where we try to combine the advantages from both worlds, basically, um, and these pox are basically a unit cell. Here in this picture, it's a cubic unit cell uh, that is reproduced in all spatial directions. And then you have a 3D network of struts interconnected to solid matrix. And also you have a channel system that is also communicating. So you will have a radial mixing and this enhances of course also the radial mass transport. The nice thing is that the morphology, if you do this by 3D printing, it's a very um, well-defined morphology. So you can systematically analyze, for example, the size of the pores here. You can analyze the influence of the size of the strut, thickness of the struts, and so on. 
And once you have understood this, you can also try to optimize these structures. Now you can uh, then play around with the different geometrical properties and try to match uh, the transport processes you want to achieve. And we have done this in the last uh, now more than 10 years. Uh, I, I'm always a bit joking and say we did 3D printing because before it was fancy. Yeah? And, and nowadays it's, it's, it's a bit a hype, uh, but we started the work uh, in, yeah, the first publication was in 2011 and we started to analyze the pressure drop in a single phase flow. And then eventually we added on complexity to the system. Um, and we have also done some nice collaborations with a group of Enrico Tronconi in Milan. Uh, so we have done a lot of work in this direction on pressure drop, also on multi-phase operation, on uh, pure heat conduction in the solid matrix, but also on the overall heat transfer. And the overall heat transfer is the first uh, storyline I want uh, to uh, highlight a bit here. And I want to give you um, an, um, a, glimp, uh, a glimpse on why it's, this is interesting to do. So what you see here in this figure on the right hand side is you, you see uh, three times more or less the same geometrical structure that has been manufactured by selective electron beam melting. Uh, this means basically you have a metal powder and then you do 3D printing of this uh, metal substrate and, and then you get this kind of structure. And then of course always the question is how to bring the structure into the reactor tube and um, then you can have different uh, possibilities. You can just uh, yeah, put it, fit it loosely in this tube or you can wrap an alumina foil around this in order to enhance the wall contact or, and this is now the nice thing with 3D printing, you can directly print the wall attached to the structure. Yeah? So basically uh, by, by printing, you do it layer by layer and around the structure, you can directly print the solid wall. And uh, now we want to investigate uh, how the wall contacting now has an influence on the overall heat transfer performance. And if you compare now the overall heat transfer, uh, plotted here on the left over the mass flux here. Then the color code, by the way, is the same as, as here. So the green one is the loosely fitted. And if you now uh, look at a certain mass flux, yeah, you see that the overall heat transfer increases considerably if you enhance the wall contact, either by an aluminum foil or by direct contact, namely by printing the wall attached to the structure. Um, so this is one, I think, of the key issues. Um, also, the same applies to uh, open cellular foams or of irregular morphology. Uh, the ball contacting is a key issue here. And then 3D printing, you can address this issue uh, by, by certain measures. In this slide, um, I have tried to um, combine, let's say, all the results we have achieved in a, in a study by Corinna Busse. She was a PhD student jointly supervised by Wilhelm Schwieger and myself. And um, the plot here, the most interesting in this plot is the color code. I, I will try to explain this. Uh, the color code refers to um, the difference of the overall heat transfer from the POC system minus fixed bed. Uh, this means when this delta is uh, greater than zero, then the POCs have a better overall heat transfer. And if it's smaller than zero, then the traditional particle pack fixed bed performs better. And uh, this black line here is a separatrix line in this diagram. And on this diagram, we have as an additional um, a parameter here, uh, we have on the y-axis, the solid matrix conductivity of the bike material. And we have the superficial mass velocity. And, and what you see here is that, let's say for a given solid matrix uh, conductivity, there is a certain uh, superficial velocity, which is exactly the separating point. If you go above that velocity, then the conventional fixed bed is better. And if you go below, then the POC system is better. This has all been calculated using, of course, appropriate uh, correlations. And by the way, it has been calculated for the same um, uh, surface area. Yeah? And, and the point, why is that the case? It's quite easy to explain. In the conventional fixed bed, the mass, uh, the heat transfer is mainly dominated uh, by convective uh, heat transfer. So the convection plays a major role, while uh, the pox perform very well also at low flow rates because they have a considerable contribution of the conductive heat transfer, so the conduction. 
And this is also apparent if you now see, if you now would change the solid, uh, bike solid material from Inconel, for example, to aluminum or even copper, yeah, our material scientists were able to print um, also uh, copper reactors. Um, then you see that, of course, the range where the pox perform better gets larger and larger. So this is, let's say, the influencing parameters are the solid matrix bike material and also the superficial mass velocity. Besides trivial parameters as porosity, obviously. I mean, I mean the more solid material you have, the better the conductivity, but, but this is true for all cases. So now we want to see how does this now um, influence the reaction. And if we go into a reaction, we selected the methanol um, partial oxidation to form aldehyde according to the Formox process. And uh, here, this uh, reaction uh, network is already, let's say, uh, it's quite optimized. So the industrial reference process has a quite high conversion and selectivity, but still you have some CO as a byproduct, which you try to avoid. And as we all know, I mean, the uh, reaction to CO and also to CO2, obviously, they usually tend to have higher activation energies. This means they kick off if you have a hotspot. So our uh, working hypothesis was here, if we can now manage the temperature profile to be more uniform, we can also suppress the undesired uh, CO formation. And uh, this is shown on the next slide now. Here on the right-hand side, you see the two compared uh, systems, uh, which were compared uh, uh, in, in the experiments. So it's not only a simulation study, but also experimentally. Um, you see here uh, the particle system, and you see here the POX system, and both systems have the same catalyst mass, reactor volume, and the same conversion. And now the question is, how does the temperature profile look like, and how does the CO selectivity look like? And if you compare this, you see that for the POX, um, well, let's start with the conventional fixed bed, maybe you see the typical hotspot here evolving here due to the exothermicity and then due to the cooling, uh, you get the temperature down again. And for the POX system, you see uh, that you have a very flat temperature profile, you can really work uh, nearly hydrothermal, and this uh, cuts down the CO formation by half. So quite interesting result uh, for this uh, gas phase uh, management, heat management in gas phase reactions. And now uh, we also wanted to look into the, let's say, uh, possibilities for gas liquid applications, so multi-phase operation. And in order to do this, we first did uh, some studies on the liquid distribution. And if you look at trickle bed reactors, um, we have uh, usually a certain liquid distributor. So this is a cold flow setup, and these structures here are polymeric of polymeric nature, uh, created by filament deposition, uh, FDM technique. And um, what you see here is basically you have a liquid distributor, then you have a packing consisting of different uh, stacks of different uh, unit cell type geometry, and also sometimes the board is printed directly to the structure and sometimes not. And then the most important thing is the liquid collector here at the bottom with 21, 21 uh, collection zones of equal area. And, and then the liquid flow is monitored here automatically so that we can know if uh, at the end of the bed, basically we have a nearly um, even liquid distribution or we have some dry areas or some rivulets that form. And if you now compare two different cell types, Kelvin cell pox and diamond pox, um, you can see different patterns in, in terms of liquid distribution. What you see here is, let's e explain first the scale. The scale means red is uh, full liquid and white is only gas, and in between is a mixture. Uh, you see the liquid saturation, basically. And here you go down the reactor column, and you see that for the Kelvin cell at the end, you more or less have uh, in the core of the packing the liquid, while in the diamond cell, you have at the end, more or less, you see it here at the outer edge of the packing, the liquid, and in the center, you have dry zones. And you can explain this already by the unit cell geometry. And, and this brought uh, one of my PhD students, uh, Markus Lemmermann, uh, to the idea of combining these two cells. So he created a new cell type, which we uh, called diacel, because it's a diamond part and a Kelvin cell part attached to each other. And then by 3D printing, um, he created a, a full structure, 3D structure out of this unit cell. 
And then he compared the performance of the liquid distribution. And you can also express this uh, by the my distribution factor. If the my distribution factor is zero, then you have a perfect even liquid distribution. And the higher, uh, the more uneven the distribution is. And if you compare this with a reference trickle bed reactor consisting of spheres as a benchmark, and then you compare this to this uh, pox consisting of the DRKL structure, you see the blue line here that in the beginning it's more or less the same because it's mainly influenced by the liquid uh, initial distribution of the liquid on the top of the column. But you see that the liquid distribution in this uh, pox structure gets better and better. Uh, downwards, and you see this also visually here because you have a quite nice, even uh, light red color. So improvements up to a factor of two could be achieved with the optimized design of the cell geometry here. As a test reaction for this trickle bed gas liquid application, um, we looked into the um, trickle bed system, which uh, we wanted to avoid, let's say, put it this way, that we have overlapping effects. Uh, we wanted only to look at the liquid distribution, and we didn't want to have an influence of too much of the reaction exothermicity or so. And uh, this led us uh, to a reaction system, which is a hydrodesulfurization of, of uh, crude oil, uh, of diesel oil. And as a model substance, we used DBT for this. So the task here is that you have to come down from approximately 1.5 to 3 weight percent cipher down to 10 ppm of cipher components uh, by adding hydrogen. So you create H2S and you uh, decipherize uh, then your de uh, crude oil. This means basically this reactor is more or less a cleaning unit and you really have to avoid any bypass effect uh, because you need to achieve 99.9% .9 conversion in this reactor. While the exothermicity is negligible because you only have as you see here, 2% or so uh, in the whole mixture. So, and uh, in order to do this, you need then obviously go back to the metal substrate system. So we create first this box as shown here. So this is the bare structure. In this case, we used a titanium aluminum um, alloy for this. This is the bare structure. And then you need several um, coding and impregnation steps uh, to get the catalytically active uh, substrate. The first one is your coating uh, to get this aluminum oxide. And then you have an impregnation step with a cobalt molybdenum uh, salt solution. And this, uh, this precursor here needs to be activated. And the activation step is a sulfidation uh, to achieve the cobalt molybdenum sulfide. And this uh, substrate here is then put into this reactor. This is approximately a 1.5 meter reactor. And here uh, then the reaction was performed. And what we could then see is that in fact, um, if you relate the conversion to the catalyst mass, a much better efficiency could be achieved in terms of conversion per used catalyst mass in the reactor. Coming from the pox to the interpox, um, in my title, I have uh, mentioned optimal and flexible reactors. And here I want to address the flexible, the flexibility aspect a bit. So usually we talk about a pox consisting of a unit cell, cubic or Kelvin or diamond unit cell. Um, but then one of our PhD students, Giang Do, came up with the idea of a creating a so-called interpox, so an interpenetrating pox system. These are basically two uh, diamond cell pox that are um, interpenetrating, but they are not connected to each other. And this um, enables you to shift the relative position, so basically the, the spacing between the struts um, um, of, of the two pox. Yeah, and I have illustrated this here. If you now look exactly here to this where my laser pointer is, and I click here, so you see now this can be moved. Yeah? Now, now we have to think, of course, in a larger scale system, but the one pox, the light green pox is fixed. And the dark green pox can be shifted relative to the other. And uh, the shift, the offset, can be defined by the distance between these two and uh, these two struts. So this means basically if you have an offset, we defined an offset of 50%, then it's exactly this arrangement. It's equidistant is 50%. And if you now shift it, then you have an offset of, for example, 75%. And, and now this gives you some um, possibility to tune the reaction and transport behavior of the system. 
And we uh, did this in a lot of uh, detailed simulations, which I obviously will not show in detail. But um, what was done was a CFD simulation and the mass transport analysis. The mass transport analysis, I only want to highlight a new code development. Um, and this is a district foam solver, which is uh, open available. So we have published this paper and uh, we mentioned uh, this solver there. You can use it uh, to determine the dispersion coefficient and resonance time distribution and so on and so forth. And it can be fully implemented in the open form package. If you're interested in using this, just drop us a mail and uh, you can have it, it's for free. Um, and it enables us to um, determine this dispersion behavior of the system. Now, today I want to highlight a bit the reaction control aspect, and I will just briefly highlight um, a short example on this. Because the question we had is, can I use now this offset position, so the relative positioning of the two structures in order to influence the reaction? Yeah. So basically influence the reaction, not only by temperature and, and by a concentration, but influence it by the geometrical arrangement by, and this is important, by keeping the same porosity, basically the same system periphery, right? It's, it's just the internal structure uh, which changes. And in order to, uh, to have a look into this, the first thing we did is uh, we used the catalytic foam solver from uh, Politecnico di Milano from the Maestri group. And uh, we used the CO oxidation as a case study using the Kemkin uh, model from the Deutschmann group from KIT. And, and then we compared basically for the same inlet conditions, but for different offset positions, we compared the concentration profiles and the conversion. And um, if you have a look at this figure, you see that there's a difference. You also see that the difference is not so large here. The reason being that the CO oxidation here is quite fast reaction, but you see distinctively, you see that uh, the CO concentration remaining is higher for the 75% offset than for the 50 and correspondingly the product concentration is lower. So this mean, means you have a lower conversion in the 75% offset. And um, this gives you now some possibility to adjust the conversion of a chemical reaction. And if you do this now for a system reaction that is not so fast, yeah, we did a model reaction A to B here, you see that the difference in conversion can be up to 12% uh, absolute and relative it's even higher percentage. Yeah? This means depending on the reaction rate and the transport properties, you can tune uh, the reaction behavior. Uh, having the same geometry, having the same inlet conditions, but you have basically a kind of a windshield effect here in the structure. Yeah? So this strut covers this one, and this means um, the surface area available for the reaction and for the fluid flow um, is lower in this, and this is a reason for the lower conversion in this aspect here. With this, I'm at the end of my talk. I want to summarize. So we have seen that POCs are an interesting option for a process intensification in catalytic reactors. We have seen that for um, heat management, they are quite favorable, but also you have always to see in which operating range uh, you operate your reactor, but it has a superior heat transfer performance. In gas liquid applications, uh, you can enhance the gas liquid distribution and you, you can also therefore manage uh, trickle bed reactor operation more efficiently. And finally, the interpox system is a quite interesting newest development where we can try to in operando basically adjust the geometry uh, in order to tune conversion and and also the heat release in this reactors and with this i'm at the end and i thank uh, my team and i thank you for your kind attention and i'm looking forward to your questions thank you thank you very much thank you uh, excellent presentation i think that's it it's an, an issue of, of big interest and so time is uh, open for questions maybe i can start um so hans jörg many thanks for this very inspiring uh, talk i really liked it um question this experiments on the liquid distribution was that with water or with an organic liquid or actually how is he um um so is he, is he, um, um, ah. Yeah, I, I understand your point. <laughs> so yes. we did it with different configurations. 
you are addressing a very important point. It's also what it's not only the liquid that is important, but also the printing technology. Uh, because if you use filament deposition, uh, you get a rough polymeric surface. And this is more, let's say, similar to, a, to the real metal catalyst support. While if you use a, a stereolithographic technique uh, using a resin, then you get quite smooth surface. And then you are probably quite off the, let's say, real results uh, in, in your metal system. And, and we used both, actually. We used water, but also uh, we used uh, other uh, mixtures. And, and we, uh, we measured contact angles and so on and so forth. Uh, it's, it's the matching of the two, of the liquid and the solid. OK, thanks. Well, my I have part, also a question. Uh, sorry. Uh, hi, here's uh, Jan Kopischinski, uh, Montreal uh, in uh, McGill University in Canada. Thanks so much, Dirk, uh, for, for the nice talk. Are you able to 3D print essentially structures? Let's say at the beginning they have <coughs> maybe a higher porosity and towards the end is uh, tighter porosity or vice versa, maybe to counter it maybe as a pressure drop or, a, or maybe even have a larger catalyst loading either at the beginning or at the yeah. end. Absolutely. Very, very good point. Thank you for that question. That is uh, just, let's say, ongoing work really to optimize, uh, based on rigorous optimization, really to optimize the uh, distribution. You can nicely do that, as you mentioned. Uh, you can, for example, in the beginning, when the concentration is high, you can go to higher porosities, lower catalyst inventory, and then at the end, where you want to achieve the rest conversion, uh, uh, you can get uh, more catalyst. Uh, you have this degree of freedom in the, in the 3D printing of the structure, and then uh, later on, of course, you have to do the coating step in addition. Yeah, uh, follow up, what was the resolution for the printing? Maybe you mentioned it, but uh, maybe I forgot in terms of um, it's just like 10 micrometers, 20 micrometers, or 100 yeah, micrometers? Yeah, the, the resolution of the strut depends on the metal powder you use. Um, usually, the metal powder is in the range already of uh, 30 to 40 microns. Uh, otherwise, you get what the material scientists call dusting. And, and then you have to think like you need a few metal uh, powder um, uh, particles yeah, um, in, in order to get a reasonable strut uh, stability. So we are talking more about here uh, microstructures. Uh, we are talking about strut sizes, uh, let's say uh, uh, above, definitely above 100 microns, uh, rather let's say 300 or so. But there's also other 3D printing uh, methods that can go to lower resolutions, but uh, we don't do this. Well, thanks so much. Maybe I will contact you. Maybe you can send me some to, to Canada. Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. It's my yeah, pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Andrew, uh, please, could you comment briefly on, on a comparison of these structures with uh, open cell phones? Yeah, actually, the, the open uh, cellular foams have uh, very similar properties in, in, in some of the regards I mentioned. Yeah, they're also an interconnected strut network. The reason why we went to uh, 3D printing is that you really have the full control on the morphology. And in this open cell foams, you have this replication technique in the manufacturing, and sometimes, so you don't have always the even strut size, and sometimes you have blocked pores and, and these kind of issues. And um, therefore, we moved on from this open cellular foams uh, uh, to this box. But they have they share some of the advantages. Definitely, uh, they have in common. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I we don't have more time, so uh, thank you, Hans Jörg. Thank um, you. And and if you have further questions, just drop me an email. <laughs> okay. 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 Our next. Uh, speaker is Professor Paul Dawnhauer from the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis and also from Catalysis Center of Energy and Innovation in Newark, USA. Professor Dawnhauer's research interests are related to the development of sustainable energy technologies. His research aims to address the catalysis and reaction challenge associated with renewable and new carbonaceous stock to the fumes and chemicals of tumor. The invention of new experimental methods combined with new catalytic materials allows him the development of the new generation of energy technologies based on a detailed understanding of chemistry. His publications focus on catalysis and chemistry of highly functional renewable starting materials, 
mechanisms, and kinetics of complex reaction systems and reaction transport interaction in new macro mesoporous materials. Focusing on active system on a scale from catalytic active center to particle to reactor allows Professor Bauhauer to utilize the fundamental knowledge to industrial applications and really increase the opportunities for collaboration with industry. Well, the title of the lecture is Dynamic Catalyst for Renewable Energy and bio light Materials. Uh, they are also co-authors Ardak, Sedi, and Abdel Rahman. So, please, uh, Professor Dan Hauer, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you to the committee for organizing this and uh, with the complexity of, of doing this online. Uh, I want to talk to you today. Uh, we have a, a bit of time. I want to have a new audience, which I appreciate. A lot of people I've not met, uh, which is unfortunate. I hope to meet in person, but maybe in the future. Uh, but I wanted to show you a new uh, idea we've been working on the past couple of years that I think uh, could play into some of the things we've been talking about in the earlier presentations. Uh, can you see the slides OK? OK, I'll proceed. OK, okay so let me. Can. You can, okay. So let me proceed. Uh, let me just get this out of the way. I have equity in, in these companies uh, and I'm required by the university to disclose that I have all of this, but it shouldn't matter for this talk. Um, so if we go back to what was talked about earlier by Professor Martin and others, uh, we have a, a large challenge ahead of us to reach our goals by 2030 and 2050 uh, for climate change. And of course, What's changed amazingly in the past 10 years is that wind and solar power have become amazingly cheap, making uh, the use of low cost carbon neutral or carbon negative uh, electricity of, of an economically viable source. And what we would like to do with that then of course is use that for the purposes of energy storage, energy utilization, carbon capture, et cetera. And of course, all of this comes down to the idea that we have power from wind and solar to use things like water, CO2, and air to make molecules like hydrogen, ammonia, and methanol. So these key energy reactions, of course, are traditional classic problems in both catalysis, reaction engineering, and reactor design, in addition to process systems. And the problem has been, why haven't these matured more in the past 30 years, 40 years, with a lot of effort into them? And the, the, if I summarize everything in the most basic idea, they all come down to one problem, which is they're all limited by the Sabatier principle. Of course, this is this is a well-known idea that's been talked about by many others before me, but the idea being very simply, if I look at a lot of catalysts for ammonia synthesis, a few uh, catalysts that were discovered 100 years ago sit near the top of the Sabatier volcano peak. Same thing with methanol synthesis. Copper zinc oxide is now our, our one of our best catalysts for methanol synthesis, but this also sits near the top of the peak. And for oxygen evolution, if I look at the metal or metal oxide volcano peak, of course, oxygen evolution is important if I'm going to convert water into H2 and O2. Mo uh, catalysts there also sit near the peak. And at the same time, these are logarithmic plots. I would like to exist two to three orders of magnitude above that peak. Now, of course, the goal is to find materials that don't exist on the Sabatier volcanoes. And of course, if we find that, that will be a wonderful breakthrough. Uh, but I want to take a different approach and think about this differently based on the, the ideas of where these volcano peaks actually originate. So let me just back up. If there's students here that aren't familiar with this concept, it's important what I'm going to show you. So let me just summarize this quickly. Of course, the idea of a catalyst is we take a reactant and we make a product and that goes through some high energy transition state. The alternative being if we absorb the molecule first to a surface, we can achieve a transition state that's lower in energy. And then when this comes off the surface, I could potentially get a lower barrier. But in the act of lowering the barrier on the surface, I introduce new barriers, one of them being, for example, the adsorption energy. So in this case, I might speed up the reaction, but I slow it down by desorption. So a better catalyst might look something like this, right? In this case now, the energy of the reaction is lower than the transition state in the gas phase, and my desorption barrier matches my catalytic barrier. So in this case, desorption is comparable to reaction. Well, let's say I wanted to go even faster, an even better catalyst. What could I do? Well, at this point, what I could say is, well, let's see if I can find a material that gives me an energy barrier that's lower on the catalyst. But what you see is that then 
by the uh, linear scaling relationships of this reaction, a more exothermic surface reaction does lower my barrier here, but it increases another barrier, which in this cartoon depiction is the heat of adsorption. And this comes to this basic idea that at some point there's a limit to how much catalyst can be improved. Once I've improved them up to this optimal point, the trade-offs of improving one step affect the limitations of another step. And this basic energy idea is the origin of the Safadier limit. So if I come back to this picture, every reaction has a series of steps. In this case, the simplest cartoon, adsorption, surface reaction, and desorption. I can think of a trade-off in these steps where I optimize the catalytic material to balance those two. So the descriptor here on the independent x-axis is a description of the material itself, and the vertical axis here being the overall rate, the turnover frequency. When I go between different materials, I switch between which of these elementary steps is rate limiting, and eventually I can find a material that balances these two nicely, and that's this optimum you see right here at the volcano peak. Now, like I said, what we'd like to do, though, is exist up here above, orders of magnitude above that give us higher rates for hydrogen production, methanol synthesis, ammonia synthesis, and hundreds of other applications. And I, I, in this case, if I can't get off of this volcano curve, I can't create materials that exist there. Now, what, what could we potentially do about this? Well, one idea is let's, instead of finding a static material, right, a, sta a, a metal or a metal oxide that sits at one of these description points, let's find a material that we can actually change with time. So I'm gonna change the electronic characteristics of this material such that I move left to right on this descriptive scale. Now, if I'm doing that, what I'm essentially doing is switching from one condition of rate limitation to another. And if I do this fast enough, the prediction was when we started this, that we could actually exist on these rate limitations up above the uh, static optimum that you see right here. So this is the basic idea of what I want to present to you here. If I oscillate a reaction at the frequency which matches the natural frequencies of the independent elementary steps, I can achieve this resonant frequency, which is orders of magnitude above the Sabatier peak. Now, of course, there's a lot of things that go into this. This is a relatively simple reaction. There's an amplitude I have to pick here. There's a structure to this waveform oscillation I'm going to apply to a catalyst. Uh, there's a frequency, uh, but also I had care about how to do this in real systems with real devices, and real chemistry, which are multi-step. So let me proceed. What's actually happening when I change a catalyst with time? Well, if I think about a catalyst in one state, I have, of course, for the simplest system, adsorption, reaction, and desorption. And when I change the electronic state of that material, I now have a new energy diagram. So I go from state one to state two. And of course, if each of these are favorable, for one elementary step, right? You can actually see that because I'm going from side to side on a volcano, you can actually see which reaction step that's favorable for. So state one here gives me the lower energy barrier for the transition state surface reaction. And state two gives me more favorable desorption. So if I'm flipping between these two, I'm gonna increase the rate of each of those elementary steps independently. That's the basic idea. It's rather intuitive when you see it put together for, uh, with, for such a simple reaction. Of course, this gets complex when we start talking about uh, more complicated systems. Now, how is this different than what's been done in the past? Because, of course, uh, dynamic reactors and systems have been studied uh, for over half a century or perhaps even longer. And there's been a lot of good work in, in understanding how temperature, pressure, composition, heating, cooling, co-reactants, all these kinds of things matter. Now, of course, you can break down the dynamics of chemical systems into two groups, the passive changes that happen uh, without us forcing a system. So of course, catalysts activate and deactivate, reactors become unstable and processes become unstable. Um, but in this case, we're interested in forcing the catalyst to change between two different conditions, in which case I'm interested in this top row. Now in system dynamics, for system dynamics, we look at things like chemical looping or catalyst cycling. For reactor dynamics, we're thinking about changing the temperature, pressure, composition of the reactor. In this case, what I want to do is I actually want to go to the catalyst itself, the active site, and change its electronic characteristics or, or change its sterics or its physical structure with time or both. So what happens when I do this? So let's look at those top left two boxes. In the uh, system we're interested in, I'm gonna change the catalyst itself. So I'm actually changing its energy uh, diagram with time. So what happens is each of my binding energies are moving up and down in, in 
binding energy of the surface reactant A star and the surface product B star, but also my transition state energy is changing because the relative energies of the surface reactant and surface product are changing. Now, if I'm keeping the temperature constant there, you can see that I'm, I have the thermal energy to go over the barrier under certain conditions and not at others, and I have the energy to get off the surface in certain conditions and not others. This is very different from a condition where I have a fixed catalyst and I'm oscillating the temperature with time. It gives me different behavior uh, overall. Of course, this is a very interesting system with a lot of potential, but there's some key differences. Number one is if I'm oscillating the temperature of a reactor, I have to get incredibly small to get reasonable kinetics because I'm not just heating the surface, I'm heating the particle to support the reactor walls, et cetera. So the benefit of a dynamic catalyst for one is faster kinetics. And when I say this, I'm interested in turnovers, which are above 10 turnovers per second, really fast reactions. And I, to do that, I need system dynamics that are sufficiently fast, which I can do with electricity and not with heat. It also gives me better molecular control because in this case, dynamic catalysts can affect the different uh, elementary steps, but also different adsorbates with time. Okay, so let's imagine I'm gonna focus on dynamic catalysts. So how do I think about how these give me better kinetics? So which of these dynamic catalytic energy diagrams provide better kinetics? Because I can imagine if I have a catalyst and I wanna perturb it electronically in some way, I can change this in all different methods of perturbation, which give me different changing energy profiles. So for example, the one on the left here, I'm gonna explain what this is, is called positive gamma dynamics. And you can see that both surface intermediates move up and down together. They move by different amounts, but they move together. Whereas the one on the right gives me negative gamma dynamics. The two surface energies of the surface reactant and product move in opposite directions. So of course, which one gives me better performance, but also how do I define these dynamics so I can think of global analysis and optimization of dynamic catalytic reactors. So let me take the simplest case and walk you through this. Of course, if we have a simulation of a, react, of a, of a catalytic reaction, let's take the simplest case first. Let's take a perfectly mixed flow reactor. I have my reactor parameters, space velocity, temperature, and pressure. Uh, I have my catalytic chemistry parameters, so the overall thermodynamics, the heats of adsorption and transition state energy. But now I have new parameters that I have to account for. So in this case, I'll have the amplitude of my oscillation of that catalyst. I'll have the amplitude position, the frequency, and the waveform type. And so this makes the system immensely more complex, even for a simple A to B surface reaction. Okay, so what does the simulation look like? Let me walk you through this. If you just take the top line here, this is showing you the binding energy of one of the two surface intermediates, B star. And what you see is that it's going from strong binding to weak binding with time. It's a square wave. So I go from one state at strong binding at 0.5 electron volts relative energy to negative uh, 0.1. So these are all uh, uh, negative uh, enthalpies of adsorption, but this is a relative binding energy, which is why this number is positive. But don't, don't worry about that. This is strong binding, weak binding, strong binding, weak binding. Now, when I do this, I'm changing the surface coverage of the catalyst. So if you come down to the very bottom graph here, what you can see is that if I have an A to B reaction, my surface goes from covered in B to covered in A, covered in B and back and forth. And every time I flip the catalyst from strong to weak binding, I'm removing all this B from the surface and you can see the rate goes up into the uh, 15 to 20 turnovers per second range instantaneously. And then as I deplete the surface, the reaction rate actually comes back down. I refill it and I'm essentially filling the surface and unfilling it back and forth, back and forth. So what's happening here is I'm filling in surface uh, and then unfill, unloading it as a product. And so it matters how fast I do that. So what you're looking at here is this instantaneous turnover frequency is the vertical axis. And the horizontal axis is the simulation with time. Uh, of course, if I'm doing this at different frequencies, I'm gonna show you this as an arbitrary X axis so I can look at many frequencies at once. So if I'm doing this really slowly, every thousand seconds I flip the surface between its two states, the system behaves like two independent catalysts. So for example, I have a very slow condition and a, and a moderately slow condition. And the only benefit I get is when I flip the catalyst between these two states. So here you can see this overshoot. This is not a, a, an artifact in the simulation. This is that benefit I get from flipping the surface. And you can see it's negligible in the overall performance. If I increase from 0.001 Hertz in green up to 0.25 Hertz in red, 
Now what I'm achieving is the same turnover frequency as I would get in the best case for a static catalyst. And you can see I'm flipping the surface. I'm giving this instantaneous benefit of flipping. And then I slowly deplete the surface and I flip again. If I flip even faster, I go up now to 10 Hertz, I'm achieving catalytic rates, which are an order of magnitude above the Sabatier peak. And you can see I'm not depleting the surface with time before I start refilling it again. And if I go faster and faster, I can actually fill and unfill the surface even faster at 1,000 Hertz and go up about another order of magnitude in, in time averaged rate. Now, how fast can I go? Well, it turns out that I can't go faster than the elementary steps of any particular state. So if I look at a frequency response plot, it can actually tell me when I reach this resonant condition. So here is on the bottom axis is the frequency at which I'm flipping my catalyst state between two different conditions. And you can see I'm covering 16 orders of magnitude in frequency. So very slow. Here's one Hertz right here up to insanely fast uh, frequencies, which are not even attainable up there, 10 to the 12. My, my best case scenario that I could get for a static material is right here in red, the static optimum. And what you see is that I start out very slowly under dynamic conditions. I behave like two very slow catalysts. And once I hit this corner frequency, I increase in a one-to-one -one linear relationship between the applied frequency and the frequency I get out of the catalyst. And eventually I keep increasing to the point where I meet the natural frequencies of my catalytic elementary steps and I can't go any faster. At this point, I'm filling and unfilling the surface and eventually I can't even fill and unfill the surface anymore. I'm too fast for my elementary steps. So this gives me this in incredibly fast catalytic rate, but there's a band of frequencies which match the natural frequencies of my reaction. So that was for one amplitude. That was for 0.6 electron volt oscillation and B star. So you can see that right here. If I had taken a vertical line up here, I start out very slow. I increase, I hit this plateau in high rate, and then I go back down in frequency, catalytic reaction turnover frequency in the top part here. But if I'm moving left to right, I'm changing the amplitude of my reaction. So bigger amplitudes give me higher catalytic rates to the point where if I can get incredibly large amplitude oscillations, I can get oscillation uh, oscillations that yield turnover frequencies that are probably beyond the diffusion limits of my particular system. So that's good. If I wanna improve catalyst performance, I wanna increase the oscillation amplitude of my particular catalytic reactor. Okay, so one question I always get, and I wanna put this right up front is, if I'm spending this energy to take a catalyst and flip it between two states, um, how much benefit am I getting for that particular system? So every time I flip the catalyst over, am I turning over the reaction itself? And so I can define a very simple turnover efficiency as my dynamic turnover frequency divided by my oscillation frequency by subtracting off the steady state tur turnover frequency. So what you see then is this turnover efficiency in the right here in color. So zero means every time I flip over the catalyst, I put in that work to do that, I don't get any benefit in terms of catalytic rate. 100% means every time I flip the catalyst in between states, I get a catalytic turnover, which is what I want. So what you see here, if I look at the frequencies and I look at the oscillation amplitude, there are conditions here which give me incredibly efficient catalytic reactor performance. And you can see here, this even goes up into the high 90s, where essentially every time I flip the catalyst over, I'm getting this benefit. This is the region where I get a one-to-one -one relationship between catalytic rate increase and uh, frequency at which I apply to that particular surface. So this leads right up to the start of the resonance band that we see in the frequency response plots I was showing you earlier. So it is possible for these systems to be incredibly efficient, but you have to pick the right conditions. Okay, so of course I've shown you this for one chemistry, but I'm interested in taking this and applying it to complex mechanisms with all sorts of different parameters. So a, a very important relationship is if I have two molecules on a surface connected by a transition state, is that transition state energy is related to the energy of the surface reactant and surface product. And one way to describe this is a simple linear relationship. So the activation energy here scales linearly with the surface heat of reaction by two linear scaling parameters, alpha and beta. And of course, if I change alpha, I'm changing this transition state energy, which means I'm changing one of the elementary steps in my two, in my two rate limiting phenomena. And if I'm doing that, I'm changing the shape of my volcano here, as you can see on the left. So I care about understanding these systems globally in terms of what do the 
linear parameters of every single elementary step relate back to my dynamics. There's actually a very simple way to think about this. I have different volcano plots depending on these parameters, but I also have different inverted dynamic volcano plots you see up here on the top. And you can see that the, 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 the ones with the sharpest slope, of course, in the normal volcano, give me the sharpest slope in the inverted volcano. And that's really important because if I go to the next slide, I can imagine, for example, a system with an alpha of one. This is the sharpest volcano you can get. <clears throat> in this case, here's my conventional Sabadi volcano. Here's the peak. And you can see the inverted volcano on the top where I now have my tie lines connecting different amplitudes of oscillation. Now, the sharper the volcano, the higher the alpha, allows me to achieve higher frequencies by looking at higher amplitude oscillations. So if I oscillate a catalyst at higher amplitude, it's pushed up to higher potential resonant frequencies. And you can see that over here on the plot on the right, this resonance band of conditions, if you look at the inset for 0.6, 1, and 1.5, goes up to incredibly high rates that are way beyond the diffusion limit of any particular system. Of course, these are for incredibly high uh, non-real uh, amplitudes, but the idea is to show you what, what the benefit of different types of chemistries are. If I decrease alpha by back up, I'm going to get shallower plots and I'll get less of a response to dynamic catalytic systems. So every chemistry, of course, has different performance. So I'm interested, of course, in all sorts of different catalytic reactions. So what I can do, I was describing the linear relationship for the transition state. I also care about the transition state or the, the linear scaling relationship for A star versus B star, in which case B star here moves a lot more than A star. And I can relate those also by a linear relationship. So that's my gamma parameter. And if I change the gamma parameter, now I'm also changing the shape of the volcano. And that gives me different catalytic performance. So every I was showing you earlier different gamma values. I showed you a high gamma value originally. And I'm not even showing the negative gamma plot on here because that just adds more complexity. But of course, each of these linear scaling parameters gives me different volcano shapes, any of which I can oscillate in a different way and give faster catalytic performance. So here's the full plot all together. Now, how to do this? Now, I'm, I don't want to go into this, but I want you to see that there are ways to actually implement these types of systems, whether through dynamic strain, uh, photocatalysis, uh, electronic gating, catalytic diodes, ferroelectrics, electrocatalysis. There's many, many ways this can be done. We're pursuing several of these, and other people are pursuing other methods. The whole point is to convince you and show you that there, the benefit of doing these types of dynamic catalytic approaches gives you rate control beyond anything we have right now. Okay, what else? Let me end by showing you a couple of other benefits that exist in these particular systems. If we look at the ammonia system or the methanol system, one particular problem is thermodynamics. If I think of a reaction from reactants to products, I want to push this forward. What I need to do is change the overall delta G of reaction. And the way we do that right now, for the most part, is we apply work ahead of time to shift the pressure or temperature or both to give me a more favorable reaction. And so for something like hydrogen compression, this is a huge cost, both in work operating cost and capital cost. And so one benefit we get from going to a dynamic catalyst is we can put that work directly into the surface. So instead of putting the work into a, a compressor or some high capital approach, we can actually keep the th overall thermodynamics of our system and apply that work directly to the catalyst surface itself. And when we do that, of course, we're not changing thermodynamics. We can't change the, the laws of thermodynamics, but we can apply extra work in an open catalytic system that changes the steady state away from our equilibrium state. Now, let me show you how this actually looks in a simulation. So what I'm showing you here is a batch reactor. This is my time on stream on the x-axis. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start my batch reactor at multiple initial conditions. This is an A to B reaction. I can start it with pure component B or pure component A. And when I let this run with time under dynamic conditions, you can see that no matter where I start, I go to this new steady state you see right here, which is different from equilibrium. And then when I remove the dynamics, I'm no longer putting work in through the catalytic surface. The system, of course, has to, by the laws of thermodynamics, go back to equilibrium. And if I turn this back on and off, it'll go from the steady state to the equilibrium. Now, why is this possible? This, of course, occurs because I'm putting in work through the surface, and that occurs by this energetic ratchet mechanism, which is known throughout biology and many other places.
Now, why does this work and how does it work? Well, I can push a reaction. What you're looking at here is a steady state conversion. Green is equilibrium, red is high conversion, and blue is low conversion. So if I let a system oscillate at low frequency, it goes to equilibrium. At high frequency, I can push it forward or backward, depending on the conditions and catalysts that I pick for my particular application. And I can understand why this is such a nice dividing line, the very simple interpretation of the dynamics of my particular reaction. So there's a very simple cartoon here that makes allows you to understand what's happening. If I look at the right side, under the forward driving system, if I'm pushing something past equilibrium, I have these molecules here at higher energy or, or higher binding energy, so lower overall enthalpy in the strong binding condition. And then when I flip to the weak binding state of my catalyst, these come off the surface. This, the reverse is true in a, react, in a catalyst that drives reaction backwards away from equilibrium. On the strong binding conditions, my surface reacted to stronger binding. And that's why I get this very simple dividing line between forward and reverse reactions. So where are we going with this? Uh, I'm gonna end here with this last thought which is I wanna take this to real systems and I wanna do that re with real devices, which we're working on in the lab. I wanna to continue to build the theory of understanding these different energetic mechanisms for catalysis, but I also wanna take them to real chemistries. And that's the work we've done here with Professor Velakos uh, at the University of Delaware in the United States. You can read about this in a preprint where we've been looking at the effect of dynamic strain in ruthenium catalysts for ammonia synthesis. And in which case I no longer have one elementary step I have multiple pathways to form ammonia from both hydrogen and nitrogen and understanding how the rate limitations change as I dynamically strain the system at different frequencies and oscillation amplitudes completely changes the, the rate at which I can synthesize ammonia. So let me, let me leave it here. The, the most exciting element of this to me is that it's no longer a search for a material because historically catalysis has all been about finding a material and then making it work within a reactor system. In this case, it's a strategy. I wanna combine chemistry, perturbations and materials that allow me to build, optimize and test systems to get beyond the Sabatier peak, to push reactions past equilibrium. And the benefits here are potentially very large. And of course, the targets are the things we care about for energy, hydrogen production, methanol synthesis, selective oxidation, ammonia synthesis, et cetera. So let me leave it there. I appreciate the, the organizers inviting me and thank you all for uh, either getting up early or staying very late. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Very, very nice the presentation that shows how to, to connect the, the atomic scale and the, the real world uh, operation of uh, catalytic reactors. Uh, then uh, it's time for questions. Can I ask the question, please? Okay. Uh -huh. uh, hello. It's uh, thank you very much for a nice presentation. It's uh, amazingly fantastic uh, theoretical analysis. It's uh, it is great, really. Uh, um, I have a, the following question: Is um, when you uh, select some resonance uh, uh, parameters, is it sensible to reaction mixture composition? Uh, I, I can prolong that. For example, when you are dealing with a small reactor, uh, it's maybe easy, but uh, when you are dealing with a commercial reactor where the uh, composition in the inlet part and outlet part are absolutely different. So uh, is it possible that um, these uh, oscillations will work differently in different par parts of the reactor? I think that's a great question. Um, yeah, the, the answer is likely. For, for many reasons. Um, I'm going to change the, the composition, which means I'm going to be changing the surface coverages on my surface. And that's going to be, uh, as you saw in the very first simulation, the surface coverages matter quite a bit for the dynamics. So if I imagine reactors, let me back up to all the different ways this can be implemented. I can do this quickly here. Come on. Let's go. What I think you're getting at is the, the waveform I apply to a catalytic reactor would have to be different in the beginning, the middle, and the end of the reactor. But of course, if we have electronic input, we can do that. I can give it a gradient of oscillations. Um, that's a great question. Actually, that you're the first person to ever ask me that. I've never even thought of that. Um, so thank you. OK, thank you. OK, more questions? Yeah. 
Well, it, it seems to no, uh, And well, thank you very much for attending this, this session. And I think we, uh, we can close it. So, thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you.